Hello everyone and welcome to the final day of our stage two qualifier number one. Remember, we still have another next week, so if you don't make it, sign up for that one. But Jonah, we've got our top 16 teams in and uh, we've got some... I feel like unexpected entries into our playoffs. Yeah, it's been a really exciting two days and we've seen uh, a couple of maybe more well-known names kind of jumping in, but on maybe less well-known teams. It's been really fun over the last few days to see how these teams have kind of come into their element here. We've even seen Pengu step up and take a shot at making mm. SES, which has been really exciting. Yesterday, specifically, we saw a lot. Uh, started off with uh, my good collegiate buddies, NCSU, unfortunately falling to Outlast to kick off the day. Uh, but that was a good game. I think what, seven it was close. 7-5. To... Seven, five. Seven to five. Yeah, it was a, it was a very good game to watch, and uh, Outlast proved that you know they could hang in, and they uh, unfortunately I don't believe they ended up making it here no. into our close quals, but they did put up a pretty strong performance overall. And we also had uh, an aerial arise, a second aerial arise pug stack, I guess. The only members from the actual Challenger League team being Kento and Wimpy, but they've been playing with Rethinking, with Aug, and then with CZ and Courageous Carl Six, who, if you're unfamiliar with that name, is actually Valor, who was in Challenger League competing with Aqualix, and he was really like the only member of that Aqualix team who was actually doing anything. This was a hell of a game, though. In control, a uh, not the actual in control nation in control with two L's a pug stack made up of uh, Jazzman the caster and a lot of ex comp players who have since stopped playing they actually beat Okami currently known as Whittle Kitties 8-7 yeah, a little bit surprising there, and a potential rematch we've got in the cards today. If both in control God, with I two L's and Whittle Kitties ends up winning their first round of 16 game, we are going to definitely uh, bring that one to you for the... I mean, who's going to make SCS? That game, that rematch will determine which team works their way into SCS 6 split 2 here. So, cannot wait to see that one. Of course, our final game yesterday, Asylum Patience versus Didn't Ask. This one also was a pretty thrilling game in a final... Uh, good way to close out the day. But uh, I'm really excited about what we've got in front of us today, Harrison, because it is yep. close calls after all. It is our final day of this first qualifier. And by the end of it, we are going to have four new teams stepping up and joining SES. Yeah, I'm extremely excited. You know, In Control being one of those teams that maybe not a lot of people expected to be here. Outlast and Asylum Patients, otherwise known as Fernie's Tacos and Challenger League, actually not making the cut. Counter to what we saw in the last call, I think they both made it... Uh, into close calls both times or the outlast only once but it's definitely odd to see them not here in our stage one qualifier playoffs but uh before we get into anything else we would like to thank you know one of our sponsors mike and ike of course every single stream we always give a shout out to them we love these guys they've been with nsg even before nsg was with scs back in the monthlies mike and ike has always been a proud sponsor of nsg's events and now us here at scs 6. If you want to level up your game, you can grab a pack of Mike and Ike. There's the original, there's Mega Mix Sour, and Mega Mix Original Jonah. I didn't even know the Sour one existed until now. I have yet to try that one. I do like normal Mega uh, Mike and Ike and, and normal Mega Mix, so I'm sure the Sour probably uh, aims to please as well. So again, thank you, Mike and Ike, for uh, helping us keep the SES train going because, uh, well, I cannot wait. We have our structure as well. So. After this weekend, we have one more qualifier. That's going to be next weekend. And then we get into the season. It's going to be just like stage one, although a little bit quicker. It's four weeks uh, based on a double elimination group style play. There's going to be four groups, 16 teams each. You play a double elimination bracket within each group. And in the fourth week, we'll have our top eight and they play the playoffs. Harrison, actually, this stage is going to be even faster than the first. It is going to be three weeks, a rapid fire stage, because we've, we're looking forward to the Pro-Am. We've got to cram oh, all of yes. this in to not only figure out, you know, who's going to win stage two, work their way to the Pro-Am, who's going to be those top two leaderboard teams, and then we even have another last chance qualifier to get into the mix. So if you tuned in to stage one, you know how rapid fire that was. It's going to be even quicker and it is going to be even more exciting. Here are your currently qualified teams. Everyone here, these top eight have been invited from the previous season. The way we did this is our top four finishers from SES Split 1. They've been invited back and our top four CL finishers have also been invited back. So here you have all your groups. When we end today, we're going to have four more teams who will join our existing eight here in our second stage of SCX. And, and of course, when we come uh, in a few days, we've got another qualifier to finish out who is going to be those final 
four teams. But today, four more teams will join these eight you see on your screen, making it, and here they are. Here are the teams that have a chance of making it and the bracket that they're going to have to compete in. Two games, two wins is all you need to make SCS. Both of these teams, all of these teams, in fact, are looking to do that here. Yeah, of course, uh, there's a lot of familiar names such as Eclectic, who are uh, a surprise addition to our stage in stage one. Um, Wichita Wolves Academy, of course, so there's two Wichita Wolves Academies now. The one that's already in stage one were previously Surf, our winners. So that's, you know, Reed Sync, Asian, Ashen, Ambi, and Spiff. Those guys just got picked up for Wichita Wolves Academy. This is the original Academy team with, you know, Trev Mac, Big Guy, Skunky, the guys who were previously uh, Revenge Nation. That's the Wichita Wolves Academy uh, competing. West Garfield, the X-Pro plus Psychosis and Matt Bonger Pug Stack that came second in our standalone tournament, losing to Juicers in the Grand Finals. We have, you know, Ariel Arise with Kento and Wimpy. That Pug Stack didn't ask, who have been in every single qualifier so far. You know, the In Control, the Mount Olympus Pug Stack, as we like to call them. These are, these are the four teams that we think are going to power through. Wichita Wolves Academy have proven themselves time and time again to be a formidable team they'll be looking to do it though this time with pkers instead of jj chess club well it's got gunner on it gunner is the most you know winningest player in all of t3 didn't win stage one but is looking to come back the aerial arise pug stack have been looking something fierce you can never bet against the likes of kento and wimpy and you know just for fun just for fun we have in control blowing out their group because i think if jazzman qualifies for scs6 that'd be pretty freaking funny It'd be hilarious. I think it's a good sign that uh, the world as we know it is coming to an end, but I think <laughs> it'd be great to see. That's why we have them at number four. As you know, I mean, th this top 16, uh, we're just kind of throwing this together to just maybe take a guess at how we think this closed bracket is going to shake up. But that's all we can do right now is just throw a couple of guesses out there. We've got our first match coming up in just a few moments. We've got the Wichita Wolves Academy team uh, taken on uh, West Garfield. And this one is hopefully going to be um, a very exciting match to watch. As we predicted there, as you saw at the top, we think Wichita Wolves Academy has a shot at making it through, but to get there, I mean, they've got, I think probably the toughest opponent they could have possibly drawn just to start out the entire day. West Garfield, as we saw in our standalone tournament is a team that just, I mean, tears people apart. It's bio, it's barring, it's forest, it's psychosis and Rudy. You've got a ton of pro league experience on this team. You've got CL experience. You've got a lot of talent. And that's exactly what the Wichita Wolves Academy team are going to have to go up against tonight. Now, they've got a stacked team as well. Again, it's PK or Skunky, Chosen, Trev Mac, and Big Guy. And we saw from what we've seen in the past couple of days that they can absolutely hang with the best, but they have a lot to prove here right off the bat. Yeah, if there's anything we know about West Garfield from the last standalone tournament, it's the experience and their ability to adapt on the fly despite being a pug stack. It seems like their IGL work or maybe the team kind of co-IGLs is still pretty solid. Wichita Wolves Academy, though, we know are, you know, haven't qualified for SCS. We're one step away from qualifying for stage three of CL, but could never quite make it. They lost Kenny and they got JJ Blastful, then they dropped JJ, and now we have PKers. PKers has pretty big shoes to fill to make sure that Wichita Wolves Academy is still kind of at the top of at least qualifiers. Because remember, they actually lost uh, the stage, SCS Stage 2 qualifiers to In Control, the actual In Control Nation roster, which is actually different now. Back then it was, you know, like Serve and, and them, but uh, In Control is different now. But nevertheless, these are our maps. Villa Oregon Cafe. Again. Classic wall maps right here teams want to mm -hmm. stay in their comfort zone and these are exactly uh the maps that would fall into such a category starting up with villa that is where we'll begin the night um but as you said harrison jj no longer on this team uh sucks to see jj and the t3 mastermind that he is no longer in the mix here uh but it does mean for the academy team here of wichita wolves that they actually have a chance at qualifying uh because of course jj and his qual curse are no longer on the team so they've got a chance at getting through there's no uh factors outside their control you could say yes. Uh, that are preventing them from making it in. But we're going to head right on to our game here. We'll take a look at our operator bands in just a moment and see exactly what 
kind of villa we have in store for us Harrison. hopefully not a boring one though i imagine it is a qualifier we're probably just going to see things like the thatcher ban a hard breacher maybe uh west garfield uh there are pug stacks so maybe we'll see some sort of target ban like a fragging operator that west garfield loves to run around with but west garfield of course again have the first ban they've been a fan of the thatcher in our standalone tournament and they will keep that trend here in the qualifier so thatcher gone standard ban on literally every map in the game don't really need to explain that one i'm more interested with what, what wichita wolves academy is going to respond with there's a plethora of different ones they could either target ban or whether it be a hard breacher maybe a flank watch operator the flores and there it is right on cue wow i'm like a psychic so that leaves all four hard breachers up and makes that shield play just a little bit more there yeah, the floors is something we've seen banned a lot recently. Those Rotero drones can be incredibly impactful at just burning out utility and circumventing all of the, you know, the Jaeger, the Wamai discs, the Aruni gates. It can just kind of roll right underneath all of that and just you know, deal all that destruction that defensive teams want to stay away from as much as they can. So no Rotero drones, no Electro Claw either. So something that the defensive side is not going to be able to have and use to, to their advantage. But, but the fact that the Kaid is off the board and the fact that the Valkyrie is off the board uh, surprises nobody, I am sure. Those Black Eye cameras are incredibly powerful on every single map you bring them to, but especially Villa and that in second floor with so much soft destruction and so much potential for a Nitro Cell to find its way right onto the ceiling of that first floor blowing attackers sky high, a classic occurrence on this map that we may see, but it will not come due to information from those Valk cams. So we're going to head right here into round number one, West Garfield. They'll be starting off on the defense. WW Academy, they will be getting on the attack. And as we saw, they'll tease the Ying. Chosen will do that, but as he uh, switches over to the Yana, it seems we're going to see, oh, an Ash actually. I was going to say we're going to see a bit more of a standard attacking lineup, but uh, the Ash is always something interesting that teams like to throw in the mix. You combine that with a Finca and a Lion, and we see what could be a pretty aggressive start. Yeah, the Ash is um, Attackers need to locate something that Chosen off. plays a lot. I know he plays it on Oregon as well when he's not on Iana. He plays it on Villa. He's always been kind of a staple of the Wichita Wolves Academy attack. He either plays, like I said, either the Iana or the Ash, and it seems like he's favoring the Ash today. And he's one of those players that you want to keep an eye on. Wichita Wolves Academy's two superstars, uh, you know, every single one of them can frag out, but the two that you really want to pay attention to is Chosen and Trevmac. Trevmac can Came, I remember literally out of nowhere from like Swift Uprising Academy in EPS Season 5 to being one, considered to be one of the best amateur players. And he's on the Finca. He's looking to tear up West Garfield. But of course, West Garfield's defenses are pretty damn good, if we remember from that standalone tournament. And that kind of tends to be where Pug Stack Shine is on the defense because it requires a lot less coordination than it, the attack does. You can get, you know, kind of frisky with it. When it comes to the defense, a lot easier, but Wichita Wolves Academy are going to be starting with that study over clear and, of course, attacking, though, into a pulse. And like you said about these C4s, although they don't have the Valkyrie, they've still got that heartbeat sensor. So as Wichita Wolves continues with this clear, once they reach the master side of things, they're going to have to make sure not to stand in one place for too long. Right now, I don't know, you know, how much of that soft destruction we are going to see. It depends exactly what big guy wants to do. Basically, you can follow the sledge. If the sledge goes upstairs and clears top down, you can be pretty confident that the entire attacking team is going to follow in his footsteps. That breaching hammer, so important when it comes to the top down destruction. And it does appear that WW Academy would like to make that clear happen. It will be taking them, you know, a little bit of time to get that done. There are a couple of pesky roamers upstairs to still uh, encounter and deal with. One of those is Psychosis, who has worked his way now over to the trophy and statuary side as he has been successfully cleared out by the attack from the aviator and games side of things. He actually hasn't fully given up this control, though. He's very close to several players now working their way towards his position. You've got somebody... I believe working their way over towards the red stairs and you've of course got big guy swinging in to 90 as well coming a couple of players down below trying to support this clear or support the denial of this clear rather that's both forest and rudy who is extended a little bit away from the bomb site right now just to provide additional intel to these top floor players but take a look at the clock right now we are all under 90 seconds and this clear is far from complete in fact it's going awry right now i mean already one kill found by the defense pk dropped and dealt with a trade found in response onto psychosis and now that barring has been taken care of ww academy hold the advantage but the map control is something they only now 
have under their fingertips. And Baron got quite aggressive in bathroom, taking out the Hibana early on. Now, she's pretty much already done her job now that Master and Trophy and Statuary is clear, but when it comes to that transition onto the site, you can no longer open the pantry wall. You can no longer open the laundry wall. These are mainly going to be dry pushes through bottlenecks, and that's where the vertical play will now come even more in handy to uproot these defenders, make sure they're uncomfortable, and make sure they can't hold, you know, these standard crossfires you see on the doorways Wichita Wolves are eventually going to have to push on through. Now Biologic whether aided by the Pulse or not, is going to get a very nice C4 kill on the Trevmac. Now you've lost your Finca, and one of those key operators that gives you the confidence, gives you that extra HP to try and push through those bottlenecks head first, is now gone, but the mute will be refragged. That does not go unanswered, so it's still a one-man advantage here. Wichita Wolves Academy could play the trade game. Forrest is going to go down. That leaves it all on Rudy, but he's only got five seconds to delay. He'll take out one. Chosen now dead. Big guy on low HP. Skunky's on the hunt, though. They don't have the case! And what?! The round will expire just before the Lions' shots connect, and the defense take the first point. An oversight from the Wichita Wolves Academy team there. I mean, where was that diffuser? Why wasn't it in someone's hand, and why wasn't it going down on the ground in what was basically a 3v1 situation with about 10 seconds to go? A very winnable side of things for the attack, and they let it slip away. I mean, Rudy got one impressive kill and was trying to be as much of a nuisance as possible, but at some point, he probably realized, wait a second here, I don't hear the bomb going down. I hear a couple of attackers, you know, scrambling around this site, trying to sprint at me. All they've got to do is sit behind this corner and play it safe, and, well, he was absolutely correct. For some reason, Wichita just wasn't getting that bomb down. Maybe it wasn't recovered on the top floor ever since PK was felled, or someone Defense maybe just decided to go for the frag instead. I wasn't exactly sure where that bomb, where the case actually was in those closing seconds, but the fact that it was not being put on the ground actively by someone on the attack, very concerning and definitely a big mistake from the Academy side here. I mean, they easily could have won that round. Wichita had the advantage. It was a 3v1, and they let it slip away. Yeah, you also have two, um, despite the upstairs clear, maybe it was a side effect of the Finca going down early, but a lot of times you see either Ash charges or nades or gone six shots being sent through the floor to clear utility on site. We saw in the dying moments of that round, Rudy was able to isolate those gunfights because he had a shield to play around. So perhaps, you know, again, that time wearing down, just lack of utility clear from above, whatever, that came to hurt them in the end as well. But either way, well played to Rudy as the pulse in that 1v3. The UMP is not often a gun you want in a situation like that, but he still made it work. Now, which Wichita's Academy have to lick their wounds after that first round. Obviously not the way they wanted it to end. They'll have to try and recover here on AVG. And of course, there is a roam being established from the defense, both Barring and Rudy off-site over towards the trophy statuary side of things. But so far from Wichita Wolves Academy, they're mainly droning out the first floor. So they might not even need to pressure that. It's looking like it's going to be a main stairs take here. And Psychosis, curiously enough, the Wamai roaming downstairs is going to be the first target for this attack. Right, Wichita trying to flush out these d defenders on this bottom floor, and they spot one, and they deal with him rather quickly. Good shot there from Chosen. Was worried there that Psychosis might have been able to get a shot through the soft wall, but he was felled before he could fight back. Not a single bullet even connecting over on towards the Ash. So Wichita will start things off very well as they uh, speed up their roam clear, especially compared to last round, markedly so. I mean, last time they really had... Hadn't taken much map control, even under a minute to go in the round. But now, with just a minute expired, they are getting things well underway. Great nade from below from Treb. That'll take down Forrest, and that's going to now force West Garfield into an uncomfortable 3v5 situation. Now, they might be working a little bit of a flank here. Barring is tempting it, working his way down the red stairs, and he'll actually execute it very well, even though he was pinged and his position was known. He'll take down Skunky regardless. Now, Wichita have to turn their attention to... Maybe the backside and have to worry about someone coming up on a flank at any given moment. Barring, though, will retake back upstairs and join the rest of his team because with a, an execute nearly 
mounting around the corner. He knows it's best to fight this one in a 3v4 on site if they can. Fortunately, Bio cannot find a free pick as those attackers skate right past the floor holes. Well done as well to Trevmack to spot out those floor holes and get that easy kill with the grenade. And that's really what's keeping Wichita Wolves Academy in from firm control of this round. Of course, they've got the Hibana over towards Study, but they can't open the wall because of that Mute Jammer. And Wichita Wolves Academy, it looks like they don't have any more utility to deal with that from below. No nades on either Big Guy or Trevmack. I don't know if maybe Trevmack still has a Gone 6 that he could go below with. Looks like that's what he's working to do, but it's actually the pings on the Jaeger. He's on the hunt. He's going to try and pre-fire through the floor, but the Jaeger has since moved. Maybe wise to the antics of Trev Mac below. The Finca is still going to attempt to push up towards red. He's going to break the bar. Barring has a mean angle down on it, and that's a freebie for the Jaeger. Barring second kill and the equalizer we were looking for. Big guy goes down to Rudy. Chosen lit up, trying to push in the site. Rudy still over in 90. Gets another, and Bio holding down behind bar. Gets the last. West Garfield take round number two in a three versus five without losing a single body after very impressive in the 3v5 just shows you the kind of experience that these players have and how willingly they are to allow that experience to shine through we just saw three players put on a clinic in how to play in the 3v5 how to play extremely patient maybe throwing a little bit of aggression here and there just enough to slow down the attacking team and force the wolves to pivot a little bit worry about a couple of different angles and because the Wolves, they got a little bit indecisive there, they really didn't take much ground other than the two kills they found right off the bat, right? I mean, within a, within a minute 30, two kills were found, everything was going the attacker's way, and then they just kind of stopped. Barring was sneaking around from behind, so I get that they were trying to turn their attention there, that's important, but they kind of abandoned their main stairs push for a moment, and then... When they eventually went back to it, it seemed that they were lacking a little bit of intel and lacking maybe a little bit more of map control as well. I mean, how was Rudy able to sneak around and position himself in 90 Hall? That's a puzzler right there. There was a drone, as we saw, on Barring's position on the top of Red Stairs. They were pinging him and trying to shoot him from below. I assume that drone didn't see all the way down 90, or maybe somebody wasn't watching that drone anymore, because somehow Rudy was able to work his way out of the site, into 90, and line up two kills. Even after he found the first kill, it was unclear if the Wolves identified that and figured out a way to take him down, because he was able to eventually line up a second. The on-site players never really felt that threatened. And there you have it, a 3v5 back-to-back -back rounds with the Wichita Wolves holding an advantage but letting that advantage slip away. Maybe uh, it's PKers not being quite acclimated to the roster yet. Maybe it's an issue with IGLing that mid to late round and really capitalizing on set advantages. But right now, West Garfield just proving that they still have what it takes. They can still hold on. And like you said, 2-0 as Wichita Wolves Academy now start with the study clear, trying for a uh, south to north take. And they've got to deal with Biologic, who's playing the smoke on this AVG roam. Open study wall to his right. And that's really stumping Wichita Wolves Academy for now. They are yet to push in. And Rudy will get aggressive, jumping out, taking the 90 repel player right off his rope. Big guy, the first death. That's your sledge dead. Sure, you don't need his verticality, but the nades always come in handy. And that's a fantastic utility pick. West Garfield. Yeah, one set of nades off the board. Still have two more, though. You've got Chosen and Trevmac, both on the, you know, the Yana, the Finca, respectively. They've got four frag grenades between them, uh, but now they've got to figure out a way to actually utilize them. Right now, we see this academy team working their way around, trying to pivot, maybe locate Forrest. They didn't know he was holding an aggressive angle, but unfortunately for Forrest, he wasn't quite able to find Chosen's head. Only a couple of bullets landing in his shoulder, so the Yana able to survive and uh, looks like to join the rest of the team on a, you know, last minute master sided take. Trev will what? just be sitting crouched in the hallway Trev! and lose the fight to Barring, who had no idea the Finca was there. Talk about errors. Bar is going to make a comment about that, and understandably so. An issue there. Another issue slowing down the side of the Wolves. A couple of flashes coming in, but West Garfield right now, they're playing comfortable. It's their side now in the 5v3 they hold the advantage and they're willing to take gunfights and even forrest is going to be going for a bandit trick where are the nades where's the pressure from below it's nowhere to be found 
Forrest gets that bandit trick off uncontested. You saw the nade was misthrown by Chosen as well, going way too far off the wall to stop any sort of bandit trick. And because Big Guy and Trev Mac died for free, their nades are not of use. So now we're in a three versus five for Wichita Wolves Academy for the first time this game. West Garfield start off with the man advantage, and that will increase by one. Now it's just Chosen and PKers. Barring will go down, but Chosen is dead in the bathtub thanks to a shotgun. Rudy looks away to confirm his kill, and he'll die to PKers. But still, it's a one versus three, and Hibana is very low. Bio will put him out of his misery and Garfield put together three rounds in a row. That's a perfect start rotation to start off the map. Yeah, what a statement to make right off the bat as well. Wes Garfield, I mean, we did preface this by saying we think that maybe the Wichita Wolves Academy team might be the favorites here, uh, but Wes Garfield proving that statement, at least it's seeming that that statement was very wrong, at least here on Villa. That is three very clean defensive rounds. Well, Maybe I'll correct that. Not very clean. The last one was very clean. The first two were messy on the defensive side, but even messier on the attacking side. And just, you know, enough play in the late round, enough cohesion in the late round for the West Garfield defense, uh, just putting that together. It's, it's enough to slow down and defeat this Wichita Wolves Academy attacking side, just given some of the mistakes that they have made. So now on the second half of their, you know, an attacking situation here i mean we've got to see them we've got to see them pivot we've got to see them change something up that last round maybe forget it but look past those first two look at those first two and say okay what are the errors that we made and how do we correct them because theoretically this is a bomb site that they i mean they were looking really good on they held a 3v1 with 10 seconds left they had three players pushing in from three different angles all they had to do was kill rudy who had the measly ump in his hand and very little intel to work off of they fumbled the bag there they dropped the case and they couldn't quite get the kill that is where they have to make the adjustment maybe play a little bit more objective focus maybe play a little bit more unified instead of allowing i think it was who was that i think it was the ash over by the um laundry door who ended up dropping the case last time we've got yes, to, you know so. how do you remedy that this time are you going to maybe have somebody make someone else have the case that makes more sense to have the case or are you going to have them push in together and try to recover that case if possible obviously a lot of speculation but we're going to have to see some action on the side of this wolves team if they want to get something going. Oh, freebie for Forrest. He'll shoot open the barricade. Chosen will be looking straight in his direction, though. Even pre-firing the next window, the Ying, a Ying able to get away pretty safely. Which is Dalbo's Academy. Seeming like maybe they're going to push Pantry this time. Trevmac is posting up early on the window. There is no horizontal clear. There is no clear in from study this time, like we saw in their previous attempt. Big guy, in fact, is all the way down in the basement. Skunky taking the top floor, and this does look like it's going to be primarily a pantry take as Trevmax sends out a nade and a gone six trying to rush on through, but Bio's holding an angle with a shotgun. Rudy the next to find a kill. Bio will finally get traded. In comes the Ying, already using all of her candelas. Big guy will get a second on the round before he's traded out, but Chosen's in the bomb site, getting another kill on an anchor. We've evened out two on two after the initial rush attempt, and while it was messy, it was certainly not perfectly executed by any means. Wichita Wolves Academy, they're still able to keep in step. It really looked like West Garfield were going to run away with the advantage there, but again, big ups to big guy for finding two, coming up from the basement where the defense least expect. Now we've let the dust settle, and the defense has started to recollect themselves, but here comes Skunky right through Meadow. He'll catch Barring by surprise. That leaves it all on Psychosis in the one versus two. Well, these are situations where we've seen the Wolves struggle in the past. They have not been cohesive even when they've held these advantages, but Psychosis has yet to find the scoreboard, and now he's going to have to find two kills or find a way to stop the plant. There's one. He looks for the second towards Laundry. has a pretty good idea of where Chosen is positioned. Chosen has been here the entire time and really hasn't gone for any sort of a rotation, and it looks like he is still going to be holding this angle. But this time, and a big difference is that he's got some intel to work off of. He's spotted Psychosis. He's going to go for the swing, but Psychosis goes for the pre-fire, and he catches him out in the middle of the open. A clean headshot for the Malusi, and Psychosis makes it happen, winning out in the 1v2 yet again. The Wolves struggle to close out rounds where it looks like they have the advantage. Big ups to Psychosis, who won that situation and found his first two kills of the night in that clutch. But uh, again, troubling pattern emerging for this academy team, Wes Garfield, four in a row.
I, I mean, just to start out, I have to question the decision to rush from Wichita Wolves Academy. Uh, West Garfield were not roaming heavily at all. Most of their bodies were on site, and you could see those defenders were ready and waiting for those pushes. I mean, Trev Mack getting caught immediately by the shotgun. I mean, like I said, big guy in the basement was definitely unexpected. He found the proper trades. But in a two versus two like that, the attack did not keep Defender the ball rolling. Skunky and Chosen chose to back off, and that allows the defenders of West Garfield to recollect themselves. Now, sure, Barring goes down, but Psychosis, in the one versus two, playing behind Tetris, knows where those last two attackers are, or at least where they previously were. One coming from Memo, and Chosen, who earlier got a kill from Laundry, and like you said, had not hit a rotation throughout that entire round. Big mistake from Wichita Wolves Academy in the 1v2 was Skunky. Skunky did not allow Chosen to gather the info with the drone before pushing through Memo. We saw Skunky kind of crouch walking in. Psychosis got the shot over the Tetris table, and then the drone found him. If the call from Chosen was to gather info, either he should have let Skunky know, or Skunky should have listened and waited. Because if that was just a straight 1v2, onto a Tetris player who is peeking aggressively into Memo, Wichita Wolves Academy probably go one for one and end up winning the round, but the hesit or the lack of hesitation there from the Lion or the decision to drone from Chosen that perhaps wasn't communicated. Either way, one of those two players lost the round for them, and West Garfield are up 4-0. Wichita Wolves Academy need these next two rounds if they want to keep this map in, you know, really just in winnable range if they go down 5-1 here especially with the way they've been playing on their attack so far it's really troubling yeah, it's not unheard of you know to go a 4-2 on the defensive side on villa actually that's you know quite common but it doesn't look like we're on the way to see a 4-2 half w wichita wolves academy have not shown us that they can take these rounds that they can close out these rounds and they've got to do it now they I mean, this is their last chance to really solidify that 4-2 to two half if they want. Right now, they are just going to work their way on this clear, entering from this trophy and statuary side of the map and working Upon their way located. across. Everyone else on the side of the defense has, you know, slowly been forced away or has been forced to retreat downstairs. Psychosis, instead of going all the way down, has positioned himself on the red stairs for the time being. But Rudy is sneaking around downstairs in kitchen. He no longer has a C4 in pocket as he's already wasted that one and found nothing with it, but he does have an SMG 11 and with the six kills he's already found, he is likely on the hunt for more. The question is, is Wichita Wolves Academy aware of this? They are aware of Psychosis in his position, so Skunky will find the killing blow onto the Wamai on the red stairs, but no, they had no idea that Rudy was just crouch walking up the Astro stairs. He will do so for free lose a little bit of hp but he will get a kill right back onto the lion so that's what we've seen a few times so far in this map from west garfield their ability to just show up somewhere in wichita wolves academy being unable to stop them and i don't know whether again like that's a team cohesion issue not having proper flank watch set up or what have you but either way it's a problem that's going to need to be fixed especially as barring now descends red stairs killing pkers on his way what wasn't even man count is now in the favor of the defense, and you've got a downstairs player that Trev Mac has to deal with. That's Rudy in memo, who's gonna be able to sprint back up red uh, despite being under the watchful eye of the Finca. Trev Mac is gonna go hunting. He'll find the one, but has no idea Barring is still lingering where he had killed the Hibana. Once again, one man advantage here for the defense and 20 seconds remaining for Big Guy and Chosen to try and push in, and they're on opposite sides. The Sledge will come in and he'll lose his fight to Biologic, and that's just the Ash coming in from 90. He's got a mirror window to try and play around. Force is watching it like a hawk, and there's the kill actually from Barring, who comes up for the assist by main stairs. West Garfield now five rounds in a row. They look unstoppable. Frankly, they have been chaining these rounds together. And even when they're making a couple of mistakes, they have a couple of players just sitting on the site who are ready to just, you know, equalize those mistakes and quickly remedy them. We've seen that from Psychosis. We've seen that from Rudy. But since then, I mean, we maybe see a, an occasional round where that happens. Other than that, it is West Garfield all the way. They're doing a fantastic job of just exploiting every single weakness that this attacking side is showcasing. One of those big weaknesses right now is information. Their intel game is in shambles. And that last round was a perfect example of what happens when you have no intel 
at all. They had no idea, one, that there was somebody sneaking around behind them. I believe it was Rudy on the mute who yep. snuck up the Astro stairs and shot someone in the back of the head. That was after they used Intel properly to kill the player on the red stairs, sure. But from there, I mean, speaking of the red stairs, we saw another issue with a lack of intel somebody was creeping down below trying to deal with rudy on those stairs and they and they got him they got that kill but nobody had thrown a drone out or called the fact that barring was also sitting right behind him on the red stairs to play that trait simple things like that i mean astro stairs flank is one of the most common flanks on the top floor of villa in the game in the map how are you not going to have something prepared for that? If you're not going to bring the Nomad up until now, why not throw a drone on there? Have somebody staffing that. Have somebody monitoring that angle or at least listening for the sound of a mute sneaking up behind. Either way, information, clearly a problem. They're going to try to remedy that by bringing out the Nomad. Skunky will be bringing out those air jabs and maybe they can deny the flank a little bit, but they're making an adjustment now with the only possibility is that they can get one round back is that too little too late uh, it really might be considering how momentum based pug stacks tend to be if the vibes are high they can be unstoppable we've seen it from juicers we saw it from west garfield both in the last standalone tournament we saw it from aerial arise academy coming out of nowhere and making fourth well tied third fourth in our last stage and right now west garfield look unstoppable wichita wolves academy have not found an answer in the last five rounds and perhaps we'll have six in a row unless they really get their act together they're going to start with clearing downstairs there's not many players for them to find maybe one i think i just see right on the silhouette i think there's only one player down there uh, barring... Well, okay, Psychosis is there for the assist. So, there's two people down there, but they're not actively challenging the dining area. So, maybe Wichita Wolves Academy's, you know, initial utility clear from below will be relatively uncontested. They just have to be ready and waiting for Barring and Psychosis to pounce. Right, something that West Garville have done really well is they're, they're not dying on the initial, you know, entry in that clear. They're doing a great job of backing off slowly, forcing Wichita Wolves to take their time but backing off safely regardless. And then when they just see that little opening, those very defenders who a moment ago backed off, they will step up in a big way and hunt for a kill. That's exactly what Psychosis is doing right now. He sees a bit of a gap here. He's going for the flank up the pantry stairs. Nobody watching the window. No flank drone in a position. And Trev Mac, he's tunnel vision on getting these nades up towards the floor below. Psychosis won't even get the chance because Barring was also going for the same play. And Trev Mac has no support from any of his teammates. Unusual. Wait, that they he have has a nobody nomad. there with him. And both players will be able to rotate away safely. They literally have a nomad. What? Where, okay, I don't know where the air jabs are. I mean, they'll finally get a trade on a Psychosis, but with a Nomad like that, that should not have been as free a flank as it was. Biological will narrowly avoid the second nade, though his shield will be cleared, and there's the peak that we need from Skunky on Astro Window. So a man advantage, nevertheless, for Wichita Wolves Academy, as they now look to take Astro control and set up for this execute. Rudy is backed off all the way into Boar, barring establishing himself in statuary as Forrest goes down. It's a four versus two, but here's the Jaeger. He'll find one can't turn around and find the second though are we gonna see another 1v3 from rudy seven seconds left the plant needs to go down from pkers big guy will get destroyed by rudy on the peak now one versus two no c4 in hand for the mute this is just gonna have to be gunfights from him to clutch up but he'll get caught skunky with his second kill and wichita academy after six will finally find their first round finally we can see wichita academy you know calming down getting things controlled, and getting the bomb on the floor. Refreshing, to say the least, to see them kind of relax and stay composed in that, I think it was another 3v1 situation. They got the bomb down, they covered the planter instead of seeking that fight and risking their lives in 1v1 after 1v1 after 1v1. They've taken a round, not really a result of any better intel or any denial of flanks, but really just more of onto classic on-site play and pretty good methodical clear the use of the astro window something we always talk about especially when it's absent from attacking teams we highlight how important it is to get somebody on that astro window 
which basically cuts off the entire site. Nobody can rotate freely into Astro. Contesting bathroom is no longer an option. You can't rotate between trophy and statuary for free anymore. And if the tri master triple wall is already opened up and making statuary basically just a death trap for any defender, then you can pretty much destroy any defender who is, you know, trying to rotate out of there as well. So great job from Wichita Academy to get that done. They only have taken one round, though, on the attack, and it doesn't seem like that's going to be enough unless they can just buckle down and just pull out something crazy on the defensive side. It does still feel like a West Garfield map, but only time will tell is we can kind of throw out the mistakes that Wichita Academy made in that first half. Maybe they can use this as a mental reset because they're headed into the second half. They're switching over to the defense, and now it's West, Gar West Garfield's responsibility to get things going on the offensive side. Yeah, I mean, one, we've seen heavily de defense-favored Villas before, and two, like I said, the attack tends to be uh, a little bit of a harder side for pug stacks most of the time, so West Garfield might not be as potent in the second half as they were on the first, but it's still going to fall, I think, onto Wichita Wolves Academy to really step up their game. That's going to start with Trevmac on Ella. Now with the Scorpion in hand, Grismont Mines to assist. He's playing on red stairs as the rest of Wichita Wolves Academy sit over, I believe, on site. No, it looks like there's actually plenty of downstairs players. Chosen and Big Guy, both on the first floor, with Trevmac kind of on that connector helping them maybe covering for a retreat but as the boar wall gets opened west garfield is going to try and establish that crossfire on the red stairs and initiate the clear as forest will actually crouch walk into the basement and be going on the hunt for these roamers and psychosis as well I mean, they're, they know there's somebody lurking around, especially as they work their way on this clear and as they get into 90 Hall. But again, the danger, like you said, Harrison, is a C4. It could line up several Ooh. players, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Big guy with two, a double kill onto Bio and Psychosis. Trevmac with a finisher onto Forest as well. It's Barring and Rudy last alive. Really well-timed from big guy down below. It looks like that roam clear you highlighted, it came just a little too late. You see Barring trying to... See if he can put a hand on where Big Guy has now relocated to. Rudy maybe trying to provide that cutoff, but without three of their teammates and most of their utility in the game taken away, this one is going to be a challenge to say the least. Rudy will now contest the classical hall shield, and that's not going to be uh, happening for very long as PK will fry him. Barring will get one back as he finally removes Big Guy, and the one who really decimated this round for the West Garfield attack has been taken off the board, but it is still barring in a one versus four. Spots out the vault player. Can't quite land the bullets there. Will work his way around towards study. I mean, he's got 12 kills. If there's anyone you want in this situation, it's someone who's proven he can be quite a fragger, but no one really, no matter their skill, is going to have an easy time when you've got an Ella sitting around the corner. Barring will clean that kill up anyway. Good body shot there because the Ella was already low on HP, so now Barring will slip into the site. Knows there's someone in vault, so he'll go for the pre-fire there. Skunky will match his pre-fire with a spray of his own, and Skunky will be the one to find the headshot. Yeah, and I mean, really, that round came down to the perfectly timed C4 from Big Guy down below. The clear from West Garfield looked well put together, right? They had the proper utility being sent over towards Red Stairs to clear. The nade was soon to follow up. You even had Forrest coming from upstairs to pinch the Ella while the Ella was trying to escape. But man, that C4 came in clutch. Big Guy, quite simply... Could not have timed that better. Not only did he get two kills, but it was enough for the Ella to drop down, slam Forrest as well, coming up from the basement. And at that point, the round was pretty much over. It was one on the clear. So well done to Big Guy and the rest of Wichita Wolves Academy for taking their second round. And Jonah, perhaps two rounds in a row, one like that is enough to put the momentum in the back pocket of the Wolves. But ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be like the Wichita Wolves Academy, yeah, like West Garfield, featured on our stream playing against ex-Pro League talent, current T2 talent, the top of T3, etc. You can sign up for next weekend's qualifier. So if you would like to play, if you have already lost out on qual number one, fear not, there is a second one, and it's just around the corner. It is next weekend from the 14th to 16th. It's going to be the same format. Swiss leading into the single elimination group style playoffs where you can qualify for stage two, compete for $5,000 and a coveted spot 
at the Pro-Am to compete against your favorite T1 teams. So don't delay, exclamation point, play for more info and for the sign-up link. And you can be casted by the likes of me and Jonah, or Carter and Benny, or C CJ and Connor, any, any six of us. You'll be on stream, and we'll make fun of you for making dumb plays. And One more, I mean, what else we also have a little bit of a maybe, maybe a bit of a casting surprise in store. Maybe a little bit of a, a Kiwi casting surprise in store in the next qualifier. So if mm -hmm. you want to be casted by some uh, wonderful New Zealand talent, Lupanda. Oh yeah. Go to, um, and Cthulhu. Also tune in. Yeah. And Who's Cthulhu. Russian? Yeah. Just right. like Ferme. <laughs> exactly. Oh, maybe, I mean, maybe we can hear them speak Russian to each other on broadcast. That would be fantastic. Hey. That could be you. Cast it in Russian. Wouldn't that be thrilling? Again, yeah, that is that is next week. Uh, it's hopefully going to be a lot of fun. If you've tuned in the tuned, tuned into this qualifier, make sure uh, you check out the signups for the next one. I believe exclamation point play in Twitch chat will get you all the information you need there. But back to the game at hand. We are just about 60 seconds into this round, and uh, not a ton of progress has been made here from this West Garfield attack, but, you know, they're not facing a ton of pressure from this defense just yet. We can see the outlines of four players all on that north side, but you've got one player lurking below. That's going to be Skunky, the mute, with a C4 in pocket. I do believe either that C4 is pre-placed or already expended, so maybe he'll have to find his impact elsewhere, but, I mean, he'll be able to maybe work a bit of a flank there is no nomad in play after all and you know if the first half taught us anything at that these teams could be susceptible to these flanks if not careful yeah judging by the utility overlay if it's correct skunky has already used it i didn't actually didn't hear an explosion but maybe he just used it really really early on while we weren't watching forest will send a nade in trying to clear a corner be unsuccessful barring will just blitz into the site he'll find one psychosis another there's a second for the zoe chosen gets one kill in the bathroom that's the hibana dead but that's not the case carrier psychosis finds the trade bios planting and here he comes trying to find his third skunky to hold off the iana will find it but he's still in a one versus three with barely any hp left and now in a post plant what an execution from West Garfield, seeing the hole and capitalizing perfectly, though Barring won't capitalize on the low HP mute, missing literally every single shot, but he doesn't get past Biologic, who's hiding behind the statue, and what looked like could potentially be the start of a comeback for Wichita Wolves Academy will promptly be ended by West Garfield as they put themselves on map point. It is map point, but it is not quite, you know, match point or series point just yet. If you tuned into the previous days of qualifiers, those have all been best of ones. But here in the closed quals, we are doing best of threes. We've got 16 teams, and if they win two best of threes, they are making stage two of SCS. So no matter what happens here on Villa, the outcome that we might be able to predict at this point, Wichita Wolves Academy, they are still in the mix. They can go to our next map, which is going to be Oregon and they can bounce back if they can. I mean, and same thing goes for West Garfield. If Wichita Wolves Academy pull out some sort of a miraculous comeback here, it's not out of the question for either team because this is, after all, a best of three. We've got two best of three series coming your way this evening. But Defending yes, it is now map point attack. West Garfield after a very nice attack there, a strong execute, looking for the smallest opening, and when they found it, they pounced. They sprint on. They sprint, sprinted on into that site. You had psychosis and barring at the helm of that push. Barring, I believe, just from that statuary door. Psychosis from the master door, pushing in, taking flights and winning them. Barring right now with 15 kills. And I know that PKers on the side of Wichita Wolves Academy. I know he likes bagels, but it's not him I'm talking about here. It is Forrest, who's on a donut right now or a bagel. Zero kills for him. Yet to find the scoreboard, but thankfully for Forrest, I mean, and for West Garfield as a whole. Everyone right now is contributing and putting up some numbers, barring especially dropping 15 so far, and we're only eight rounds in. Pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, that is uh, nearly a 2.0 KD. Or, sorry, 2.0 KPR. Uh, he's actually got over a 2.0 KD. He has a 2.5 KD right now. Like you said, barring has been doing very well for himself. A little bar bar. His team leading 6-2. and two. And Wichita Wolves Academy. We thought they had a concrete response. They had strung two rounds in a row, but their streak has been swiftly put to rest. And now they face the added pressure of facing map point. We have a little bit of a swap from West Garfield as well. Biologic offline onto Dokabi, who brings those phone calls. So a little bit more active info. Brings 
Of course, stuns for burn and a gone six for utility clear if you'd like, and that might come in handy here with Trevmac playing this shield by lamp. So there's not really a lot covering it. It's really just this Aruni gate, the Zofia, or the Dokubi could clear it by themselves, and Trevmac is gonna say, all right. They've already done away, or they're about to do away with this utility. I might as well fall back now, which, of course, is the correct decision. So a little bit of utility wasted, not a whole lot of time. Of course, you do still have Skunky down below, though, with that C4. But if West Garfield choose to push in fast again, that C4 might not have a whole lot of usefulness. Well, barring as well, he may be just looking to push on in yet again. Much go. like last round, he is already just in the middle of the site here. He'll get one. Trevmac just not paying attention, but big guy is there to find the trade. Chosen will also get one at the same time, taking down Rudy. So it will be West Garfield on the back foot here. Forrest trying to find the scoreboard and bring things back for his team. But a pre-fire is not going to land more than one bullet. And PKers off screen will take down Psychosis as well. A 2v4 for Bio and Forest, and right now with a minute to go, they've got a good bit of time to work with. Bio does have a drone as well, but they've gotta be careful because a couple of these defenders are lurking elsewhere, but it looks like they put their finger on Chosen pretty quickly. They found his position and they dealt with him. Now it's Bio's turn to step on up. A look to get something going in the site. There is a little bit of a flank happening potentially from that boar landing. That's gonna be PK on the smoke. He'll go for the swing and Bio will somehow get oh, out no. of that alive. Now he'll go prone, avoiding the shotgun. PK has oh, no, no idea, and there he goes. A 4v2, now a 2v2, as West Garfield have worked their way back into this one. Skunky now on the long angle, trying to get something going. Another flank now in play from Big Guy, who's taken up PKer's position. Forrest well, knows know. that, and so does Bio. Now they're going to turn their attention to the site, maybe turn to objective focus and try to get this bomb down. No C4 from Skunky, so Bio's gonna do this in Forest on the coverage. He does have to cover two angles, though. He's gotta cover the statuary door, and he's gotta cover the other side, and they'll what? do so perfectly. Forest hops up, gets one. Bio pops off the diffuser and closes them down, and that is the map. A 2v4 once again. West Garfield cannot lose these rounds. They'll take map one. I can't believe West Garfield just won that initially. Barring goes in fast. He gets one pick on the Trev Mac, but West Garfield, they don't get the jump on the Wichita Wolves Academy members. Except for Trev Mac, the rest of them were pretty well adjusted and prepared to handle the fast execute. It ends up being a two versus four as West Garfield pump on the brakes. But I, they still win the round because Wichita Wolves Academy don't know when to stop pushing. Chosen, you're already 1 HP. You hear the Finca drop master, and yet he engages LMG versus Roni, and he loses that because of course he does. He's 1 HP. Then you have, you have PKers in Boar. First of all, if you're going to play that close, have the shotgun out. Second of all, he whiffs his entire SMG 11 mag, which he really shouldn't have done. That should have been the freest kill of his life. Third of all, after missing all of the shots, he gets aggressive and peeks out instead of play, like, playing on sight. He gets aggressive and throws his life away to Bio and throws away the man advantage. Now it's a two versus two, and the Jaeger, instead of holding across in sight, decides to flank further, doesn't catch anyone, Leave Skunky pretty much alone in Astro Split. Uh, Witch Dolls Academy are, in a word, um, disappointing so far. This is not the level of play that we're used to seeing from them. We used to see them as not someone who has necessarily qualified for our leagues in the past, but still a very formidable team in qualifiers, always making it to the last round, always being this close, but they have, uh, it looks like they perhaps have degraded a bit. At least on Villa. We know West Garfield is strong on Villa because we saw it in the standalone tourney. West Garfield put up some serious numbers on this map against arguably much stronger teams in Wichita Wolves Academy. So map one will not go their way. We've got Oregon though coming up next and that should be an exciting one to watch. Before we do that though, another shout out to one of our amazing sponsors, Mavix Gaming Chairs. An interesting tidbit, last night I was talking to my friend Howard, showing him um, our you know product here at SCS and he was like, wait a minute, Mavix is one of your sponsors. I actually already own a Mavix chair and he's not even a gamer. He just works a nine to five, <laughs> grinding it out. These chairs are incredibly comfortable. I think that can attest to it. Someone who doesn't even game who's sitting for a long period of time wants to rock a mavix gaming chair and heck 
you should rock one too. You can get yours for as low as $22, $22 a month with monthly installments. And on top of all that, you can use your NSG discount to save $55. Use code NSG55. Incredible, incredible shares, incredible savings, all of that at mavix.com. That is M A V I X.com slash Nerd Street Gamer. So take a look at that during this break. When we come back, we've got Oregon map two of this first round of the closed qualifiers. We'll be back in a moment. B3, make that a 1v2. Two seconds left. It's going to come down. Faber making a third as he looks up. Make it up. He finds the draw three. There's two. Stunning here. Welcome to the Nerd Street Winter Championships, featuring SCS6, a yearly open tournament series hosting the best players and teams North America has to offer, culminating in a community favorite, the Pro-Am. So let's discuss format. During the Winter Champ season, SCS6 will consist of two stages, where each stage begins with two open qualifiers. Once Stage 1 is complete, there will be an additional tournament offering one more qualification spot prior to Stage 2. Through participating in SCS 6, players will acquire leaderboard points and cash prizing. The winning teams from Stage 1 and 2, as well as the additional tournament, will qualify for the Pro-Am. The top two teams from the leaderboard will also qualify. As we approach the end of the season, the final qualification spot will be determined through a last chance qualifier. The Grand Finals of the Winter Champs SCS 6 will feature the return of the Pro-Am, where the top amateur teams have an opportunity to define their talent against the North American Pro League. But in the end, only one team will be crowned Winter Champs. Sign up today and make history. Harrison, map one was uh, not as close as I think we thought it would be. No. Villa, pretty much a blowout. West Garfield, 7-2. to two, Very clean victory over Wichita Wolves Academy, who had so many chances, so many chances, and let those chances just slip through their grasp. Yeah, there were plenty of rounds where Wichita Wolves would have the advantage. I mean, rounds one, round two, plenty. And they were just unable to transition it into a round win, be it a single misplay that ends up completely throwing the round away, or Garf West Garfield coming up out of nowhere with someone just having a stellar performance like Rudy in that initial 1v3. They were uh, certainly not the team that we are used to seeing, but now moving on to Oregon, hey, maybe Wichita Wolves Academy are going to have a better time on this map. We know that they do like this map, but... So do West Garfield. We saw them take down a couple pretty tough teams in the standalone tournament on this map as well because they played Villa in Oregon uh, quite a bit. I think they only, right? They only lost Oregon to Juicers, right? I think they did they beat Wichita Wolves on this map, or was this one of the maps they lost? Honestly, I don't know. We've seen too much. Oregon. I can't it's remember all together. <laughs> yeah, there's. <laughs> There's been a lot of these, but Wichita Wolves Academy will uh, do what their opponent did on the last map and ban Thatcher. Again, popular ban on every single map for very good reason. He makes uh, those defender electronic utilities just kind of bust and uh, they're down. 
just like that with the ease of a single grenade hibana the next if you're gonna ban a hard breacher on this map it's typically going to be her the thatcher's already out so maverick not as popular but sometimes we do see maverick thatcher bans but this is pretty much going to guarantee that the maverick is banned or the maverick is played every single round especially if wichita Wolves academy leave up the cade Yes, usually we see the Mira band in combination with the Valkyrie, the Kaid, I mean, probably going to be left up here if I'm not crazy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. These teams do not want to deal with the Mira either, and that is completely understandable. Uh, the Mira, especially, I mean, on Oregon, especially that basement site becomes incredibly challenging to deal with and already on a map that requires so much utility clear and often a good bit of patience. If you have those black mirrors in play, it even it adds to that, you know, threefold. It really changes how you have to play it as an attacking team and that is exactly why these uh these teams will not be bringing the mira into play at all again the valkyrie is gone two maps in a row where we don't see a valkyrie or a thatcher uh, the habana gone is uh, different from villa we saw the flores band instead and that does mean we do have the possibility of seeing those rotero drones come into play it's possible it seems but we're not going to have that in round number one instead as west garfield begin things on their attacking side we're going to see a pretty stock standard lineup nothing too out of the ordinary the thermite Defenders is going to come one. out as one of those hard breachers and the maverick will come out as well forest uh -oh. rocking that and already harrison we are not off to the best start for which john wolves academy chosen uh, you're gonna take his own impact to the face. Yeah, that's uh, not great, especially if he wanted to save those impacts for creating rotations on the upstairs while roaming. They are reinforcing part of the meeting wall, so perhaps there's gonna be uh, some roamage. Yeah, we have Trebmac opening and rotate into attic, so at the very least, I imagine this alibi is going to be upstairs. There's actually, okay, the mute is gonna be assisting with jammers in kitchen. Skunky rocking the MP5K rather than the shotgun, meaning he wants to get a little bit more aggressive than we're used to seeing those SMG11 players get. Hopefully, Wichita Wolves Academy are a little more well-versed on this map than they were on Villa, because otherwise we're in for a pretty swift 2-0. Like you said, West Garfield are bringing that Thermite. He tends to be the premier hard breacher on this map right after the Hibana, so the Maverick likely going to be supporting him opening a lot of those walls. But on this side, of course, it's mainly hatch-centric. There's really nothing to stop the Thermite from opening those hatches, so we might not see the Maverick uh, as useful on that side of things. Maybe we'll just see him do things like open up the single wall downstairs, open up elbow, stuff like that. But the drones right now hunting down Chosen, who already is on low HP, he might be susceptible to this roam clear more so than his other teammates. Yeah, Chosen is, I mean, now in a tough spot in the classic corner by Kids Dorms just pinned here. If anyone spots him out, he is probably going to be dealt with pretty quickly, but it seems that West Garfield are taking their time. They don't want to be caught off guard by another roamer potentially also on that top floor. And at the same time, they're going to put a lot of resources into dealing with this clear from below. They know that they can guarantee the kill onto Chosen if they can prevent his cutoff down the hatch. And, uh, well, it's not going to go too well to start. Trevmac is actually the one to get the opening blow. And now Psychosis walks happening? himself into the middle of a crossfire. He'll fall. Rudy will get a trade, though. But Trevmac is now on a triple as he whips his way around towards the shower corridor and dusts Rudy where he stands. Chosen now, who was basically a dead man earlier, will come back from the grave and deal with Bio, leaving Forrest alone in a 1v4. That was maybe the most awkward set of engagements I've ever seen in Kitchen. That made no sense. And Forrest is probably about to get blindsided by Trev. There we go. It's a 4K for the Alibi, who did not have a great map on Villa. We even saw him completely whiff on a Jaeger, who had no idea he was there five feet in front of him. But he's going to start off this map on a 4K. Oh, okay. So Chosen walked up to the wall and tried to put down a bulletproof cam but he had impacts. That's why he impacted himself. That was a little bit unfortunate, but he was still able to make work on the realm, right? He was still able to get one of those kills on those clearers. West Garfield attempting to just kind of push it dry in the kitchen against the alibi. That was definitely a, a result of lack of info. I mean, maybe those mute jammers really coming in clutch from Skunky, but either way, Trevmac blindsiding the first player, 
The second of, I think, Psychosis on the Finca playing like ring around the rosy around the center island for like 15 seconds, fighting not only Trev Mac peeking him, but also Skunky spamming through the wall. Trev eventually picks up that kill because Psychosis has no idea where to look. And from there, the roam clear completely falls apart as they continue to push doorways into angles held by the defenders. So well done on the realm to which Wattaw Wolves Academy. Well done to Trev Mac for his opening 4k and now we head on to dorms with which Wolves academy uh 1-0 already with 50 percent of the rounds they had on villa an impressive start no question about that especially you know the way they won that round was with a very successful roma maybe less of a roman more of just a simple extension extending all the way up into kitchen it was a basement site after all it's not a roam that you know we are that like it's not a stranger to us that roam but it is unusual to see it work that well it was really well executed and they did a good job of allowing chosen on the top floor to rotate back safely like you talked about harrison and uh you know fight with the team getting a frag as well i mean very impressive given the situation he started the round in but here we are on round number two and we can no longer head towards the basement but that doesn't mean we're not going to see a very similar kitchen extension on this top floor after all a kitchen is still a vital place to hold down if you want to prevent the attacking team from working their way in from below and providing a little bit of vertical pressure of their own. For now, though, that is not going to be Wes Garfield's plan of attack. They have already swung their way into Arsenal. That's Bio's role on the sledge. And they are looking to just get this pressure building on the site as early as possible. Bio will have to be wary of the shots coming from Tower. But uh, Big Guy is going to have to be wary of Psychosis. Where was Psychosis? I think Big Window? Big Window? Yeah. He just swings Big Window and takes the player down on the rotate. Big Guy just not paying quite enough attention to his surroundings. Yeah, Psychosis playing on those slits in the barricade that were either opened by the defense previously or that he had stealthily opened himself. Either way, they catch Big Guy off guard, and here come the Ying Candelas blinding those anchors. In comes the C4, though, but it's shot right in front of Rudy's face. He'll get the bomb down. What immaculate cover, I believe, from the Ying, but somehow Rudy is going to for some reason, try and put an exothermic charge on the wall post plant. PK gets his own kill. Bio refrags to make it a three on three, but in comes the Jaeger of Trevmac, easily finishing off that sledge. Barring is gonna have to get on the rappel and try and deny this counter defuse. The nade from below isn't gonna land. Oh no, this is a free round. No, PK dies. We're gonna have to have another attempt. Chosen gets on it. Trevmac will cover adequately though, and Wichita Wolves Academy take their second round in a row, again, amongst quite the chaotic set of engagements. Yeah, it, it's chaos. It's kind of awkward in the middle round there, especially, I mean, after the bomb goes down, what in the world were Wes Garfield doing? I mean, trying to get the exothermic charge down on the wall. I mean, I get why, kind of. Really <laughs> You're trying to like get some more coverage, see a couple of more angles to work with. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was it was quite funny because he didn't have coverage. Normally, you'd have a lot of coverage to do that, but I guess he figured it's the post plant. We just got the bomb down. No way a defender is going to be up in my face. But there he was. There goes your thermite. Nobody was on the coverage, and so that gave master control and closet control firmly to the defense, and that retake became, I mean, incredibly easy to get done because Wes Garfield had been forced away from what are typically known as those more you know, strong power positions. They didn't have time to get on the rappel, to go downstairs and contest that from below. Uh, it was a, definitely a disjointed execute and a disjointed post plant from Wes Garfield. That's two rounds kind of back to back where we've seen this clumsy attack, not something that we saw at all on Villa on either side of the coin. Defense attack, Wes Garfield, they looked clean and tidy, but here on Oregon, things will come off to a rocky start. Now we've got dining for Wichita Wolves Academy, and it's looking like the old frozen supernova setup with the shields inside of small tower, Goyo shields to be exact, the crossfire being established again via shields through the dining wall into bottom small, making this a tough position for the attack to try and clear out. Plenty of shields, plenty of utility dedicated. In fact, actually, uh, all the shields facing the west side the last one of course being over towards the showers hall the west garfield have for the most part i believe spawned on the other side of the map so uh, they might be going for a kitchen plant in which case the entire strategy from wichita wolves will be null and void but rudy in fact gets an early one spamming through the window either spamming through the window or catching trev mac on a spawn peak the goyo dies in green hall and that is a c4 down in fact the only c4 down very early on 
And that player, the Goyo, I mean, always a core component of any sort of small tower extension. Probably why we're no longer going to see any defender staffing that extension any longer. Now that they know where West Garfield are approaching from, and it is not the small tower side, this defense is going to be forced to rotate around and contest this attack from elsewhere. Because... Trevmac has been dealt with in that Green Hall. That gave Forrest the opportunity to actually w work his way all the way up Green Hall to get a nade off. And he also can confirm that it is safe for Rudy to get that exothermic charge down and into the mix. That wall has now been opened and an opportunity to push into Kitchen is probably close around the corner. They will still have to deal with the pressure from above, though. Can't always uh, leave that exposed because if somebody is like big guy is the frost or chosen can peek down through those floor holes then there's no chance that plant is going to go off without a hitch that's psychosis's job here trying to prevent somebody from stepping into kids but maybe he doesn't know there's somebody already in that position regardless we're going to see a bit of an execute coming down here for west garfield psychosis will take one and forest will deal with pkers and there goes psychosis rolling through in kids getting the most important kill of the round bio will get the last kill right after skunky gets one back but a much cleaner execute from west garfield enabled heavily by some expert play from psychosis up above yeah that round was Really well played by West Garfield. That was a beautiful adjustment to move over towards the meeting side of things. Wichita Wolves Academy, it looked like just dedicated a little too much towards the small tower side. I mean, you can see they were only able to reposition a single shield back towards that side. One, because uh, the other players weren't in range to, and two, because the Goyo was dead, so he couldn't pick up his shields again. There was nothing on the wall. No mute jammer, no nothing. That could have stopped that breaching charge. The players upstairs were unable to do their job because Psychosis caught Chosen mid-rotate and the Frost lost his gunfight. Again, to Psychosis. So, really good top floor clear from the Iana at the same time as the Execute. I don't know how Forrest was able to simply sprint into security from the breach, but he was, and that took out another key crossfire on the site. West Garfield just covered pretty much every single angle they needed to. They even had someone coming in from the back from Small Tower towards the end of the round at the exact right time. And Wichita Wolves Academy did not have enough dedicated towards that side of the map to stop him. So now we're in 2-1. Uh, you know, not... Terrible territory for either team. This is pretty much what you expect. Wichita Wolves Academy winning the two primary defenses. West Garfield taking the offsite and dining is certainly uh, the least played on this map. Uh, I think I don't think that can really be argued. But Wichita Wolves are going to go back down to the basement where uh, West Garfield hadn't touched in the previous attempt. Remember, every single person died on that roam clear, and Wichita Wolves Academy have this roam set up once again. I mean, yeah, they're going to try to contest Kitchen heavily again. They're going to put a lot of stock into just delaying as much as they can. And, I mean, if it's anything like the first round, not only delaying, but collecting several kills as West Garfield try to make their entry. The only question in my mind now is, is West Garfield going to, you know, walk into that extension and try to clear it out like last time, risking a lot of time and, in many cases, their lives? Or are they going to try to circumvent that and go for more direct approach? I mean, there's very little utility over towards blue and over towards a bunker and a potential, you know, elbow execute right now. But West Garfield, they are still going to commit to this full clear. I mean, they're going to enter through this top floor. Psychosis and Bio will be doing that in tandem, trying to make sure nobody is on that top floor all the way up. And eventually that will lead into a second floor floor clear or at least a main floor clear there will be so one player though trying to slow down this top floor pressure and that's going to be chosen maybe working a bit of a tower stairs flank we'll see if west garfield have anything set up for it it looks like psychosis is maybe watching down attic his barring continues to clear through kitchen oh he was actually using the iana clone he will spot out that roamer and pre-fire through the meeting wall attempting to maybe catch anyone rotating down the tower stairs but We'll settle to just hop on a drone and continue to scope things out to make way for barring. Chosen is prone behind the metal box, however. Will Psychosis' drone check it? No, it won't in time. Skunky is able to catch it. Here comes the Zoe, but he'll be able to take the head off of the mute. And up comes the Malusi at the wrong time. He'll have to settle for just a little bit of damage on Rudy and a dead teammate before he skates away. Ill-timed double push in tower from the defense will result in the death of the mute and a C4. Again, the only C4 off the table with less than a minute to go. Now West Garfield have the control they need in 
now it's just about turning their attention to the site itself. Their time is limited, and they still have a lot of utility to go up against. Thankfully for them, there's one fewer player to actually encounter. Unfortunately for them, though, Bio will fall. PKers on that smoke will continue to frag out, and Forrest will actually end up getting flash. Doesn't seem to matter, though. He'll step up and take one player down. Oh! But here comes Wichita Wolves. Chosen lines two up, and everyone on West Garfield will fall back to back to back. There's the round, and the defenders will take it. Um, okay. Wichita Wolves, namely Chosen, really holding on the pillar. After his blunder in Small Tower that really killed Skunky there, West Garfield attempt a pretty split push, right? It was one coming down Laundry. I don't remember who it was. One coming down Freezer. That was Psychosis. And three attempting to drop E-Box and push Tower Stairs. First of all, the laundry player got smoked by PKers. Excellent shot from uh, from him to take out that point of entry for the attack. Now you're left with just Freezer and Tower without actually ever taking pillar control. So Chosen was still there. Frozen drops in and gets a swing onto PKers, but he doesn't want to get trapped in the middle of the site, so he goes back out after Chosen already kills like two other people despite being Zo stunned on the tower stairs. I, and that was just down to West Garfield really not hitting their shots on that Malusi. That was really strange and Forrest was just way too low HP to try and fight back. Meanwhile, you have the Jaeger just doing what he does best over towards Freezer and winning his fight against Psychosis. And I think the attack in general was just kind of, it was too spread out from West Garfield. Uh, especially considering that they did not have pillar. So not only was it spread out, but they didn't really have the control to make a spread out attack like that work all that well. So now we're 3-1, which is all Wolves Academy. Once again, take the primary site. Now they go back on to dorms. Which, this is the only round that West Garfield actually got the plant down in, and it was not successful. Their post plant were uh, was thwarted. Honestly, it looked pretty pretty fluidly from Wichita Wolves Academy. I mean, that's kind of been, I mean, it's been the theme for Wichita Wolves Academy in the last couple of rounds here. It's been fluid for them. It's been chaotic for West Garfield. That's kind of the dichotomy we're dealing with right now. And if West Garfield want to get some of these rounds back, I don't think that chaotic strategy has been working for them, whether that's been a strategy or simply a mistake. They've got to start tidying things up and, you know, working a little bit better as a team right now. And so far, I mean, they've worked their way into the building, much like last time, but Rudy won't be able to get this exothermic charge down because there are two mute jammers, not just one on the wall. He's trying to find the spot <laughs> if that solo single mute jammer wouldn't cover it, but uh, there's double mute jammers, so there's no shot that he is going to be able to get that one down. Big Guy is also attempting a possible Electro Claw trick as well. He knows that the exothermic charge is going down. He can hear it being placed and then can picked up and then placed again, but... Uh, Chosen will actually be the first frag on the board. The Alibi maybe getting a bit too aggressive will fall to Forrest, who gets that opening blow. So Forrest will start to, you know, continue to pick things up, and Psychosis will also do so, taking down Skunky. Big guy still challenging on this game's window, eager for a fight. Yeah, we saw Skunky downstairs earlier, actually hunting down the Iana, who is, of course, tasked with clearing utility from below, but it ends up being the mute to die, and now it's a 5v3 in the favor of West Garfield. Bio is just in the middle of the site, sprinting through Attic, because no one's covering it. He gets the kill on the anchor inside. Trevmac downstairs grabs one. PKers on the site, another, but Trevmac can't come back to the site safely. Now it's just the smoke. He downs Barring. We're in a 1v2. It's extremely doable, but he doesn't expect Rudy to already be in kids, and he dies in the rotate. West Garfield field able to take forms away from the wolves and now it's three to two an important round for west garfield because that one right there essentially secured the attacking half for them at the very least they can say okay we got our two rounds and we got the job done more often than not oregon is going to be that defensive sided map that we all know and love or sometimes hate but regardless two rounds is a job well done a third would be a bonus, and that's what they're going to be looking forward to now. They've got another opportunity at attacking dorms. The first time they got the plant down, but they couldn't close it down on the post plant. The second time, it looked a lot cleaner. The pattern continues. We may see an even more dominant round for them, but now it's time for Wichita Wolves to make some adjustments of their own. We just saw in the last round how it seemed that they maybe got a bit too aggressive for their own good. They started losing those early picks, and even though Big Guy you know, was holding in a very 
a very important position, trying to electric claw trick that wall, trying to deny that breach from ever being opened. Everyone else kind of crumbled around him. And eventually, because there was no coverage on the site, the manpower dwindled in such a way that Bio was able to walk in and just pre-fire the Kaid in the corner and get the kill onto Big Guy. So good adjustment there in the mid round from West Garfield. They've got their two rounds. They would love to find a third. It's back up to dorms to do it. And I would love to see if Wichita Wolves Academy, instead of roaming two people below, actually cover Attic this time. Because again, like you had mentioned, that was the focal point of that attack. But Bio just sprinting in from the pit doorway. You got Big Guy as the Echo now positioned in Attic behind a shield that faces not only the drop, but also Trophy. Is going to be trying to assist the defense with those yokai drones perhaps even getting aggressive with them to help facilitate uh an aggressive play from the defense you know we sometimes see yokais act as like an attacker drone to scope out areas and allow for info for a roamer but he does have it placed quite far off of site. West Garfield are looking like they want to go for an east to west clear because Wichita Wolves Academy have quite the open floor plan set up. Not only is Armory Wall open, they've also got, again, half of uh, the attic wall open for this Echo to play around with his shield. You've even got Roamers downstairs in the Mute and I believe Chosen on the Jaeger. Skunky with the Wamai as well, attempting to increase the longevity of these shields with those Wamai discs. But the Broody will just sprint up. And he'll attempt to open the trophy, or sorry, the master wall. And that pretty much, for the most part, will kind of circumvent this hold in uh, in Attic from Big Guy. Or at least make it a little bit easier for West Garfield to clear that shield. West Garfield are trying to do a couple of different things at once, right? We see them clearing the top floor, but they're also trying to clear out Trevmac. Right now, who is not entirely alone. He's got support from Chosen on the top of Freezer Stairs, but not immediate support doesn't quite necessarily have the trade if it comes in an important moment. Psychosis wow. lines up two. PKers and Skunky line up for the Yana. Chosen as well will fall. Forrest collecting that kill. Now Trevmac, the player I talked about below, he's now going to find a lot of pressure and he'll get one, but not a second. As Barring will roll through and collect that kill, Rudy will also find one from above. And West Garfield, that is two in a row for them. And that is definitely the round they wanted. The half they wanted, it's three to three. The entire point of a downstairs roam like that is to make sure the attackers don't aggressively push up white early, and those roamers were playing very passively. Psychosis able to just slip by and line up two in the site. It looked like Skunky may have been aware of the position, but even he couldn't stop it, and that was actually Psycho's second kill. He had initially grabbed the smoke of PKers, and because you have two roamers off-site, Chosen dies coming up towards Freezer. Sure, Trev gets one refrag, but that's not enough because now Big Guy is the only anchor there, and he's cowering behind a shield. The weakness of that kind of setup is if the attack take in Trophy and kill your anchors over by Whiteside, now you're stuck. Because if you try and escape, then you have your attackers, you know, able to get a free angle on you as you try to get away from the shield. And even if you are able to get away, then you have attackers barreling in from the other side of the site now waiting for you. So, also Bio, Bio even said they thought the site was meeting and they were still able to win the round. It was an impressive uh, clear. It, it was, a, I have to say, the last two rounds in a row, or actually three in a row, even their dining defense from Wichita Wolves Academy were all like i guess um what, what can i what word can i use misapplication of utility and manpower i guess like having some things like fully on lockdown and then some things just as massive gaping holes in the defense and west garfield have been able to find those holes every single time right i mean and it looks like it's west garfield taking this time out right they did uh, lose a player disconnect and so we'll get him back in this lobby but uh, with this time out i think it'll be useful for both teams but honestly i would say it's even more important for wichita wolves academy right now they are you know sitting in that position that we've talked about before they have maybe the momentum has started to slip away from them after you know a great start to the defense with two rounds in a row they were looking dominant west garfield we talked about it it was chaotic it was messy on the attacking side but now after tidying things up they shift onto what would we refer to as the easier side of things here the defensive side right this is where 
Now it's the responsibility of Wichita Wolves Academy to step up and get things going. Now with barring back in the game here, we should be able to head into it in just a moment, and we will get a chance to see if Wichita uh -oh. Wolves Academy can come out of the gate strong. Because if not, if they let a couple of these rounds start to slip away, then they may forget you know, what it was like to take that round win, and uh, they may be in a pretty tough spot. But here, as we are on our final day of our qualifiers, of our first qualifiers, important to talk about our second qualifying opportunity coming up. There is still another chance to qualify for SCS6. You can make our second split and you can make the Pro-Am. Just make sure to sign up for our second set of qualifiers coming up this weekend or next weekend, okay? It is 50 bucks if you didn't sign up for the first. If you got the Qual Pass, we'll see you there. It's gonna be a blast. January 14th to 16th, exclamation point, play in chat. Regardless of if you make it or not, you'll have an opportunity to be casted by some of us. You'll have an opportunity to be featured on stream, talked about by the community, and hopefully an opportunity to make it into close calls and make it into the stage. The two teams we've got in front of us, they played exceptionally well over the last two days, and they're just trying to close it out here on day three. We also have a... So earlier, right, the timeout was due to a disconnect, and Barring is now back, and I think he got auto-picked on the Cav. So whether Wes Garfield like it or not, they have a Cavera, who is now prone in tower. We'll see if Wichita Wolves Academy can spot her out. I mean, hey, maybe the Cav can work. We saw how much those flanks gave the attack trouble last time on Villa. Wichita Wolves Academy seemed like they were uh, allergic to setting up proper cams and flank watch. Hopefully it's going to be better here on Oregon as they look to clear the top two floors. There's not a lot challenging them, save Psychosis, who is now ascending the Armory Stairs, looking to get an early pick. Have they spotted the Cav? Do they know? I think he does. Yeah, they... No, he Wait, doesn't. no, they don't! He doesn't! No, they don't! Interrogation on the Trevmac! Barn's going to get away with it! No, big guy TK'd! He TK'd through the floor! Wow! The timing from Big Guy, who will then transition to a pistol kill on a Rudy? Alright, Big Guy is uh, the savior of the round right now. Team killing Trevmax so he wouldn't get interrogated, and then killing Rudy. And Psychosis, who went for that aggressive play upstairs, will die. The Cav, though, does get her revenge before being traded out by Skunky. So, a little bit of a hectic roam clear. Wichita Wolves Academy still come out on top by one man. Rudy, I mean... Unfortunate for him that he wasn't able to pick up that kill, but I mean, big guy may have just saved and won the round for Wichita Wolves Academy. I have no idea how he was able to not only kill his teammate and then whip around and take down Rudy, but impressive stuff. And that has thrown, as you can see, West Garfield into a bit of a tizzy. They threw a couple of bodies at Wichita Wolves Academy trying to get something back. And they were able to get a pick here and there. They took down uh, big guy in response. The Cav did, barring did. Um, but they lost overall in that trade battle. It's Bio and Forest left in a two versus three. We've seen them do it before. It's not out of the question by any means. And they do have a good bit of intel about what is going on. They've heard the exothermic charge now go off. They know about the players sitting in freezer. And so they've repositioned one of those deployable shields to deal with it. In addition, you've got Bio, the smoke, the perfect player you want last alive to delay the onslaught of these attackers as much as possible. But can you delay three attackers and stay alive? That's going to be the question because 20 seconds remain. Bio only has one more toxic smoke, but Wichita Wolves Academy, they seem reluctant to push on up, and that may bite them in the back if they're not careful. Forrest is Forrest. sitting close around the corner. Skunky and Chosen will just Forrest push in one round. at a time. Forrest gets Ooh. one, but quickly traded low 1v1. Skunky on low HP. Bio, all you've got to do is hide. He, sna he goes behind the wall, and he'll survive what? it, but man, that was close. What? First of all, Rome clear from Wichita Wolves Academy. They had no info on the Cav, and yet, big guy still, like you said, almost saves the round. He team kills his teammate, he gets the kill on the Wamai. Sure, he gets traded by Cav, but there's another uh, trade from Wichita Wolves Academy. They end up 3-2. to two. That sight play from Bio and Forrest could not have been played better. They both, they both played to their shotguns, first of all. Or, I mean, CJ said it before. He thinks you can adequately defend Oregon with five shotguns. And I honestly, depending on your side setup, I, I agree. Shotguns are oh so good on this map because of how many tight little corners there are. 
just like we saw Forrest and Bio playing. Bio around towards the rotate, Forrest covering long haul because of the info. They know there's two players freezer, one player laundry. Biologic is repeatedly gassing out laundry, isolating that one player. You said Wichita Wolves Academy look reluctant to push in, and that was why. Your push cannot just be those two guys freezer because then you're stranding PKers in laundry. So not only were the smokes perfectly placed and perfectly timed, but towards the end there, when you're sub 15 seconds at Wichita Wolves, they have to just barrel in. Forrest, with the Ella shotgun, downs one, gets traded. But all the meanwhile, Bio is still holding on to laundry with the shotgun. He downs the thermite. And it was so close. Skunky almost found just enough damage. But in getting that earlier kill on Forrest, Ran out of ammo shooting at Bio. And that was the last piece of the puzzle that won West Garfield that round. This should be 4-3 right now, but nope. Forrest and Bio, they clutched up hard. And now Wichita Wolves Academy once again suffer a deficit. It's the same thing we saw in Villa when Wichita Wolves Academy were on the attack. They struggled to close out rounds that look like they should win. This theme, it cannot continue here on Oregon. They've got more than enough difficulty. They've got more than enough work to do in terms of winning these rounds is if they're not working against their own efforts constantly. That is what we need to see from them. They have to just hide it up. Stop losing rounds when it looks like you have already won it or you are winning it. And they've got to make that adjustment as soon as possible. We can see them trying to get this roam clear going. They're trying to at least pinpoint where a couple of these defenders are positioned. You've got Psychosis, the top of main stairs. You've got Rudy sitting over in Kitchen. And I believe you've got Barring as well, the top of Freezer stairs, to support the Mute sitting in security. Nobody is actually going to be clearing them out, though, right now. Big Guy is downstairs as the Nomad. Deployed two of those air jabs at this point, hoping to just lock off any rotations and any flank, not hoping to actively challenge it. A strategy that may actually benefit Wichita Wolves Academy in the long run here because we know how much oh. Wes Garfield like to flank. Regardless, Psychosis in is on one. He's going to go for the move, and Chosen has no idea. There's a Nomad in the board. There's a drone behind him, and Psychosis gets another flank away for free. He's yet to be traded. Two more players still on this roam. Wichita Wolves Academy are once again struggling. I don't know if, like, do they, when they shoot those air jabs, do they just, like, crumble to dust as soon as they're shot? Because they have not had any effect on any flanks whatsoever from West Garfield so far. So, Chosen will suffer the opening death. At least the wall is going to get opened, but because of that second Electro Claw, it's not all the way. Skunky's going to land a nice headshot on the barring, though, to even up the man count. Psychosis still looking for more, swinging on to Trophy, getting aggressive. There's only 35 seconds left, and Wichita Wolves Academy now stare down the gas grenades on the breach from Biologic, who's throwing them from all the way over in kids. Big guy's hitting the crouch walk, though. Kind of chasing down Rudy, who has since escaped and is looking to maybe flank up main once again. His teammate did it once. Why can't he do it again? Skunky goes down. Big guy refrags onto Forrest over towards White. Rudy hitting the flank. Finally hits an air jab. There it is. But Bio gets the trade. So there's no man advantage for this attack. And as he goes down on White, it's all at the PKers. And he's looking the wrong way. Psychosis gets, I believe, at least three kills in that round. And it's a 5v3 lead now for West Garfield. They're killing me, Harrison. Wichita Wolves, I mean, good lord. I can't, I mean, we're the, the, the problems the problems they're having, it's no different from a villa. It's the exact same. You're going to get flanked. You got to figure out a way to stop the flanks. You got to figure out a way to use those air jabs better. I don't know, first of all, how big guy didn't hear Rudy sprinting up behind him either. He needed an air jab to detonate, to take him down. But hey, an air jab worked for at least one kill. But the round started off in a troubling spot for them. They let themselves be flanked Attack from main stairs. Where there is a main lobby double door that you open at the very beginning of a round and you place an air jab down right away. Then you have someone sitting in garage. Big guy was sitting in garage, had opened up main lobby, and yet Psychosis was able to just flirt between the two jump from main stairs on the basement, work his way up towards Arsenal and towards that flank. And, and I mean, good Lord, it worked perfectly for him.
he was able to make an impact later in the round as well. 10 kills so far for Psychosis and Wichita Wolves Academy need to find a way to get these defenders under wraps. They've got to find a way to keep them constricted on the site. Otherwise, there is, it's, there's very little possibility that this gets any easier for them. <sighs> Two more rounds for West Garfield, and they will eliminate Wichita Wolves. They're going to try and start it off on meeting, a site that Wichita Wolves Academy did not touch for all of their defense. They opted for, uh, what was it? They opted for dining instead and lost it. They're already quick in the showers hall. Big guy already peeking into kitchen. This is looking like a mainly horizontal push here from the attack as they've established very early coverage here. And, well, Biologic's the only man on site. The attack reads into this. They could have a relatively easy execute and plant down, but of course, it's still got to worry about that coverage from above. Big guy's going to try and nomad off white stairs. We'll see if that air jab does anything. Chosen setting up a drone on top white. Force taking a little bit of early damage. It looks like Trev Mac and Skunky are the two attackers tasked with at least distracting this defense, but no, PKers is up there as well with the case. So despite there only being one man on the site, the attacks still want to full clear these roamers as hard as they can. Dangerous as well. Like you said, if you're bringing the case with you on that journey, a perilous journey to say the least, it will be though Trev Mac and Chosen at least at the helm of this clear. That is the smart decision and Rudy is not looking the right way, nor is Barring. He'll land a bullet or two, but not whipping around in time to actually finish off the Zofia. Another kill found, not this time though for Trev Mac as Psychosis. Another player on this top floor tries to make his impact. Now he's going to be looking for another, the Thermite. PK sitting around the corner, that's Diffuser dropped in the middle of Master, and you've got two defenders sitting very close to, to cover that and to stare at that case for the remainder of the round. Bio is alone downstairs, but that doesn't matter anymore because the Diffuser has been dropped on the Rome Clear as a textbook of an error as you could ever find now Wichita Wolves Academy is going to be forced to rotate. Now everyone on this team is going to have to pivot to this top floor. All the while, Wes Garfield are setting up to hold this case. Psychosis gets one, goes one for one with Chosen, and gets the immediate trade. It's still a 2v2, though. And both of these defenders are on the case. And Forrest... He's got floor holes looking right towards where that diffuser is. Bio, though, coming up main stairs for the assist will land one, leaving big guy alone and on very, very little HP. Forrest, though, he's going to back off. He knows at this point there is Attack. no reason why he should still be covering this diffuser. He does not want to throw his life away. Instead, he'll play safe on site with Bio and force big guy to come to them with that case to get the plant down with 13 seconds remaining. This nomad's just going to drop the hatch to his death. And West Garfield take round number nine. The roam clear from Trevmac. Brilliant early two picks, but what do we see again, Jonah? What turns the round into West Garfield's favor? Psychosis on the frickin' flank because Nomad is busy with the horizontal clear instead of preventing his roam clearers from getting flanked. Psychosis goes upstairs, gets two kills, and sure, Wichita Wolves Academy have now gained the majority of the top floor and the area of the top floor directly above the site, but none of that control matters when the case is fully in the hands of the defense. They even rotate more defenders up to cover it, and it works perfectly. Psychosis gets his third trading with Chosen. Bio gets one of those two attackers trying to retake because they're so distracted by Forest in Armory. And Wichita Wolves Academy, it seems like they just can't do anything right. No. Attackers need to I don't know what it is. Defuse. And now I guess uh, they're attacking Basement and their last Bastion of Hope is going to be on a Blitz take their elbow. Obviously, some shenanigans coming up in this round to pay attention to. But again, one more comment about the last round, Harrison. Just imagine imagine what the difference could have been if you had switched the role of big guy and PK, right? Take your Thermite off the roam clear. Good God, do not put the Thermite on the roam clear, please. And put the Nomad up there instead. Because they had taken all the control they needed to establish all the air jabs they could have needed. They had trophy control, master control. They had dealt with the top floor players beautifully. It was as textbook of a roam clear as you're going to get. But because Big Guy was not with them, there were no air jabs on the flank. Instead, you have your thermite on your roam clear. And 
the two of these errors compounding dropped the diffuser in the sight of two defenders then a third one rotated to go and assist it is mind-blowing that we actually saw that occur it seemed that like every little mistake just added up and just gifted west garfield the round enough of that though moving on to this one moving on to see how wichita wolves academy can finally bounce back big guy is looking to roam clear he's looking to deal with this player sitting in shower psychosis now has been flashed and a couple more flashes are going to come his way but big guy manages to flash himself what a way to end his life in this round as psychosis will happily claim that one shut down big guy for what appears to be the remainder of the series if wichita wolves cannot pull out a miracle now they're gonna have to pin down these roamers they're gonna have to find forest and find psychosis then they're gonna have to get their blitz in the building in the midst of a crossfire and somehow get him in the basement yeah if wichita wolves end up losing this round i'm sure big guy will be kicking himself for that poor flash and like you said the Blitz is for a fast take through Elbow, but they've got to clear this roam first, and Psychosis is nasty. Two kills now on the roam, shutting down Skunky, and Chosen oh. loses his fight to Barring, and they can't even touch the site. The roam clear has gone completely awry. Now it's just the Blitz and the Thermite, not the two operators you probably want in this clutch scenario. They're going to try and hunt down Barring, but Travmac takes no. so much damage just on the first engagement, all to his feet. Now below 50, I don't know, about 25 health on that Blitz. He is near usefulness. A lot of this is going to be riding on the shoulders of PKers. And as the Blitz hits the Malusi, or sorry, not the Malusi, the Ella mine on that staircase, he's going to be fully exposed. Psychosis, he's going to get dropped by PKers firing at the Blitz. That's a good kill for the Thermite. He'll leave a drone upstairs to watch flank as well. Finally, on round 10, which at all those Academy are going to have some sort of flank watch, but... They've got to push both through Freezer against quite the crossfire. Rudy covering the long angle with the DMR. He lets the Blitz slip past him just a bit. He'll fire one shot over towards Freezer. Trevmac now stopped by this Aruni gate. He'll burn it with the smoke, but again, there's going to be two guns staring at him. Forest and Bio holding onto the main hallway, and you're not going to get through both of these shotguns. Rudy takes a little bit of damage, exposing himself to Freezer, but this gas grenade is going to halt Trevmac in his tracks. <laughs> Excuse me. And that smoke grenade meant to cut off the cross? Well, it's going to be useless now because of that smoke canister. Forrest with the shotgun shuts down one. Trevmac is now one HP thanks to it. And Forrest looking to finish off the round will end it. Double kill for the FO12. West Garfield take the map 7-3, losing only five rounds across two maps. A dominant victory. Not even a doubt that West Garfield were the better team tonight dominating Wichita Wolves Academy. Like you said, Harrison, only five rounds Wichita Wolves Academy were able to secure. West Garfield, very clean performance on the defense of Oregon. Once they got that third round, it kind of felt like we were in for a troubling one for uh, Wichita Wolves because after the momentum slipped out of their fingers and after West Garfield secured the attacking half that they need, essentially winning the attacking half, they moved on to defense with all the confidence in the world and mistake after mistake from Wichita Wolves Academy kept giving West Garfield the edge. And West Garfield, props to them, knew exactly what Wichita Wolves Academy were struggling with and exploited that to perfection. They knew they could not get a hand, a handle on those roamers. They could not get a handle on those flankers. So West Garfield threw as many flanks and as many roamers as they could possibly at the attack. It worked perfectly, and there's no surprise why the victory was this strong. Yeah, West Garfield just knew that they could do no wrong on the flank. They just kept flanking and flanking and flanking and flanking, and Wichita Wolves were unable to stop them. I mean, how many times was Psychosis alone able to get a flank off in this series? I mean, we saw what? Barring with, uh, I think, 16 on map one, Psychosis ending with 15 on map two. Wichita Wolves Academy, I they, they didn't look good. I'm not gonna lie. We chose this game. Because West Garfield came second in the standalone tournament, and Wichita Wolves Academy in the past have been quite the formidable team, but it seems like uh, the past is something we're going to have to let go of because they do not look nearly as good as they once did. And West Garfield look incredibly strong. I mean, as this team continues to play together, it is, you know, a plug stack that formed for our standalone tournament just a couple of days ago. They made it all the way to the finals. They weren't able to close it out and claim that Pro-Am spot. Instead, that went to Juicers, but 
West Garfield are here and, and they want it. I mean, they're here in these quals. They are one game away now, one best of three of making it into our second stage of SCS 6. And they really do want that Pro-Am spot. Of course, mm -hmm. it's a long way from that. And they still have one more game just to get through in these closed qualifiers. And we've got a lot of other games to bring you, hopefully, or at least to talk about with you today. Before we do that, though, another wonderful shout out to our sponsor, Mike and Ike. We've talked about them before. Harrison, you talked about the new flavors that they're bringing out. Mike and Ike Sour. Personally, I was not a big fan of the original Mike and Ike back in the day, but when they brought out the Sours, I mean, I just got addicted. I'm a big sour candy guy, and that is exactly why I love to go for these Sours. You can take your candy game to the next level as well. You can grab yourself a pike, a pack of Mike and Ike original fruits, Mike and Ike Mega Mix, Mike and Ike Sours. They're delicious, fruity, chewy flavors. It can help fuel your game and power you up to keep playing at your best. Harrison, I know that Wes Garfield played at their best here this afternoon, this evening. I suspect they're going to play up their best in their next game here. We've got coming up in just a few moments. Um, any other words before we send this one off? No, just that uh, congratulations to West Garfield for actually being our first team in the next round. They are the quickest victors so far in our playoffs. But like you said, we're trying to see if we can maybe snag a map three of any of the ongoing, uh, ongoing games. But stay tuned. We'll either have a map three or just our next game, depending on what finishes faster. So don't go anywhere. We'll be back with some other match right after this. B3, make that a 1v2. Two seconds left. It's going to come down. Faber making a third as he looks up. Faker, he finds the draw three. He's stunning here.
two seconds left. It's gonna come down. Faber making it a third as he looks up. Faber he finds the draw three. Stunning here from the Hello everyone. Sorry for the wait. We were just waiting on some games to finish, but we are jumping into the first one we have available to us, and it's once again West Gar Garfield Park, only this time they will be up against Eclectic, who actually qualified for Stage 1 in the very first qualifier. Yeah, we've got one of our uh, SES teams that we played played in Stage 1, and they're going to be going up against West Garfield, who we just saw one series ago take down Wichita Wolves Academy. West Garfield have been looking good. They worked their way all the way to the grand finals of our standalone tournament just a few days ago, walking home with, you know, a couple thousand bucks. Not nothing too crazy, but definitely, definitely something worth writing home about. And they are a team composed of some incredible players. As you know, it is Rudy, Psychosis, Forest, Barring and Bio, these are names that have played a ton of PL, a ton of CL, a ton of experience on this team. And on the eclectic side of things, you've got a roster with considerably less experience. It is Z, Goons, Semi, Duke, and MX Reaper. All of these guys, again, they. this is a team that played in SES Stage 1, but this is a team that still has a lot of work to do because they are going up against a team with more experience than almost every other team in the qualifier right now and all they've got to do is win this one to make it yeah as far as i know as well stage one of scs was eclectic's first ever league so it's even more impressive that they came in during the first qualifier of course if you don't remember the roster from last stage the only difference is instead of haiku they have mx reaper who previously competed with in control not the current in control with jj previous in control with TAC, MX Reaper, Dunny, Serve, and them. As we see our maps, Cafe, Oregon, Clubhouse, more qualifier specials, woo! Because these teams uh, hate having fun, but at least we don't start with Oregon, at least we get Cafe up first. Uh, Eclectic's map pool, probably significantly, uh, significantly lower than most other teams. Again, like you highlighted because of that experience factor, they're still a relatively new team, but they were, uh, they did look good on the maps they did play in stage one. They even took one shot fairly close and we know how good of a team they are. They're in the six invitational closed qualifier and came second in our previous stage. But the bands are gonna start rolling in, of course, West Garfield Park with the first as they are on the defense and they'll actually take Sledge off the board. Interesting. So Cafe is a map that does have a lot of vertical destruction, especially on that kitchen site. Sledge is a very important factor, but he will not be involved here. We may have to see the buck favored instead in this use of the skeleton key a little bit more prominent. The Thatcher will be taken off the board second. Now this one, unlike the first, is a very common ban. The Sledge, unusual. Those frag grenades, important, and they will not be here. But those EMP grenades from Thatcher will not be a factor either. Now, on the defensive like side, that, we are going to continue with our theme of unique bands and see the castle taken off the board. This is another unique one. Yeah, and I'm. that's probably a direct response to the Sledge ban that makes castle, that forces you to use your ranged soft breach on those castle barricades. So they just say, you know what? No more castle at all. No more window coverage with the castle. No more cigar holds either, Jonah. That means cigar is pretty much off the table for the defense without those castle barricades. Perhaps roaming upstairs might be a little bit more difficult as well, but either way, castle is a mainstay on this map, as is the sledge, and we're not going to be seeing either of them. Now, of course, banning the sledge and the castle also has some more ramifications in this game. That leaves up operators like the Maverick, like every single other hard breacher on Cafe, and leaves up the Mira, who is oh so powerful on Cafe. Mira is pretty damn good on every map, but Cafe is definitely one of her specialties, and West Garfield are going to be running her immediately for their very first defense here on Cafe on the top floor. Normally, a lot of times you'll see your mirror window placed on um, on the cocktail wall, facing into bar. Sometimes you'll see one on that freezer wall, on the back freezer wall, facing into piano with the wall open. Sometimes you even see one inside a bathroom where Biologic is placing one right now. So there's some variations of the mirror setups that you can use, but it seems like we'll have a pretty default one here from Bio with the, a lot of the defense being staked here in bathroom. 
Right, that mirror window in bathroom is tough to use well, and the reason is because there is a window on that white hall that all someone has to do is repel up this side of the map, pop that window, and you can have a hell of a lot of bullets and a couple of nades falling right at the feet of the person who's usually playing on that mirror window. And that is, a, in addition, that is why we're going to see, likely from the defense, a good bit of protection on that window often. We will see somebody run all the way downstairs towards the garage, that freezer hallway, and maybe just apply a little bit of pressure towards that doorway that faces that window in order to make sure the attacking team cannot get comfortable taking that position very early. Still not something easy to do for the defense. Always risky to go all the way to that bottom floor and contest that position. Rudy will go down one floor. He'll chill in dining for now, but he will not drop all the way to the first floor just yet to do that strat I talked about. Instead, he's going to focus on denying any second floor entries. And Eclectic, they haven't rotated over towards that repel either. Right now, they're going to begin a standard approach, working their way in from these stage windows, from the ticket bar window, clearing out this utility as they go. And we have another update as well on the bracket. So not only do we have this game competing for the spot in SES, we also have the Aerial Arise Pug Stack along with Noob Slayers, who, if you don't know, is the team with Stove and uh, and Pengu on it. And already, we're going to have a better flank watch than we saw from Wichita Wolves against West Garfield as Psychosis will hit an air jab, get knocked on his ass, and Z picks up the first frag of the series. Well done on a quite the powerful player, your Malusi off the board, but in terms of utility, that's not too worrying for West Garfield. They still have plenty of C4s. They've got two in their pocket, and of course, Malusi's Banshees are already set down on the field, and his force pushes up through the rotate. He'll take the head off of Goons, the Maverick now dead if he had hadn't used his nades, they will die with him. And now you've lost a little bit of coverage in Cigar. Barring as well, getting aggressive, lands the headshot on the MX Reaper. And look at this. He's got two attackers on the roof, despite people taking in a Cigar. That slowness is going to keep punishing the attack as Z is the next to go down, leaving Semi and Duke in a 2v4. I was going to say that West Garfield are going to have to tidy things up because they're coming up against a much more disciplined opponent than Wichita Wolves Academy, but it seems that I stand corrected for now. Despite a good flank watch and a good early kill, Eclectic will lose two players to nothing but simple aggression and gun skill from the Bandit, barring taking two fights, winning two fights, and on very low HP because of that. Doesn't really matter for him, though, because his team now has a two-man advantage. It's Semi and Duke. The last two players left alive for Eclectic, and not necessarily the two players you want. It only is the Habana with, yes, a little bit of hard destruction, but nothing else in the way of soft destruction. Duke's just going to have to find some frags, but that is not going to happen in this round. West Garfield will line up those two players in just a matter of a second taking those two kills and taking the opening round on Cafe. Yeah, big uh, big problem in that attack was, um, I guess I'll say, the unwillingness for the rest of Eclectic to actually enter the building. You saw two players taking in through Cigar, a kill to their favor, and they still had one on Repel and two people on the roof. Two on the roof with Cigar control. That is not how you need to push your attack, because then those two players die from Forrest pushing up to B1 and barring just simply swinging on the doorway. There was no one covering on Skylight, again, despite there being two people on the roof, and one even died on the hatch as Barring continued to press the issue. So Eclectic, we know them to be a pretty damn fast team. Hopefully we don't see them that sluggish in the future rounds. We're going to be on the fireplace and mining. Mining and dining. Definitely the least played site on this map. A lot of people consider it to be unequivocally the off-site and uh well i have to agree with them west garfield are gonna be bringing both the t5s in the legion and the oryx two not often played operators but forest can help slow down that top floor clear and psychosis of course will now be afforded that extra rotatability and maneuverability of the oryx i gotta admit it is a little bit surprising to see this site come out, not just because it is an off-site, but because, again, thinking back to our bands, the fact that the sledge is not a factor, and the fact that it appears Eclectic is reluctant to run the to, to, to run the buck, a perfect replacement to the sledge, it seems that Kitchen would be a much stronger bomb site than normal because of the limit on soft destruction from above. I would argue that maybe going to Kitchen would be the best site on this map yeah. now instead of bar and cocktail. But especially, don't even charges. Right, and especially instead of mining, right? There's no breaching charges. The only soft destruction they have 
is frag grenades. They have six of those, and that's something, but you can't really use frag grenades to open up vertical holes from above, at least reliably. It doesn't really matter, though, for them. Eclectic are off to another good start. Barring is already shut down. I hope he was able to put down those ADSs before he perished. I suspect he was able to, given that we are already 40 seconds into the round, but a good pick to start things off for Eclectic yet again. Now, they were not able to turn that opening pick into a round win in the previous round, but we'll see if they can do better here. They'll spot out Psychosis, and the Oryx will dash away, so no one for Duke to wait for there. They've already gotten that opening pick, like you said, onto Barring, which perhaps will make this top floor clear a little bit easier, but they gotta face down this mirror window, but Rudy's just peeking in front of it. Semi goes down, that's your Thermite dead. At least there's a trade on to Forest, and you still got your Maverick, but still, that's Exothermic Charges out of the pocket for EQ. The Oryx, once again, peeking Pixel, but dashing away, as now it looks like MX Reaper wants to get aggressive, peek over towards Long Bar, but he'll wait for his teammates, wait for any call from Info, because, again, this mirror window that Psychosis is playing behind is quite powerful. It looks like Eclectic don't want to deal with it, though. The beauty of a mining and dining attack is that you don't actually need to take Cocktail and Bar Control. You simply need to hold the defenders from retaking the rest of the top floor from there. Once again, there is a mirror window, it's on the site this time. They're staring down Biologic, and they don't really have a lot to deal with it, but MX Reaper will get another kill on the Psychosis. Rudy will move in to try and support this Mira, but he's fighting against the window and is caught off guard by Z. Now it's just Bio. He'll peek out from the Mira window, look to catch the head of Goons, but he whiffs the shot, and now the attackers know exactly where he is. They're barreling down on his position. The C4 will blow up Z, but Bio can't do much past that, cursing the low ammo counter the Vector as MX Reaper gets three kills, and it's now 1-1. Yeah, if you're wondering why we can't hear people shoot, it's because we got a bit of a mute bug, a classic bug in the game. Woo! But uh, we do have a, a round one for Eclectic, and that was a good one at that. Wes Garfield, they tried to recover that round by just adding more aggression into the mix. You saw it in the mid-round, how Rudy tried to retake into the mining hall where two players were staring at him, mind you. Someone on the window and someone on the red stairs. Not the wisest of decisions, and especially not a wise decision against an Eclectic team, which has proven to us between the first round and the second, that they are a lot more aware of their flanks, they're aware of their positioning, and aware of maybe some of their weak spots than Wes Garfield's previous opponents were. And that's an adjustment that Wes Garfield are going to have to make on the fly. Because here so far in the closed quals, uh, their experience tells them, okay, in this, in this qualifier, that team, they couldn't deal with flanks. Let's keep flanking because that is a recipe for success. I suspect that they may try it again here and there, but as we get further into this map and into this series, we are going to see very little of those Hail Mary type aggressive type flanks because as Eclectic have proven, it does not work as well against them. Aggression, if used well, can work against them. We saw it from barring in that first round, maybe when Eclectic Second are still left. getting warm, still getting loose. But in round two, all that aggression was promptly shut down. Seconds left. Uh, unfortunately, we still have our mute bug. <clears throat> Hopefully we can get rid of it. A lot of times what will solve the mute bug is spectating a drone as it gets shot, but uh, Eclectic have lost two drones, and uh, they'll lose a body as well. Forest, spawn peaks MX Reaper, and down goes your Finko. Where the hell did he get that kill from? I think he... Yeah, he just punched a hole in the garage wall. MX Reaper clearly did not see it, and he'll lose his life because of it. Early 4v5, you talked about the aggression working against Eclectic. It worked in round one, didn't work in round two, but it will net Forrest a kill in round three. And that's quite an important operator. Finca is uh, a confidence booster. She's got heals, she's got nades in a gone six. And of course, MX Reaper got a 3k with her in the last round. Yeah, especially the opening pick as well, starting things off very strongly for Eclectic, but this time, of course, that opening pick going the other way, and MX Reaper on the losing end. Goons will try to get things going, though, in response, and Nate working its way from the Heaven Window straight towards Forrest, who will, I mean, be protected by an ADS initially, and then he'll go for an aggressive swing onto the Window player, only to get tagged by the Nade and back off a bit of pressure coming in from uh, eclectic now Yay. as we can hear again finally a bit of pressure coming from them over directly into mining once again as this is again the, uh, an unusual bomb site for west garfield to go to but this time it is working for them another kill found for the defense that one taking down the nomad of duke barring credited with that kill now credited with another as he finds a double kill on the round taking down goons on the white stairs rappel yeah goons just kind of hanging out right in the middle of it exposing himself quite a bit. 
to the Jaeger. That leaves Semi and Z in a 2v5 on mining and dining with no semblance of top floor control at all. Now, there's no mirror window that they have to contest with on the site, but... It's still a 90 degree angle that Bio can hold on these windows. And there's Semi going down. Z gets the refrag onto Rudy, but he'll need an ace if he wants to win out. He'll spot Bio. Easy kill for the Iana, but he's getting lit up on his backside as Psychosis descends the red stairs. And now it's an advantage for West Garfield Park 2 to 1. An extremely bold decision to go back to one of the least favorable, the least favorable bombsite on this map and do it twice. But uh, they won it. So good adjustments from them, not losing their life in the opening pick, instead actually getting that opening pick onto the Finca, shutting down that piece of aggression, that piece of extremely valuable utility that we're eclectic, we're hoping to leverage into that execute, but we're unable to do so, again, because of that early death. But if I'm Wes Garfield right now, I am keeping an eye on the lineup of this eclectic attack, assessing how little soft destruction there is and trying to structure my defense around that. Despite that, though, we're going back upstairs to Barn Cocktail. I get that they won this bomb site before, but if there's a bomb site that depends very little on the ability of the attacking team to break open floors and break open walls, it's this one. There isn't a ton of soft destruction, let alone hard destruction, that attacking teams often do on this bomb site, whereas the basement site of, or the first floor site of Kitchen has a ton of hard breach needed and a ton of soft destruction needed. It is still peculiar to see West Garfield go for this top floor and this mining strategy, but I mean, I guess it's working for them right now. They are still up two to one. Maybe going for these surprising picks is not only catching us off guard, maybe it's catching Eclectic off guard too. Hmm, it's strange too, Eclectic normally being quite a fast team getting caught off guard by such aggression and uh, the off-site picks. But uh, Forrest is once again spawn peeking. Are Eclectic going to spot it out? They are, judging by the silhouettes, not looking in the right way just yet. Forrest is, of course, peeking out Small Bake. They did see the break in the barricade, and Z will sneak past it. So, no engagement from Forrest here, but he might catch the Thermite. Was that just not communicated? They just didn't. Z just, yeah. Z just didn't say anything? I now think they, they knew it was thermite. open. They knew it was open, but because he wasn't swung on it, they're like, oh, it was just a fake or something like that. Maybe. Either way, I mean, if you see an open barricade, Siege 101, you look at it. You got to make sure that's case. That's all the way down. A collector are going to have to spend like 40 seconds rappelling down the building and rappelling back up just to grab it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not ideal. I mean, you, you can do a lot of other things at the same time. You can apply some pressure from above and you can make sure to be... You know, make sure West Garfield can't run downstairs again and try to actually get eyes on that diffuser, get eyes on the player recovering that diffuser. And I think they will be uh, lucky that nobody is actually actively contesting that. Duke was able to run down and grab it. And for your Nomad to be doing that is not a huge deal either. It does mean you're a little bit more vulnerable to flanks and a little bit more vulnerable to a rat play like we're seeing from barring thrown behind the stage half wall. And, you know, potentially could be... Uh, enabling this flank, this flank game to continue. And here comes Barring. He'll step up, he'll get one, he'll get two. Z will eventually shut him down, but not before losing most of his HP. And here's Psychosis as well. The aggression from Wes Garfield unparalleled right now. It is all up to Duke, the person who took the time to recover the diffuser in a one versus four. And he won't even win against Psychosis. So. That round, your Thermite gets spawn peaked. Already not off to a great start. That is, for the most part, your only hard breacher. You do not open red wall. There is no clear on the piano. Windows are really into piano at all. Eclectic think they can take Cigar for free, and what happens? They haven't drone Barring. Barring gets a free double kill. Sure, Z refrags, but then you have Psychosis pushing out from Bathroom and Pixel to land the trade on his teammate, which he does so twice fold. So, uh... Rough start for Eclectic. Other than the one successful round they have on Mining and Dining, they have not looked great. They'll now have to attack onto Reading. So here's another site that kind of works into that Sledge Ban. Significantly less vertical play from uh, Eclectic available to them. I guess maybe they can use, like, Flores drones 
if they really want to. I think the Nomad had breaching charges last round, so they can use some of those to establish vertical presence. But the point is, it's not going to be as efficient and it's not going to cover nearly the same amount as if you had a Sledge who's banned or if you had a Buck to replace him. Not quite sure why Eclectic aren't running the buck because he still has burn. So, I mean, it's not like he's completely useless, but I guess they just value people like the Finca, who's got the boost and the frags, the Nomad, who's got that flank watch, etc. And of course, they know how many shields are going to be placed upstairs, which is why they're bringing that Flores. Right, a core component of any reading room defense is a strong cocktail and top floor hold with several deployable shields. That is what those Rotero drones are for, an efficient clear of those shields of those power positions because those drones they work their way around any projectile denial utility you could put down so they work away they work their way around those ads's that forest is likely going to put down on that top floor as the jaeger and they don't get uh, burned by a surya gate if you drive underneath it and well my magnet doesn't touch it either we are going to see Attackers an interesting pick from the defense though bomb. the presence of a cap can from psychosis keeping things spicy we're going to see the mozzie and the alibi as well three operators who are you know, pretty weak in terms of their primary utility, in terms of their actual gadget they bring to the table, in terms of that, you know, entry denial devices, the uh, one that Capcan brings, the alibi holograms that Barring brings, and those Mozzie pests, they only, they're, you know, mid-tier gadgets, but all of these players, I mean, especially Barring and Rudy, they've got some impressive weapons to use. Rudy bringing out the Roni, Barring likely bringing out the MX4 Storm, and given the aggression we've seen from, from them so far, I mean, two perfect weapons to assist them in that aggressive playstyle. I imagine the Rome will be something fierce on this top floor. They have people extended all the way into Piano. Looks like barring with the uh, alibi, I believe. Forrest is also doing something that I love to do in like casual and unranked, and that is simply prone in garage and wait for someone to repel on the uh, south side of the building and you get a freebie. And that could perhaps be MX Reaper looking at Forrest through the wall, but you'll instead repel safely up and Forrest has since backed off over to place ADSs. Meanwhile, top-down clear is starting to ensue from Eclectic, from the Maverick, while Duke and his teammate seem like they want to go horizontal, establish very quick mining and train presence and lord over kind of uh, 90 hall and shallow pillar. They'll see the Capcan traps, so they won't be caught off guard by the double Capcan and killed easily. Meanwhile, Duke is going to start droning over towards Cigar and Barring is here on Pixel. He'll likely be the first point of contention for this attack. Yeah, Z gonna join his teammate now in that endeavor of clearing out Piano. They've spotted out the one player who's gonna be a real nuisance there. I don't believe there's anyone else lurking behind stage as there was in previous rounds, but I mean, the alibi barring is stepping up Ooh. and looking for a fight. Duke is gonna be the wiser and he'll take him down. Good awareness there from Duke, seeing that alibi swing, seeing Barring just kind of get up in his face and take that fight. Got to be careful, though, because someone else from West Garfield, as we've seen, could follow that up with another swing of their own. But the only thing that's going to follow is a Nitro Cell from below. Going to be wasted as Psychosis finds no damage with that, but Bio steps up in a big way, and he's going to be joined by his teammate in an effort to line up a double kill, and they will do it. Forrest, good support, takes down Goons. Psychosis will also find one off screen, but two kills found their way back, Semi and Z, very important kills at the right time. Because the last two players left alive are now Bio and Forrest, who Eclectic should know were upstairs until a moment ago. And they should know that Bio is very lit up. He took a lot of damage in that fight. So he is a bullet, a bullet or two away from his death. So Forrest is going to have to be a very important factor in the remainder of this round. It seemed like all of West Garfield were looking to retake that area of the top floor at the same time. And while sure, the cigar players or the people pushing cigar were successful, it was that flank watch on red from Semi and Z to really keep the round within Eclectic's grasp. Now it's a two on two. The most wow, dangerous prospect here being the fact that Bio still retains control of the top floor. He's still got these floor holes, and it looks like that might be what prompts Eclectic to move to over go. towards the dining side of things. But now, the most dangerous thing is Forrest holding this 90 degree angle, but Z will get a kill onto Bio. He finishes off the low HP mute. Forrest, they know exactly where he is, but the bomb's not going down from Semi. Finally, it'll go through, and Z has the cover. A 3k from the Iana. Eclectic somehow still manage the round, and tie us up, or sorry, not tie us up once again, but keep us within one round.
Yeah, 2v4 to a quick 2v2 as those were brilliant trades found by Zian Semi in the end. And a great adjustment there to keep things in their reach. Now, Cafe is typically a map that, you know, used to be more defensive sided, but now we see it more often than not go to that 3 to 3 split. But whether it's 2 to 4, 3 to 3, I think Eclectic have kind of done the job they need to. This is, I would argue, the bands, especially the sledge taken off the board, probably lends itself to making this more of a defensive sided map than usual. So if Eclectic can get this third round, I mean, on top of the two they've already secured, I think that is more than a job well done. I think they have definitely won the half, even though only slightly. It's not a great margin either way. Uh, because then you send, obviously, West Garfield into the tougher side of things. They go out on the attack, and they're going to have to continue to put up numbers as well. And you never know. Eclectic could bring out some more aggression and do a good job in catching West Garfield off guard two so we'll see still one more round to go and eclectic will have to approach a bomb site that they have you know they've won it once and they've lost it once west garfield avoiding the kitchen site like the plague don't even want to touch that first floor the only thing they want to do on that first floor is spawn peak and i expect to see honestly some more of that from them as well it's been a consistent aspect of this defense has been spawn peaking has been early aggression and it's got them a lot of opening picks yeah west garfield i mean We've seen Forrest spawn peak quite a bit, and I don't believe he's been punished for it just yet. He's got at least two kills off of it as well, and he's once again going to be at the bottom of Garage, peeking out that barricade, looking for anyone repelling up the building as MX Reaper pre-fires over towards his position, but avoids the lesion once again. So, and Forrest gets aggressive, but it does not actually net him anything. Unless... MX Reaper drops, but I doubt that. He's just watching the fireplace for now. West Garfield are playing mining for the third time. This time they got this mirror window on site once again. Hopefully Eclectic know what they're walking into. West Garfield, as soon as they started to get a lot more aggressive, Eclectic were caught off guard, but that's a great start. They'll take the mirror window out of Freezer, and now they've got a little bit more to work with on this top floor take. A yeah, really good use of the Twitch drone there by Goons. Good adjustment, first of all, to have the Twitch in play. But then sneaking that drone around through Cocktail, popping a mirror window that has been an extreme hindrance in getting this attack done efficiently. So, Barring is going to have to relocate and try to find a way to delay the time just the same. For now, he'll position himself in deep freezer, hoping that maybe he goes undroned and unnoticed. He's got support from Psychosis, who until a moment ago was challenging over on the pixel position in piano, and he is still in that position, despite being droned out pretty constantly here. So he'll have to be careful of his position, but the one thing he's got going for them is nobody from Eclectic is on any of those windows and actually repelling. Instead, they're in Cigar contesting this one horizontally. So he'll get naded out, but he'll swing. He's got some intel to work with. He's got a BP camera as well. So he's got a foothold on this top floor if he needs it, but he's got to be careful because Eclectic, they've done a good job Ooh. at getting these opening picks. Good shot on that C4 though. Get that out of the mix. Was that from Bio? From below? I, or is that... That has to have been. He's the only one that's expended the C4. That could have been an, a double kill for Bio as well, but it was denied by Z. Goons as well. Gets a kill on a Psychosis. Nearly nabs Forrest through the floor as well, but Barring nearly gets a 2k of his own, killing Z and lighting up Goons. And Forrest, unexpected from behind the couch, will capitalize on the low HP player. Barring will get his second onto MX Reaper. And what was a pretty decent top floor take from Eclectic has now completely spiraled out of control because of off-site players on the second floor, namely Forrest and Barring. Now it's a two versus four. Semi and Duke, the two support players, left to pick up the pieces. Biologic has since now established an aggressive position in mining. Rudy is in dining as well, the other site, playing around the doorway, around the fireplace rotate, and you still got two people in reading, stopping any early or any uh, late pillar control here from the attack. Duke is going to drone out. He sees one player through the impact hole. He'll capitalize on the barring, but the time is so low that that kill might not matter. Semi dropping the hatch with no help dies to Bio and Forrest still left unchecked and reading as the second player in that position gets the last kill. It's a 4-2 defensive half from West Garfield. Yeah, great start on their way to a potential map one victory as long as they keep up that momentum on the attacking half. But still, Six more rounds theoretically to be played, and overtime theoretically yet to be played because Eclectic, we've seen it from them, that they can make some on-the-fly adjustments. It's one of the things that was most impressive about them during that first split, is that despite being a younger team, a more inexperienced team with not a lot of league play, they came out and they played pretty mature for what 
we expected from them, right? They, uh, they did a good job of adjusting on the fly. We saw that from them after they took the timeout in this map as well. They took the timeout when they were down two rounds, they bounced back, and they took a round in response. That's exactly what we're going to have to see from them on this second half. Obviously, they no longer have that timeout that they probably want back, Attack but they located. do have the ability to adjust between each round. They'll kick things off on defense, starting out on this top floor. We're not going to see a mining right off the bat. We're not going to see a kitchen either. Instead, starting off just like Wes Garfield did on their half. I don't expect, though, to see from Eclectic the same play in terms of those unorthodox bomb sites. We do see mining occasionally. We might even see mining twice on a given cafe if a team wins it and wants to go back there. But I don't know if we have ever, Harrison, seen three minings on the same defensive half of cafe. I don't think we're going to see it from a click. Yeah, I have not, at least not in a very long time. And hey, West Garfield were successful two out of three of those times. So more power to him. Neglectic, like you said, I imagine a much more standard rotation of things. They'll start on bar cocktail. No Mira for them. There are a lot of teams that will shy away from playing the Mira, despite her being left up. Instead, they'll take all the shields. Echo, Frost, and Goyo. We've got four of them with Jaeger and Womai rounding out the lineup to make sure those shields are protected. And here at the Sledge Band coming into play, West Garfield pick up the buck to replace him. Something that Eclectic, well, not necessarily that Eclectic may have sorely missed because they didn't really get a lot of chance to do soft breaching in general. But if they had, they would have probably liked the buck. Psychosis early up white, already establishing a presence in the hallway. He's waiting for this frost. They have info on goons, but goons wow. still wins the fight. Wow. Good night, Psychosis. That's an opening pick for Eclectic that really looked like it was going to go the attacker's way. Yeah, the classic battle of swing or be swung. And, uh, well, Psychosis got swung on, and that's just how it is sometimes. He got absolutely slammed by goons. A very impressive shot. It seemed that Psychosis knew exactly where Goons was coming from, but Goons also knew exactly where Psychosis was positioned. So they went one for one in terms of intel, but Psychosis on the losing end of that engagement. But now, despite losing that first one, it does seem that West Garfield have pretty firm control of this second floor. And because they've got the buck and the skeleton key in play, this usually means that we're gonna see a lot of destruction now geared up towards Cocktail. Often, there will be several defenders sitting towards this position and Bio's job, we to be to flush them out and take them down. He'll be successful on the first. There goes Semi, that's your Echo to fall, but Goons will follow up with another kill onto Forest. The Frost going big so far, proving a key element of this top floor defense, denying any pressure from the white stairs or from below. Goyo will nearly catch barring as well, but now the defenders are fully aware of the Zofia pushing up white. But look at this, Goons has this shield to play with. There's no more presence on the white window, so there's nothing to take him off of this. Pixel has also not been taken by this attack, so Goons is perfectly safe to just sit here. Biologic now joining barring on this bottom white push, cooking a flash grenade. They'll start to push up, but Goons will catch them off guard, landing both of them. It's a quad kill for the Frost, and as he jumps out, nearly the ace but mx reaper will uh deny it why would you do that the frost was already out the window but nevertheless i'm sure eclectic or, uh goose does not care about that he's happy with his 4k huge play on the white stairs are all centraled around that position in the hallway and the shield and eclectic take their first defense good start from them on the defensive side a dominant start at that west garfield were pretty much put put in their place on that attack in every which way. I mean, obviously they started with that bottom clear unsuccessful, at least in that early pick, even though uh, the, the buck from below bio was able to get one. He was unable uh, to do much else. Uh, taking down semi was good, especially because that was the echo player, but because white stairs was being guarded beautifully, there was nothing else he could do because of it. But if you're sitting there in Twitch chat typing away and you think, you know what, maybe I can do better than some of the players out there, you still have an opportunity to not only play in our qualifiers, but to make SCS Stage 2 and make the Pro-Am. On January 14th and 16th, next weekend, we've got our second set of qualifiers and our final set of qualifiers for Stage 2 of play. You can do exclamation point play in chat to get some more info about that. We're going to be casting them here. We're going to be giving you a lot of hype. So if you want to come out and showcase your skills and get your chance at making that pro -am and at making SES split two, why don't you come out? If you didn't participate in the first qual, it is $50 
to sign up for that second qualifier money which you get back if you actually make it into the league so if you think you can do it why not give it a shot get a pug stack going just rattle up a couple of your friends and just get involved that is true i always forget about that you get your 50 dollars back if you qualify so what other incentive could you want Eclectic, now within striking distance of West Garfield after their first defense, but that was off a of 4K from Goons. Can Goons keep that up, or can the rest of Eclectic wake up and start taking more decisive team victories rather than just a solo play? Psychosis is going to Eon a clone right through reception. Pass Brownstairs, though. And not check MX Reaper's position. That is until MX Reaper shoots it. The Malusi looking to get actually aggressive. On this double door, now tucked in the corner. I'm not quite sure if Psychos is aware of that. And oh, the run out will net one kill, nearly the second. But barring is quick on the reaction. MX Reaper will go one for one. Still killing the Iana is a big utility. Yeah, and the aggression, I mean, it really felt like we were watching Psychosis there for a moment, but instead we were watching Psychosis die. I mean, the Malusi running out and playing aggressively, it's exactly what we've seen from Psychosis on the defensive side. And that's what Reaper is going to show us here and what's going to work or eclectic for now of course going one for one so keeping things even west garfield not losing out too badly in that trade but i do argue that that still does favor the defense losing your malusi who's already placed down her banshees for your yana who's got regenerating intel and some nades and some drones all of which are going to be shut down semi good angle there on the Sheesh. maverick holes using that to take the head of forest that is an angle that West Garfield were not expecting, and it will punish them. Still, this wall yet to be opened, but barring may be the saving grace West Garfield needed. He's crept his way all the way through Whiskey Bar. No eclectic defender actually over in Whiskey Bar or in VIP. That means he's able to get there for free and get a kill for free. Has not yet been traded out. There is a defender above to worry about. Barring's got to keep an eye on the Red Stairs flank, but he's still busy applying pressure to the site. Goons lurking around could get, get involved here. Oh, and he's going to catch Z because Goons is too slow. Semi on the shotgun, though. Holding prep gets one. Finally, the flank from Goons comes in, and Semi should land this kill if Bio walks through prep, but he's still in big bank. Wall shotgunned open. Semi holding the 90 degree angle and case under his control. Bio's gonna try and pop flash his way in. Semi is full blind. Goons is gonna need to come in to support here soon as the wall finishes getting open. Here he is. Well done by the last two members of Eclectic. It looked scary there as Barring was getting active. I believe landing three kills in the round for himself. But Goons came back to sight at the perfect time as the other player held on to prep. And there we go. There's the tie scoreline. We're at four to four. Yeah, really, it did come on to Goons there to make a play, and he did. It almost, it got a little bit away from him for a moment there. It seemed that Barring was going unchecked, pushing through the double door, but it seemed like Goons as a whole, when he did step up, it was almost as if he was invisible for the remainder of the round. I mean, he shot several times at the feet of Barring, but Barring was too focused on elsewhere, didn't have time to turn around, never even bothered checking if Goons was working that flank, so died because of it. And then Goons kind of just wide swung, Onto Bio, and just Bio couldn't quite see him. He, again, was too focused on checking the close angle. So well played from Goons, just trying to work with his team the best he could. If he had to bait his team a little bit there, it worked just fine because he came up from behind and he got the job done. So just like that, within two rounds, Harrison, we are all tied up. Eclectic have quickly taken that margin, have turned it to nothing. It's all tied up at four. They took a lot of shaky attacks and have turned them into... Uh, quite the admirable defenses. Honestly, they haven't really had a lot of holes here except for that last round where they had no one covering Whiskey. But again, you know, like we've touched on several times already, Goons came back at the perfect time. We also have a couple more updates from the bracket uh, concerning round one games. Achieve Esports taking down Whittle Kitties 2-0. Whittle Kitties, of course, previously being known as Okami. So our... Uh, one of two Challenger League teams in the playoffs has gone down, and Team Gusick taking down in control the Mount Olympus Pug Stack as well, 2-0. So, unfortunately, we won't be seeing either of those teams. Now it's Achieve Esports against Team Gusick to decide who goes to SCS. Chess Club versus Nocturnes, and we miss Benfield versus Shadow Realm, though. Not finishing just yet. But back to this game. Goons wanted to get aggressive on the Pillar's window, just like Forrest was on his defensive side. Will not net anything unfortunately and he will simply just run away back to his pre-planned position on this defense i should be looking to maybe push up red and catch someone on the hatch off guard that could be a distinct possibility 
He's got the red dot on the vector. His first victim could be Psychosis, but the Iana will skate away as the utility clear comes down into Cocktail looking to get rid of these shields. Yeah, heavy utility dump coming in, and that is a successful nade to deal with the Vulcan shield in the back of Cocktail. So that's one step done. Now, Psychosis, he dropped down, and Goons missed his opportunity, but he is still gone completely unnoticed and unchecked. He's going to wide swing, and Psychosis is none the wiser. That is two rounds in a row that surprise aggression has caught Psychosis, the aggressive player himself, off guard and have shut him down at the earliest point in the round possible. Now, unfortunate for him, he's not going to be involved in the remainder of the round. He's going to have to just sit on a flank cam, but those may be as important as ever because you've got several defenders eager to flank, roaming on this map, and they are hunting for some of these kills. The pressure from Skylight is still a factor here, but Eclectic have not been cleared out despite 90 seconds now passing by on the clock. Barring though, he'll pre-fire his way up long bar and he'll finally take down Reaper. That should be the final blue outline on the top floor. Yes, it is. Everyone has since dropped down, spread out on this second floor, but they are dropped down nonetheless. So West Garfield, even though it took them a good bit of time here, they have 60 seconds to go, still 60 seconds to work with in an even man count to build the site pressure. And 60 seconds to work with Vertical as the buck is still alive. The replacement for the sledge coming in full force. We'll see if Biologic can do an adequate job of flushing out these anchors and perhaps even finding some picks through the floor. But he's got to be careful of the C4 presence from Semi. He Reload. could certainly launch one up. We saw him kind of prepping to send one up before, but he's actually since backed off into the hallway. So not necessarily in the best position to Forrest also lingers on his white stairs, whether he knows it or not. Rudy's going to just start going for the plant, figuring they have adequate cover upstairs. Here's the C4. It Lands on the planter, though. Perfect throw from Semi. That forces Barring now into the site, off the cover. He's going to have to be the next planter, but he'll skate right past Diffuser. It'll end up netting him a kill. Looking for a free fire to the corner. He's unsuccessful. Where does Goons come from? Where's the cover from above? It's completely inadequate, and he wins that fight against Bio. A 3K from the Goyo. Two of those kills really never should have happened in the first place, but he'll still win out the round for his team, and Eclectic now take the lead 5-4. Yeah, Goons is on a heater. That is three rounds in a row where Goons has been the pivotal player and really the pivotal element that has shut down West Garfield, whether it is on that initial attack on the top floor and they couldn't clear white stairs because of that deployable shield and Goons just frying everybody, whether it was the previous round and Goons going for a flank completely unnoticed and then eventually getting that final kill, or it was this round in front of us where Goons just tore the attack apart. There was no one else it seemed like there was no one ever watching Goons. I'm still not convinced he isn't invisible because he was able <laughs> to go on, come on several different flanks, get behind into Pillar and kill, Defenders barring again. Like, how does that happen? Where's the coverage from above? Where's the coverage from Pillar? He may be invisible, Harrison. I don't know. I don't know if we can rule out that aspect just yet. Yeah, I mean, he's 11 and 5 now. Almost caught up to barring, but doesn't really matter because his team is winning. Eclectic have put together three stalwart defenses in a row now. They'll go back up to bar where West Garfield really didn't even touch the top floor. He had the early pick from the Frost on the player bottom white. The rest of everyone trying to put white stairs died as well, and two attackers died on Repel. So not a single one of them actually touched the inside of the site. Kind of actually something that we saw from Eclectic several times in their attack as well. It seems like neither of these teams can really attack Cafe all too effectively. Only Eclectic have started their defensive half a little bit better with a 3-0 rather than a 2-1. So... Where are West Garfield going to decide to attack? The bottom up, clearly not working last round, although they did try just kind of walking up white stairs. I will say that didn't look like a completely put together cocktail take because they didn't have the buck go below. He didn't take out those anchors. He didn't really apply any pressure on the other side of the map as well. And it looks like it's pretty standard goings from West Garfield with Bio up on the roof rather than clearing the middle floor. Rudy opening the red wall. It's a pretty standard piano over push. And we'll see how they continue that one. 
We'll get those X-Kairos pellets from the Habana, the hard destruction that will open the reinforced wall over towards Piano. And since there's nobody from uh, this eclectic defense playing down below, no C4 to be tossed up, it should be relatively easy for West Garfield to push on in. They've just got to deal with the player over in the corner on pixel position where we see Duke now backing off and tucking away into bathroom. So West Garfield have cleared their way up a pretty good bit here and doing so in a reasonably quick amount of time they've just got to clear out the rest of this utility here there goes that evil eye which could have eventually denied that default plant but eclectic what's impressive right now is that everyone is still alive they've backed off they're playing relatively passively here and they're just waiting for someone on west garfield to step up they're not putting their lives at risk early reaper knows he has a c4 that he could rip and lob down that white ball at any moment you've still got someone in freezer to support all of these angles at the same time and so when this execute eventually happens west garfield i mean they're gonna have a lot of defenders to go up against psychosis will start off the frags with well literally a frag grenade of his own that's gonna finish off the jaeger but now they've got to find four more players yeah duke dying on white is gonna prompt the fall off from a couple players mx reaper going downstairs looking for the c4 from below as psychosis is already pushed up towards pallets and it looks like goons has no idea he knows now as psychosis takes out mx reaper coming up white barring the next to get a kill z finally getting the trade but no the aruni running out of ammo it's z trapped in freezer he'll land a beautiful headshot on the forest but now he's like a rat in a cage in the 1v2 they know exactly where he's coming from rudy finishes the round off easy and west Garfield tie us up once again five to five looked like it was slipping away there for a moment from West Garfield especially after the messy reading take and just allowing goons to just run free and tear them apart but finally we see them make a change and after taking four rounds on their initial defensive half they will they will finally secure their first round on the attacking half not allowing any player to catch them off guard. And I was a little bit surprised, honestly, Harrison, that we saw Eclectic play as passive as they did, right? They were all sitting back. They were all playing passive. And I complimented for that in the middle of that round. But seeing how well West Garfield dealt with that, suggest to me that maybe the aggression that Eclectic have brought out, the ability of them to just whip out a couple of flanks, to whip out a couple of surprising Attackers plays, that may be a bit more bombs. important to their defense than they may have realized in that round. By stepping back, sitting back, and playing a little bit more calmly, Wes Garfield was allowed to kind of approach the site the way bombs. they wanted to, and allowing them to do that seemed to be the death of Eclectic there. Had Goons hit the shot that he was looking at, I believe he was in Cocktail and just whiffed the whole mag as the Aruni. That it may have been a very different round, but still it was West Garfield with a pretty successful attack that didn't have to deal with any random flanks or any random surprises. Yeah, once Eclectic peeled back, I mean, as powerful as shields are, sometimes sitting behind a shield just paints a big target on you as the attackers know exactly where you're going to be sitting, making you generally pretty easy fodder for things like frag grenades, like we saw from Psychosis opening up White Paw for his team. So, Eclectic will try again. Once again, bringing out the mirror windows, bringing out the shields. Although I think the mirror is, is uh, new to this defense, actually. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so uh, the mirror is new. Perhaps that will aid Eclectic in their passivity, as the mirror windows, you know, you can sit behind safely while still having info on the attack instead of needing to swing to gather those. Who knows? Maybe the mirror will prevent West Garfield from simply walking into the site yet again, although they did have a lot of window pressure that worked out in their favor. All right, I would like to see that from West Garfield again. I think it was something that really helped them get the map control, at least do it quickly. They didn't have to worry about clearing all the utility when you can just hop on a rappel and lob a couple of nades in. Psychosis has done that excellently instead. Didn't even have to use a nade there, just shot the gone six and it took down the shield instantly. So he still has two nades for later and already made a good bit of progress in terms of this utility clear. Now, Forest dropping down the red hatch will get lit up from Duke all the way down from below. So they've identified the position of the Jaeger and they know they've got to worry about a bit of a flank. It seems those adjustments I've talked about from Eclectic starting to come out here, although they haven't quite been effective. In addition, Reaper has wasted this C4 that he had in pocket. So the last bit of that plant denial utility, other than those evil eyes from Semi on the Maestro, will be the C4 that Goons has in his pocket. On the Mira, it's a very important piece of utility and could be even more impactful than Reapers could have been, but something to keep in mind when a plant 
goes down eventually. West Garfield, though, a little bit of a different what? approach this time, but they're just going to get run out on by Semi, the okay. maestro, oddly enough. Will jump out the white window, collect a kill. He'll get traded by Psychosis. He'll now go for the swing and try to take a couple of fights. Nade from Rudy, though, took down the player in Cocktail. But here comes Reaper, still in the fight, and got this mirror window to work off of. Duke will take down Barring, who walked into a death trap. And now, oh, it looks like he'll step up again. Duke is taken down, but Reaper gets one back. Psychosis, he spots out his back, but can't finish the kill. That could be problematic if Reaper can find the headshot, because 45 seconds left, and these players, they're just going to go back and forth. Reaper has the pings, wow. and he's got the pre-fire, and he will win it out. Psychosis missing a couple of key shots, Reaper punishing him for it. What an incredible clutch from Reaper, and I believe that was Duke on the Jaeger. At first, things were really questionable for Eclecti. You talked about the, the jump out from Semi. That was actually a dual jump out from both Semi and Goons. Goons was the first to fall, killed by the buck. Semi traded it off, but there were two people on Repel. Semi did not expect Psychosis to also be there. So Psychosis gets the kill on the Maestro, Repel's into heaven, Rudy gets a frag grenade kill, I think dropping Skylight and position himself in the cocktail rotate. So at this point, I believe it's a 2v4, right? And the attackers have nearly full control of cocktail, but something they don't account for is Reaper still holding the mirror window. He peeks out in a cocktail, kills Rudy Hug in the corner because Psychosis plays passive in C1, not holding where the mirror window is positioned. That allows Reaper to get that kill for free, go back behind the mirror window. Duke is still over towards bathroom. He and Reaper are able to pinch barring. Now, sure, Duke gets traded out, but you still have the Goyo running amok. He downs the Thermite, is able to get away with the kill because Psychosis doesn't land enough bullets on the Goyo. He leaves Reaper with one HP. And that's just enough for the Goyo to do the dance of death around the mirror window, around Freezer and Cocktail, catch the Iana off guard as they play Ring Around the Rosie. And that puts Eclectic 6-5. That round should not have been that chaotic. That should have been a pretty straightforward victory for West Garfield, but they still fumble it thanks to Reaper and Duke. Reaper now 8-8, eight eight, trailing behind Goons and Z, who have 11 kills apiece. And now we go down onto Kitchen. Eclectic... Defended this successfully the last time. Again, thanks to a big flank by Goons. Can Eclectic get away with it again? They have a similar roam being set up. They have Duke playing over towards prep. Of course, Goons upstairs is mute. West Garfield last time attempted a direct push and got stumped by the flank. Are they going to be clearing top down to make sure that doesn't happen again? Seems that right now they're going to be applying some big bakery pressure. Doesn't mean that they're not going to go all, all the right. way upstairs, but look at this. The aggression from Reaper, the same aggression we'd seen from him before. This time it will be punished by a perfectly placed Claymore. That barring, he was very ready for that run out. Didn't even have to watch the angle himself. The Claymore did it for him. So good start. And I believe the question, Harrison, that you asked has been answered. We've got three West Garfield attackers all bunched up in Big Bakery going for this direct approach. You've got somebody, I believe, all the way upstairs. While barring applies some pressure from the back side. Goons is applying some pressure from above though, and this is a pretty typical position for a defender to hold. If the attackers aren't gonna clear top down, then the defenders are gonna do whatever they can to punish them for it. Staffing these angles on the default plant and on the prep run-in. That's when the top floor player on West Garfield should eventually come into, into effect, but we're not seeing them step up just yet, waiting until the opportune moment, I suspect, to strike. That's Bio lurking from above. For now, Psychosis, will continue to swing. Barring will continue to swing, and they're going to do it unpunished. Finally, Baya will step up, taking down goons from above. That's going to leave Semi alive, but against four and quickly taken down by Psychosis. Good adjustments there from West Garfield, and they got the job done in a big way. West Garfield push us to OT, the direct push working out because they actually have people contesting the top floor. Barring, surprisingly, is able to go for the exact same play he did last time, and that's push Whiskey early, only this time he didn't need to get three kills. The attackers open the breach, they start to push on in, Barring gets his kill on the, uh, on the horizontal over towards Whiskey, then upstairs Bio is able to kill the mute looking downstairs, the Mozzie for some reason no longer there to cover, and West Garfield field just barrel their way on in again like you said good adjustment but it's eight to four right now in favor of the defense and eclectic get the privilege of starting defense on the uh 
on the first round of overtime. So uh, they have the favorable side. Now, we know sometimes in overtime, the sides like to swap up their trends, but just going off of history, Eclectic should have the advantage here. There's no question about that. It is interesting to see them go to reading here. One of the tertiary bomb sites, we call them. Um, but if you look at the history, I suppose, is that, you know, they, they've won Bar and Cocktail once, but they've also lost it once. Actually won it twice, but lost it once. Same thing goes for Kitchen. They've won that run once in round eight. They lost it in round 12. Reading, we've only seen from them once. That was in round nine, their third defensive round, and they were able to win it successfully. So I suppose they're going to the site with the best win rate. They've got 100% win right here, so why not go for it again? I expect is their thought process, but they've also not seen quite yet how West Garfield adjust, how they make a couple of changes here, because last time it was almost going West Garfield's way, you could say, until Goon was able to run amok and just run all over them. As long as West Garfield can get Goons under control, the clear they had last time was enough to get things done right. And that flank from Magoyo was pretty big, but so far, Eclectic haven't been able, uh, haven't been afforded those opportunities, whether it be uh, better flank watch, whether it be the Claymores, but they're not going to be able to watch the top windows. Goons gets an early kill on Rudy, turning onto the stage window, nearly grabbing Forrest, but unfortunately missing all his shots, but still being able to get away with his life. So... Rudy gets taken out. That's your Twitch. Now, there's no Mira on the board, but there are Goyo shields he could have cleared. There are, of course, you know, Wamidis, ADSs, Mute Jammers. There's a lot of utility that the Twitch could have grabbed. Rudy will unfortunately hit the floor, and now West Garfield will suffer a man deficit. Yeah, tough start, and uh, no surprise, though, that it is goons to just be running all over the map like a madman, collecting kills, and West Garfield just are not prepared for it. Psychosis will be prepared for it this time. The second engagement that he'll be able to take will be successful, and goons, who is already on pretty low HP, will be fully finished off. And no trade there from Eclectic, so that kill has been quickly found back, and the fact that, I mean, it's a twitch for a Goyo, I'd say this is a very even fight right now. There's no Mira in play, so those twitch drones can't just sneak through the site and take down those mirror windows from behind. That was probably assumed from West Garfield if they were to encounter that mirror. But because they didn't, things are pretty even in terms of overall utility and manpower. Everyone else in this lobby is at 100 HP. But if you look at map control right now, West Garfield are taking a very unique approach. They're not contesting up above, a position where MX Reaper is now comfortable to sit in and at any point could drop down and tear apart West Garfield if they're not careful. There it goes. He'll do that. MX Reaper, just sitting up above, will get one. So Psychosis now will have to step up and do things the old-fashioned way. He'll get a double kill, but this is still an even 3v3. Now that we cross this 45-second mark, it's eclectic to open things up in the second half of this round. It is Duke to get a kill and barring to trade it. Now an even 2v2. Reaper, though, in pillar, could be very problematic for West Garfield. Barring will get stunned, I believe by him his own stun. Psychosis as well. We'll also have a bit of trouble seeing right now, but Barring will step up at the right moment. There goes Reaper. Last alive is Z. He's getting torn apart through the wall, and there go West Garfield. Good adjustment there on reading. They'll take round 13. Now it's their team that's on match point. It didn't look favorable for West Garfield a lot of that round. They lost the opening pick of Rudy. Sure, they traded it back, but the 90 push... It could have gone either way after that, right? Because Psychosis, uh, sorry, not Psychosis. I think it was Barring, pushed through the hallway to catch the shotgun. I think it was Semi, peeking the hard breach charge. I mean, Semi was pretty much dead either way, but I really got to pin it on Eclectic for not having anyone watching that hallway. That's a pretty standard position to have someone holding. I mean, yeah, it was good that the Aruni got a pick in the pillar, but if you don't hold that hallway, you are, you're trolling. I mean, Bio sure dies with Case in the hallway, but barring coming up white, I think it was, uh, was able to get that refrag. And from there, you have MX Reaper trying to cover Pillar by himself with active info on him. And Z upstairs not really covering anything of importance. So the attackers take the 2v1, well, not even really a 2v1, Barn just swung with info and caught the Aruni with her, uh, with her back to him. And you're in a 1v2. There's really nothing Z can do. Eclectic, it looked like they had control of that round. They let it slip away. And now they're on the attack. They have to attack on Tabar, which... 
it's going to be tough against West Garfield, especially with these mirror windows and the echo. There's a lot of utility for them to try and go through. And again, we don't see the buck. Nope. Something that Eclectic have, strangely enough, avoided every single attacking round. So bizarre. I mean, the fact that you lose your sledge, that should be reason enough to bring the buck if you don't already favor the buck on this map. Buck is extremely strong on this map because that soft destruction, it doesn't just go down, it goes okay. up as well. But it doesn't seem to matter. Buck or not, Forrest is going to throw away his life. As the Echo, that is the last player of everyone in this lobby you wanted to lose. Now, those Echo drones are useless. Unless they're pre-placed in a good position where their intel is useful, he can no longer use that intel and no longer deny that plant. Yeah, that is a fantastic first pick. Probably the best first pick you could have asked for if you're the attacks. Uh... Like you said, you've lost control of those yokais. We had another bracket update as well. Chess Club taking out Nocturnes 2-1. to one. So, Jonah, all the Challenger League teams in our playoffs brackets have now been defeated. Wow. They've all been eliminated. And Chess Club await the winner of We Miss Benfield and Shadow Realm. But back to this game. MX Reaper is battling against Psychosis. And after that, he'll go down. But he's Finka. So he can just res himself. And he's going to continue trying to take this fight. Psychosis, though, knowing it's a Fenka because of the LMG, will smartly back off. He does not want to do battle any longer, not with full info on him, and he'll retreat back over towards this mirror window to support Barring, who's trying to get aggressive on the red wall. Goons will drone him out. They know he's there, but he's still able to get a kill. He lands one on the semi. Z refrags Psychosis, but Barring is still on the loose, but up close. Goons frags him with the F2, and now it's Biologic and Rudy. Two versus four. A lot of low HP members here on Eclectic, though. Goon Z and MX Reaper all below half. The Finca, perhaps with boosts, could land some heals. Rudy is now full blind in Pixel. That shield should be dusted pretty soon. Or rather, the shield is gone. The mirror window, he can still play behind. MX Reaper is below, looking for any nades from below, but he's not really operating off of any info. He will get the bandit batteries off, but that doesn't really matter much because your Hibana is already dead. Rudy's position is going to be the linchpin in this round. If he can get one kill, maybe even two, he could potentially save this entire round and win the map for West Garfield because Eclectic are taking their time. There's only 45 seconds left now. They have wasted a lot just kind of standing around and collecting their bearings. But that's a perfect smoke. That'll cut the cross. Goons lands a biblical shot on the bio, and that leaves Rudy alone. He has to abandon the mirror window and bathroom. He'll start to see them barrel through long bar. Down goes the twitch. He can't transition onto the second. The plant is going down, and he'll have to let it. MX Reaper now puts us in a post plant, and the clock works against the Jaeger. Crouching up long bar, though, he's spotted by the LMG. MX Reaper lets it sing, and Eclectic take us to round three. 15. Love the patience from Eclectic there in the last few moments. They did not get too aggressive and they didn't move in until they knew exactly what they were dealing with. They identified the position of the Jaeger because he sent a couple of bullets flying from that bathroom mirror window. So they knew exactly where he was and they knew exactly what cross they had to cut off. Perfect smoke grenade. Textbook use of that piece of utility. And even though Barring was able to get to his 20th kill in this map on that round, it did not matter. Eclectic shut him down. They shut the aggression down. And in that 4v2, they stayed calm. They stayed composed. And they just beat West Garfield to the punch. That is exactly how you play a 4v2. You take your time. You assess the situation. And then you push in together. You never present 1v1 gunfights to the defense. Because as we saw in our first series, between West Garfield and WW Academy, if you present West Garfield with 1v1s in those 2vx situations, those 1vxs, they can win those every time. Eclectic did not give them that chance. They made sure that every gunfight had several attackers bearing down right behind it. They made sure that they knew everything about pushing an angle before they actually swung it. Textbook all the way through. Maybe West Garfield got a bit too aggressive for their own good. Feels like they did. We're riding the confidence of that previous round. And now, because of that, they are going to have to attack. Now they've got to go on the side that, I mean, we've seen work in overtime, but didn't work so well in regulation. Uh, yeah, reading room? I don't know, man. Eclectic literally just lost this site in overtime. 
I don't know how I feel about this. I mean, hey, maybe they can turn it around. Now they have floor holes as well in dining from kitchen. You can launch a C4 up, but whether or not West Garfield actually go for that is another story. No spawn peak here from Eclectic, meaning they don't have an early opening frag onto someone like Rudy, who is playing a far more important op operator this round than the Twitch. You've also got Biologic flexing off of Buck onto Flores. So you no longer have that easy vertical play even though West Garfield are looking to clear the top floor. So, uh, a bit interesting that they decide to swap the buck for the Flores instead of someone like uh, the Nomad, perhaps, but they just still want that extra coverage of the flank watch, that extra added peace of mind that the air jabs bring. But they'll start to clear in already. Forest is in piano, a minute down. Shield is gone from Cocktail as well, making it a little bit easier for West Garfield to push in. I do like the fact that we're still seeing these air jabs in play because Goons has there been a go. threat on these flanks constantly. And look at him. I mean, he really wants this kill onto Psychosis. He he won't be able to get it. Barring is actually the one to get the opening frag. That one onto Reaper. Taking down the Aruni. Being cut down to 1 HP for his troubles. And because there's no Finca in play, at 1 HP he will remain for this round. And likely to be finished off pretty quickly. A couple of bullets through the floor even could do him in. Now, we don't see anyone actively staffing this top floor anymore from Eclectic. West Garfield have made this clear very efficiently. And now, they're going to have to find a way to get this control back. Goons is running all over the place. Z wants a kill. And they're going to get shut down. There goes Goons. Good flank watch from Rudy. Psychosis getting the kill onto Z that he needed. And Semi and Duke are all that remains. You're going to have Duke on the white stairs. His position is surely known as he takes an aggressive swing. Forest has some air jabs set up for this as well, so Semi is going to have to really clutch up on the site, but he doesn't have a C4 to work with either. Duke spots out one, but Biologic takes down his teammate, and now it is going to be all up to the low HP Jaeger. He's going to get naded now on a sliver of HP. Another nade works his way towards him, and he will be finished off. Finally, in round 15, it took us all the way to the end of overtime, but Wes Garfield will take the map. I don't understand Eclectic's thought process there. They literally just lost reading the round prior, and they do the opposite of what's been working for them on the defense. At the beginning of their defensive half, right, they're winning rounds off of aggressive plays, and they're winning rounds off of flanks. As soon as West Garfield wise up to that, it no longer works, and Eclectic have to get passive. It works for them a couple times. It does work. On reading, though, the initial reading attempt, they get aggressive and they try to go for peaks and it ends up really punishing them. And it seems like on their second go of reading in overtime on round 15, they tried to lean into that even more. MX Reaper is pushed up all the way to B1 with no recourse, no rotate, no nothing, where he's been droned out every single freaking time. It's not, it didn't work the first four times. It's not going to work the fifth, Reaper. Then you have people like Z. People like goons, trying to get aggressive, trying to take the ground back. But all West Garfield are doing are sitting and waiting because they know you're gonna go for that play. And this is exactly the same thing we saw from Eclectic in stage one of the regular season against one shot. They take one shot off guard. They get early aggressive advantages in the early round. But as soon as one shot wise up to that, all they have to do is sit and wait and Eclectic time and time again on their defense push into the waiting arms of the attack. Just the first map, though, and all the errors that Eclectic may have made, all the errors that West Garfield may have made, they can learn for them before we go into map two. It's a best of three. There is still a lot of Siege yet to be played in this series alone, and if this first map teaches us anything and tells us anything about this series, that this next map of Oregon should be a thriller. Both of these teams... They know exactly what this map is like. They can frag out on this map, much like they did on Cafe. Barring dropped 21 kills, I think, by the end of that map. So heading into Oregon, yeah. I cannot wait to see what these teams are going to deliver for us. Before we get there, though, got to deliver another shout out to one of our wonderful sponsors, Mavix Gaming Chairs. If you haven't experienced Mavix Gaming Chairs for yourself, you can do so with the assistance of Nerd Street Gamers with a $55 discount code NSG55 at checkout. All Mavix Gaming Chairs, the exclusive partner of Nerd Street Gamers and local host, by the way, all Mavix Gaming Chairs feature the future nine functions of critical ergonomics to support gamers everywhere. We all sit for long periods of time, and it's very, very important to spend the money 
and get a good chair. We're sitting in it all the time. You might as well be comfortable. You can get yours today for as little as 22 22 a month, and you can do that all at mavix.com. That is M-A-V-I-X.com slash NerdStreetGamers. So while you take a break and stretch from your uncomfortable chair and you shop on mavix.com, We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we've got Oregon, which should hopefully be a fantastic second map for this series. We'll see you in a moment. B3, make that a 1v2. Two seconds left. It's going to come down. Faber making a third as he looks up. Faber he finds the draw three. Stunning here. Welcome to the Nerd Street Winter Championships, featuring SCS6, a yearly open tournament series hosting the best players and teams North America has to offer, culminating in a community favorite, the Pro-Am. So let's discuss format. During the Winter Champ season, SCS6 will consist of two stages, where each stage begins with two open qualifiers. Once Stage 1 is complete, there will be an additional tournament offering one more qualification spot prior to Stage 2. Through participating in SCS 6, players will acquire leaderboard points and cash prizing. The winning teams from Stage 1 and 2, as well as the additional tournament, will qualify for the Pro-Am. The top two teams from the leaderboard will also qualify. As we approach the end of the season, the final qualification spot will be determined through a last chance qualifier. The Grand Finals of the Winter Champs SCS 6 will feature the return of the Pro-Am, where the top amateur teams have an opportunity to define their talent against the North American Pro League. But in the end, only one team will be crowned Winter Champs. Sign up today and make history. There once was a tournament during the season of snow, filled with contenders of might, with names Dees, Ligma, and Joe. The road was a trying one, wrists aching with craps. In the end, victors rose. We call them Winter Champs. Before they departed, they left us these words. Our journey's just begun, all thanks to the nerds. Two seconds left. It's gonna come down. Faber making a third as he looks up. Faber he finds the draw three. Stunning here. Took a while, Harrison, but finally, map one, done and dusted. 15 rounds, 8-7 victory for West Garfield over Eclectic. It was a good one, though, and it was a lot closer than any other map we saw here tonight. West Garfield had to work at it, but they made it happen on Cafe. Now, can they translate that to Oregon? Yeah, unfortunately for Eclectic, we saw uh, a lot of shades of their stage one performance, a lot of errors when it comes to just when to control the aggression, when to push out, when to hold back and play your shields and mirror windows and such like that. And well, West Garfield kind of uh, wised up to the tricks of Eclectic pretty early on on their uh, on their attacking half. And uh, 
while Eclectic didn't really find much success after that. Now we're heading on to Oregon though, another map where you can be severely punished if you don't know how to control your aggression. Hopefully Eclectic have taken a step back, looked at themselves and figured out what they need to do. They'll be starting on the defenses. This is West Garfield's map pick, and I imagine they'll probably go with some standard bans. Last map, they were the ones to ban Thatcher. I wouldn't imagine that that changes here on Oregon. Thatcher is a good ban, you know, pretty much everywhere. It was West Garfield that brought out the sledge. Maybe they have something, uh, something interesting in store for us here too. Right, we could see some interesting bans here on Oregon. I don't expect to see anything too crazy given that this is Oregon and there isn't as much fluidity with the... All right, ignore me. Ignore me, okay. we're gonna see some crazy bans. We've got the Finca in play, with the Finca out of play, and that is an exciting change here. We've seen her a lot on every map played tonight. She is a staple of the meta right now. She adds so much in terms of utility with those frag grenades, adds a lot of HP to the side of attackers, and you know, gives them those three Finca boosts that she carries in her pocket. Now, that's something we'll have to see how it comes into later. The Valkyrie, that's not going to be unusual. We know exactly how that changes things. And the Kaid ban, we know exactly how that changes things too. We don't have those Electro Claws in play, slightly limiting the, you know, hard breaching of the attackers, but because Maverick is still on the board, that's not going to be too much of an issue for attacking teams to circumvent. And plus, with a Cade ban, a lot of times, uh, or rather sometimes, we don't even see Maverick played because it's pretty easy to get rid of a bandit or a yep. mute without the need of that torch. And you can see the attack is already going to kind of throw Maverick to the wayside and say, we don't need him. Hibana is all we need. They'll be attacking on the laundry again, one of those very hatch-centric sites if you want to open them all up. Otherwise, you can suffice with just opening up E-Box and then rotating towards elbow and such bio is going to be off sledge on the floor as sledge not the greatest operator on this map you'll find a lot more mileage with those rotero drones especially because eclectic are leaning into the goyo into the wamai and the jaeger the smoke shield etc lots of destructible utility that that flores is going to find stock in i'm going to turn our attention mainly onto forest mainly onto the ying whether he's bringing hard breach charges or smokes the ying always acts as that kind of wedge on this site whether it be over towards the freezer side of things or whether he's facilitating an e-box drop that ying acts as like i said that spear that shoves itself right into the middle of the defense and kind of uh works to part it and act and uh, allow you to grab those easy frags whether the defenders be blinded or just separated from the rest of the pack so very interesting to see where forrest is going to be placing his utility attackers must locate and defuse a bomb i mean not only can his smokes you know cut off pretty important angles but like you said those candelas it flashes several defenders and forces them to become basically afk in a corner or at the very least you know they have to tuck tail and run they have to move back and like you said it cuts the site in half now also, attacking team, even without the Yang, could cut the site in half by going for that two-pronged freezer and laundry approach that has become all too common on this basement attack. It's unclear exactly how West Garfield are going to approach this one right now. We've seen both of these approaches from them in terms of overall attacking success. We just saw them play Oregon. We did see that in our previous series. So we generally know that they're going to just try to get all of their options open and available to them. They're going to get this freezer hatch open. They're going to get that laundry hatch open. They're going to get a lot of pressure building over towards E-Box and over towards the tower side of things, all while clearing out these roamers and making sure there is nobody tucked away in places like top of tower in T3. Nobody's there. Everyone is downstairs, all five defenders. They don't want to roam. They don't want to take early fights. Instead, they want to sit back and wait for Wes Garfield to come to them. A risky strategy, as we've seen for Eclectic, because we know how strong Wes Garfield can be on these pushes, especially with a Ying in pocket. All of that utility dumping later in the round could prove problematic for Eclectic. I think Eclectic are, you know, again, looking at how they played Cafe, figured they were a little bit over-aggressive and now are playing the sit-and-wait game, but you see Forrest hovering above the E-Box hatch, I believe, waiting for his use of those Candelas to be called, but he's actually, no, he's rotating over towards the laundry side of things, maybe joining Bio. 
in his attempt of pushing this side of the map. He'll do away with the shield in the rotate, making the defenders a little less safe to challenge that. Goons and Harry Potter, duos with Duke sitting here in Pillar. Their area, or their player to focus on is going to be Barn, but it's actually Rudy to drop and take care of the Harry Potter player. Forrest with those Candelas takes out Duke. Here's another one on the dock, and it's Reaper who goes down amidst the Goyo fire. And now it's Z and Semi alone in a two versus five. 50 seconds to delay, make it just Semi now as his teammate gets taken out, and Semi's blindsided by Bio, dropping the laundry hatch. Every single avenue of attack being exploited expertly by this attack. Oh, that was beautiful. And the use of the Candelas, there's nothing better than seeing it, a Ying, you know, work so perfectly than that. I mean, Forrest played that to perfection, using those Candelas to not only aid his drop down the E-Box hatch, but to aid his teammates as they pushed in from blue, as they pushed in from tower stairs. Of course, he did end up blinding Barring because of just the timing of his push, but Barring was fine. He had already done his job covering that player in pillar, trapping him in the corner, and giving Forrest the opportunity to secure that kill. Big play by Rudy as well to get the kill onto Goons sitting in Harry Potter. As we've talked about so far this series, Goons has been a very, very potent threat Attackers that West Garfield have struggled to kind of control and deal with him. But when you take him down early like that and you prevent him from using his gun, his vector, or his C4, I mean, that is exactly what you need as an attack to free up your options. At that point, with the kill onto Goons and eventually with the kill onto the Jaeger, uh, sitting in Pillar, I think it was Duke at the time, uh, pretty much that control had been secured of the Pillar side, of the North side, of the bottom floor, and from there, the Candelas forced everyone back, forced every defender into the attacker's waiting arms. That's why the round was flawless, and that's exactly what West Garfield needs to keep up if they want to keep going with this attacking success. Eclectic got completely run over. It seems like they don't really know what to do, whether to play passive or aggressive, because when they get aggressive, they get too aggressive and peek right into West Garfield. When they play passive, they play too passive and let West Garfield take whatever control they want. It's tough for Eclectic to find, you know, that middle ground of not getting, you know, monkey-like and ranked style and just pushing out every which way and also not giving the attackers control for free hopefully they're able to figure it out sometime this map before it's too late they'll be working to try and defend attackers the top floor again with a very standard lineup aruni gates jaeger wamai a lot of projectile denial here to protect the shields of that goyo and just all around deny the type of play that Forrest wants with his throwables, a very throwable centric attack with the exception, of course, of that Flores who can ride right past all of that to destroy those shields and other pieces of utility. West Garfield right now just droning armory, making sure there's no one from the defense acting aggressively. But again, they've got pretty much all this control into trophy for free. And that's now why Bio is going to whip out that first Rotero drone. I'll bring that one through, just opening up a rotate, actually. Between Master and uh, that Armory Hall. So they'll have a quick angle to work his way on into there. And through that very angle, he'll work his drone in, but it gets muted, shutting down his ability to use that for later. Psychosis, though, he doesn't be he doesn't really mind with the rest of whatever's going on on the other side of this map. He'll take his first kill, but Goons will quickly trade it back. Barring alone downstairs, isolated from the rest of his team, Goons takes advantage. Z does get lit up, though. I suspect by Psychosis here, who now tries to finish off this kill with a couple of nades. The first one burned Wamai Dis. The second, not quite far enough into the corner. Forest now, it's his turn to step up. Smokes go in, Candela's to follow. C4, though, will shut down the first player. Bio is gone. And now Forrest has got to step up in time, but his team is falling all around him. Goons sneaks up and takes down Rudy. Now Psychosis and Forrest are very far apart from one another. Forrest being lit up from below. Z lighting up Psychosis, and it's Forrest on one HP. All that remains. He's going to be forced back, and Goons, <laughs> with all the confidence in the world, whips out the pistol and finishes off the round for Eclectic. Well done to Goons and the rest of his team, and this is what we see from Eclectic, or this is what we saw from Eclectic on Cafe that really worked out well for them. The majority of your players on site with maybe, uh, again, like a maximum of one flanker at a time. Typically Goons, and it works wonders. 
Most of Eclectic on the site there were holding firm. No one from West Garfield could make their way in. Psychosis on the on the big window, not able to apply adequate pressure. Semi landing the C4 kill onto Bio. Meanwhile, you have goons running amok downstairs, not only killing Barring, also able to flank up Armory and kill another one of those trophy players, completely disrupting that push. And from there, Forrest couldn't really do much to salvage it. That is the kind of aggression we need to see from Eclectic. Sure. That guy's getting a super aggressive, but it's only one. It's not like you're throwing three bodies at this roam and losing all of them like we saw on those later defensive rounds of Cafe. We'll tie it up at one here in West Garfield. They'll now have another opportunity to attack the basement, and Eclectic will have an opportunity to adjust down below. Unusually so, however, we're not seeing Forrest bring out the Ying again. Especially because we don't see that Aruni in play. No more Surya Gates. It's just the Wamai, just the Jaeger as that projectile denial. I mean, the Ying could be as impactful as ever, but maybe West Garfield figured, you know what, they're going to have a counter for it this time. Maybe they're going to bring out the Warden. Maybe they're just going to be extremely prepared for it, and we want to change up our strategy. So regardless of if that was advisable or not, they're going to go for the change. Twitch in play now from Forest, which... Given the Twitch, you know, semi-recent buff, you know, is not a bad pick because those Twitch drones can deal with those Goyo shields. They can jump their way around the site like any drone. And if you can elude capture, they can be an incredibly potent piece of utility. Right now, they're just going to be utilized on this roam clear, seeing if anyone is extended off the map. As Wes Garfield learned in the previous round, Eclectic are eager to get a little bit more aggressive and maybe a little bit more roam heavy. But as we can tell, nobody is extended off the bottom floor for now. The closest player to actually contesting anyone on the top floor will be Duke sitting on the back tower stairs. I wonder if uh, someone later in the round is going to be going for a flank. Maybe that's what Duke is playing for if he never gets pushed out. But we're a minute down and, and uh, Wes Garfield are already cloning in through Freezer. Bulletproof Cam, unfortunately, missing its shot onto uh, onto the Iana and allowing the Twitch drone through means that Bulletproof Camera is going to be done and dusted. No more hard info on Freezer, save for just peeking in there and face-checking yourself. And Psychosis is going to take that opportunity to apply some early pressure. Duke, who is still lingering in tower, goes down to Barring. First kill of the round goes to West Garfield and the Zofia. We saw Barring drop over 20 in the last map. He's looking to maybe be on track for that this map as well. Goons is sitting and waiting and ready with a C4, but Barring is not getting aggressive. He is simply holding tower while the rest of his team sets up their attacks. Psychosis continuing to nade down. We'll do away with, it looks like actually both Goyo shields? I don't know how it got the second one. Maybe shrapnel through the drone hole? I would have to imagine. Uh, that's a little bit confusing, but both... Goyo shields are done and dusted thanks to one nade. Goons gets aggressive and Baron catches him, so the Goyo will fall along with his shields. Now it's a 5-3 favor of West Garfield. Yeah, they're in a really good spot right now because they've got people just about on every single angle on this bottom floor, and they pretty much know exactly where every single defender is positioned. I mean, you've got people on that E-Box hatch ready to drop down, and that they will. Here comes Forrest. Reaper will get one, but quickly traded by Forrest, who was ready with that F2, leaving Semi and Z to fend for themselves down below. Psychosis shutting down Z. That means it is all up to the smoke of Semi, who is not much longer for this world. Great drop down E-Box from Forrest. He'll swing around long haul and deal with the smoke on the rotate very quickly that is west garfield now continuing to hold their lead by one neglectic with not already having someone established on the aggressive stance they try to push up duke through tower he's caught by barring goons tries to follow suit he as well is caught by barring and from there in a 5v3 eclectic can do nothing but sit back and watch as west garfield waste away all their utility take the control and land the shots they need as we know west garfield to do when eclectic give them you know again all that control without disrupting anything and they couldn't Again, because of barring. Now it's meeting hall and kitchen for Eclectic. It is the offsite. They're going to have to hold the top floor. I imagine that's going to probably be a uh, task of goons and MX Reaper. Sometimes we see the Echo playing upstairs, but that's 
more of a toss up. I mean, hey, maybe Duke will be there, uh, be up there as well. A lot of this site, really all of this site, can hinge on your top floor players. If they are all still alive, it's pretty tough for the attackers to fully take in and get that plant down. No castle off split, the castle being left up, uh, unlike the last map. Of course, he's got four barricades now. I imagine one might as well, uh, might be placed on security as well. Maybe one on the kitchen door, maybe a couple upstairs. We see sometimes castle barricades being placed on big window, kids window, trophy doorway as well. He'll actually barricade off the showers hall. And West Garfield's drones are set up as if they're going to be pushing from Small Tower. No? They had a few drones set up on that side of the map. Maybe they're just slow to get in the building, but otherwise you got one coming in from Garage. Okay, two coming in from Small Tower. Alright, so honestly just making sure they've got someone at every single entrance of this map, every single oh. spawn, but the only thing that's going to result in is an early death barring taken care of where was he pushing he was in? outside white windows he right by the school bus aha uh -huh. there he is and uh well he's gone there goes your zofia the player who dropped 21 will not be able to contribute in round number four here on oregon because once again goons is running all over the map and is just hard to get a hold of west garfield still struggling despite it being so long at this point de dealing with the goons uh, still struggling to uh, actually get him under wraps. But they've dealt with Duke here, who's 0-4 right now. The Alibi, who was hoping to use that MX-4 Storm to its full capacity as a very frag-heavy weapon, will not be a factor in this round either. Now, Bio droning out this top floor will spot out the Jaeger, and Goons backing on off, now trying to retreat, will escape successfully. One quick bullet missed there from Forrest. He'll land one shot, but not the second. But Goons almost overstays his welcome. Risky to try to re-peek there, but he will drop down towards Kitchen just as Semi provides support and takes down Rudy. That's your hard breacher gone. A very good pick for this eclectic defense to have. That's also the only player not upstairs, and he'll drop Case in dining. That'll force Forrest to have to rotate downwards. Psychosis pushing aggressively in the white hall as well. Forrest lands the kill on a semi, but MX Reaper trades on that other downstairs player, but what? Forrest just spams through the wall and catches MX Reaper rotating. That's a feel bad moment for the castle, and the nade comes in lighting up goons even more two versus two hp though in the advantage of west garfield and they've got a whole minute to work the vertical because biologic is still alive also spot out z rotating over towards the stage with this twitch drone forest has the info he knows these players are pretty far afield from the case this is a free pickup for him and biologic is upstairs looking to cover that plant only he'll drop He'll take the site control. He sees the opportunity. Now it's going to be more difficult for the defenders to try and come back. Boons is coming in from the hallway side of things. Z inside a meeting. He catches Forrest on the rotate, looking for Bio. He can't land the pre-fire. Bio, he tries going for the pickup. No, he's trying to pick up the case. But Forrest's body was in the way. He'll have to team kill. And now he's in the 1v2. He'll just narrowly miss Z, moving in the split. And the time is not on his side. This round might just be over by virtue of the clock. As now he's on stage behind the table in comes Z. He can see the hammer. He knows exactly where Bio is, and that's not going to go the way of the sledge. He gets one, but Goons is just around the corner for the trade, and Eclectic tie us up 2-2. Two to two. Uh, That's one of those rounds that West Garfield certainly wants back. You have Goons on 1 HP, and yet let him kill Forrest as you retreat through Kitchen. It was bold, and it seemed like a smart decision to drop down into Kitchen, given that they could take the control, but one thing they didn't realize is because they only had two players left alive, they couldn't maintain control of any other part of the map. And that means now they've put themselves in the middle of Kitchen, a room that can be surrounded from like three different sides. You've got the green hall, the rotate into meeting, and you've got the two security soft walls. You've basically put yourself in a death trap. And because not only one, but both players dropped down and took up a position in Kitchen, they found themselves quickly very vulnerable Defender to several players as they worked their way through and just tried to go for the flank. Had they planted in Kitchen quickly and maybe repositioned in Dining to hold the post plant, maybe that could have been a good decision. But because they dropped into Kitchen only to then run through the entire site, they exposed themselves to too many angles, and the result of that is one player got picked off. At that point, it was a 2v1. Almost impossible, really, for that one to be won. 
Eclectic did very well to hold on there. I'm surprised Goon survived as long as he did as well. But now they'll go, uh, now they'll go back downstairs. They have struggled with this site massively so far, but we'll have a drastic playstyle change now. And this might be what Eclectic need. They will establish a realm. No more free control for West Garfield. Eclectic are looking to push out, aided by these castle barricades, restricting the access for West Garfield. You've even got a top floor roamer, the Duke of, or sorry, the Vigil of Duke, lording over dorms. And West Garfield might have a bit of a tougher time pinning these people down, but they do have the Jackal. So at the very least, the Vigil will not be able to hide from everyone. All right, they've got the Jackal and the Nomad. Forrest making uh, the adjustment from the Twitch over towards the Nomad and bringing those air jabs. It seems that they saw through this decision that Eclectic were going to make perfectly because they brought the perfect counter. Theoretically, the Never perfect counter die. for this setup. The air jabs to lock off those rotations and the Jackal to pin down these pesky roamers like Duke and track them down, forcing them eventually to rotate back to the site. They've spotted out Duke and he's been forced to get the heck out of there. He's now backed off to tower, maybe going for a little bit of a retake here, but as long as he's being pinged by that Jackal tracker, he is not going to be able to step up and get aggressive. Right now, though, West Garfield, they're trying to abbreviate this clear just a bit. They've got two players upstairs, but they're now trying to pressure into security, and they're going to do so perfectly. Bio collects that kill onto Reaper. Now, Z is able to get a trade, though. I believe he's peeking up. But either that was top of freezer stairs or that was through the freezer hatch. Either way, a very important kill there because there's your Nomad now dealt with. Yeah, and that was actually a good angle from Bio to get MX Reaper. That was actually through the floor looking into the uh, security hatch. So MX Reaper unable to escape. Even four versus four, but you've still got this Vigil of Duke to worry about unless he rotated back down to the site. Those Jackal pings, yeah, okay, he's in Pillar now. So, I mean, while he might not be droned out because he's the Vigil, that's still a pretty standard position to hold, so I doubt he'll stay hidden forever. We're now down to just about a minute left for West Garfield to play with. They're not looking terrible. They're looking pretty good as they continue to take this control. They'll drone in through Feaser and spot goons rotating through the head holes. Castle Barricade on Laundry will also go down. That's where Bio is currently playing. Rudy with Diffuser. I wonder what his plan of action is. It looks like he's going to be dropping security, it looks like, as he's kind of hovering above the hatch and droning currently. He'll flash down, try and make way for some nades, and this could find its mark. Yeah, goons can't get away in time. Wait, actually, he lives? I'm surprised he survives that nade. He doesn't survive the peak from Psychosis, and there is no trade just yet. In fact, Z will be the next to go down. Finally, Duke comes in. He saves the day so far. Bio, the next to fall thanks to the gas canister, but Barring wades in and fells the smoke. Now it's just Duke, he downs one. He's got the shield to play with, but Rudy knows where he is. He's trapped in the mirror closet. Duke's gotta push out, but no, he's just gonna hold him. There we go. Another kill for Duke. He, the, pretty much the only thing standing in the way of West Garfield, will win the round and take the advantage for Eclectic. Yeah, and pretty much the only reason Eclectic won that round. Their defense was crumbling. It was falling apart at every turn, but Duke just holds down the site by himself, getting the kills he needed, and he got a little bit of an assist from the smoke canister, so that's something but really just locking that one down and, and very surprising. I mean, sometimes as a vigil, you're forced in the early round to make a decision. Do I want to keep roaming and try to force the issue and take a gunfight? Or do I want to rotate back and play with my team on the site? Sometimes, though, it's just nice to have another gun on the site and you can make your impact in the late round. And Duke just proved that. Didn't get too aggressive on the roam. Despite being scanned by the Jackal, he didn't get killed. He backed off and played it safe to, to clutch up the round and win it for his team. Had he died early, had he peaked, and even had he traded early, he would not have been alive to clutch up the round in the way that he just did. That is why it is so important to play safe and get back early. And with that, for the first time here on Oregon, Eclectic will take the lead. In our earlier series, West Garfield against Wichita Wolves Academy, we saw how quickly West Garfield ran away with it when they entered their defensive half with that 3-3 three three split. If Eclectic can take this fourth round here, they won a round right then that they were not supposed to. They've done their job. They've just got to take dorms. If they can do it, I'd give them more than a fighting chance on their second half. Yeah, that's the thing. We we really can't count out West Garfield even if they go down four, uh, even if they go down four two here, just because of how good they've been on the defense. They took the four two defensive half last time on Cafe. 
and then uh, actually took their attacks in overtime, curiously enough. But we'll see how this last round of the half treats us. Psychosis on Armory. West Garfield looking to probably make a very similar push to the last time they took top floor. Uh, in through Armory, then, you know, moving through Master into Trophy, Open Master Breach, what have you. But the person who was running amok and the sole, or one of the sole reasons why Eclectic was able to win their previous Storm's defense, Goons, will get taken out very early on. It looked like he was peaking the game's window. He was able to get a 3k on the previous attempt, but he'll be the first pick here. And we see Psychosis using that Yana clone to work his way up into Trophy, see if there's anyone in there contesting early. Don't believe anyone is in Trophy proper, but there is somebody down below to deal with. At least until a moment ago, there were actually two players, Duke on the Aruni and a Reaper on the Goyo, both eager to just get into some early fights and surprise Wes Garfield with some aggression. I don't believe Reaper has been spotted, but there should be an air jab on split. I did just hear it detonate, so somebody should have an idea that Reaper is down below. Forrest will now step up. He knows where Reaper is positioned, but Reaper was more than prepared to take that fight. And because Forrest was not only peaked the wrong way, but because he was alone, that's a free kill. And it will not go traded initially. Instead, Wes Garfield, they're too busy focusing on the site and considering there is still a minute 20 left not dealing with Reaper, that may have been a bit of an oversight. We'll now be able to get back to the site for free, and Wes Garfield, instead of facing you know, a 4v3 on the site, it is likely going to be a 4v4, or it'll be a 4v3, but then there's going to be a C4 from Reaper down below to worry about. Yeah, Reaper at least is damaged, but like you said, that's not too much of a solace if that C4 finds its mark. Barring is looking to fast push Attic here against Semi, who's hard holding this window with the shotgun. The Zofia, even if he adequately stuns out his opponent, will probably still die here, but Rudy, he's waited his way on in. Here's the plant attempt. Duke finishes off Psychosis, but the plant is going down. C4 is in the wrong spot. Bio's on the hunt as well. He kills MX Reaper. Duke able to kill the planter, and Barring can't make any success. An attic. At least biologic alone. He's got to cover the plant against three different defenders. And as Duke starts going, wow, Semi whips around. I thought he was going to get caught off guard because he started looking the wrong way. But Bio is no more. And Eclectic take a 4 2 half. What a way to bounce back for Eclectic. Taking three in a row when it looked so improbable. I mean, starting with that last basement win. Winning on a site that they haven't won before. Winning it on a round where they really weren't supposed to win. They go ahead to dorms and they make it look easy easy. West Garfield seems that they may have gotten a little bit flustered towards the end there. They didn't know exactly what to do about the player down below. And so when it came to positioning for that post plan, everyone was a little bit all over the place, especially I believe it was barring over on Attic. He had to jump in, otherwise he would have not been able to really help in the post plant. But he had somebody watching that window. Semi was sitting there extremely patiently waiting until he knew that barring had to jump in so he sat there even after the bomb had gotten down when barring thought oh semi for sure he's got to fall off this angle no way he can still hold me semi was waiting with a shotgun he took down the zofia he shut down barring i mean barring has been pretty much shut down so far this map only four and five right now when he dropped 21 on the previous map so eclectic they've found something that works they're doing it so far to a pretty high standard here on west garfield's map pick of oregon but now, West Garfield go on the defense, and we could see a very different story. I mean, West Garfield's defenses have been fierce on this map, and you've also got Forrest on the FO-12. He has been truly demonic with that weapon, not something I would want to go up against. West Garfield also bringing the Mira that Eclectic had kind of shrugged off despite her being left up. Some teams just simply do not like Mira because they force you to play a certain way and Eclectic obviously didn't want to. We've also got on Eclectic, the Lion rather than the Nomad as their flank watch. So that means Eclectic probably want to take fast and take hard on their roam clears. And you've got Goons, the Flores. So all that utility from West Garfield, the Jaeger and the Womai will likely be bypassed. I mean, they are, they're only taking one shield from Forest, but still, I'm sure the Flores will come in handy. They continue to try and clear this room. They haven't found a kill just yet, but they also haven't lost any bodies. There's no one really to clear with the exception of Psychosis, who is in Garage. And actually, no, I just spotted Barring. I just realized his silhouette is all the way up towards Attic, so hopefully Eclectic have better flank watch than uh, West Garfield's previous opponents did. Well, West Garfield right now have three defenders extended and hunting for kills, but Psychosis is stuck in Garage. 
His position, I believe, is known. And there's nowhere he can go because he's being actively held by Duke, I believe, through a couple of punch holes. Now, West Garfield, if they can exploit this, maybe they can get a couple of kills here. But Psychosis is in a heck of a lot of trouble. And there it is. Finally finished off. Only able to land a bullet or two before eventually falling. Nobody else from West Garfield was near enough to play the trade. Instead, Barring chose to play that one safe. Rudy chose to play that one safe. So uh, uh -oh. now Barring's going to have to just step up like this. He'll spot someone out, but then choose to sprint through the hallway where he knows attackers have got to be positioned. And Reaper sitting in Z will collect a kill. It was essentially a trade, but that means that West Garfield are still down a man. Eclectic still with a 4v3 advantage. I also just realized, uh, Eclectic aren't taking uh, into E-Box. They have not open the hash despite Semi still being alive. I don't know if they're out of hard breach or maybe they're saving their hard breach for the mirror windows. I mean, just opening up E-Box will complete. No, he's got full utility. Literally just opening up E-Box will completely deny that position that Biologic was previously playing, but he's since scattered off over towards Harry Potter. He's got a C4 in his pocket, but now he's getting stunned out. Duke might know exactly where he is. They're worried about someone perhaps playing in Pillar, but of course there is no one there. Finally, Sammy will go to work and open up that hatch. Flash is coming in from Goons. He'll send in his first Flores drone. There is no shield in Elbow. That position is right for the taking if the attackers choose to go for. All three defenders have their eyes turned towards Pillar and Tower Stairs, though. With only 25 seconds to go, the attackers are going to have to get a move on. First, Forrest will take a body. Rudy, again, will get a trade after Forrest dies. Bio will actually put the favor in his team's pocket, but Duke gets the trade. Now we're in a one versus one. Bio is just around the corner, and Duke is sprinting. Bio takes advantage, and West Garfield win their first defense. Very clean hold. Again, West Garfield proving that it doesn't matter how few they have left alive. Whatever advantage that their opponents hold, they can still win out the round with discipline, and they just showed us that. They did not swing after losing those first two players. They all just buckled down. They stayed calm on the site, and they waited for Eclectic to make the move. Now, Eclectic, they were a bit slow in making that move. You highlighted the delay, the time it took for them to open E-Box, and because of that, the freedom that West Garfield had to maneuver on the site. And they, they knew they had that freedom. They could relocate. They could surprise Eclectic with their positioning. And as you saw in the end, Bio's positioning going unknown, they did surprise Eclectic a little bit there. Taking a couple of good gunfights through that soft wall facing tower stairs from Supply Room, winning that fight. Eventually, Eclectic did win that fight, but West Garfield started it off and got two kills. I mean, really... It was a good 3v4 hold, and West Garfield do a nice job exploiting their opponents in those, you know, disadvantage situations, whether that's a 1vx, 2vx, or 3vx. They have done a fantastic job in closing those rounds out. So now they narrow the gap to one. They're still down. Eclectic still hold the advantage here, but that is a round that Eclectic definitely want back. Five seconds to insertion. But like you said, at least they still hold a round advantage. They're going to have to be taking onto the top floor. Still exact same operators with the exception of the Twitch now being donned by goons. Figuring that uh, Flores last time didn't really do them too much. And while there's only one shield to deal with, so the Flores, while still useful, isn't really the best choice. You're going to find much more mileage out of other operators when there's so few shields being played. Psychosis looking for the pre-fire onto the white van. He'll land damage on the semi, but... Other than that, not much. Now, Eclectic are aware of the fact that a roamer is present downstairs. Whether or not they choose to deal with Psychosis, however, is another story. You've got someone positioned all the way by the shower halls and white side of things. That's going to be Z, looking for maybe a nade through the floor. Actually, no, it's just going to go into white stairs to deal with the barbed wire early on. Interesting. I like that. But uh, as Eclectic start to move in, there's really no contention. And the wall is going to go down pretty much for free. Although the nade comes up as Forrest lets out a C4. And never mind. Z will be ripped off the board very early on. Ooh, a little bit of a mute trick here. Forrest repositioning that. Not quite in time. Actually, it was in time. He got all of them that that mute jammer could cover. It couldn't cover that top left corner. So one pellet will go off just as Duke gets a kill of his own. And actually, Reaper gets a follow-up. Psychosis gives him the compliment there. But Rudy collects one at the same time. So we're still at an even man count here. West Garfield gave a couple of kills back, but they were able to get a trade in response. So still sitting even. 
barring at the top of white stairs both rudy and bio have since repositioned over in kids because eclectic they've got this wall open successfully and they've got control of games should they want to push in now barring's position at the top of the white stairs may be unknown but everyone knows where rudy is swinging them constantly trying to provide this coverage and there goes barring he's now been spot out as well so that's why goons is going to work his way down below a full minute to work with is ample time to reposition a couple of these attackers but you got to wait for your team. Reaper doesn't want to get too overeager and peek because, well, he's got somebody waiting for him. Both Rudy and Bio, they're wary of this push. And Goons is nowhere near to support this. So Rudy will get a kill, but Barring was felled just before. A couple of flashes will come in, and that's going to force Rudy and Bio to back off just the same. But here comes another Toxic Gas. Semi actually skirts on by. Rudy gets spotted out, so Semi collects the headshot, and it's going to be all up to Bio. No smokes remaining. His position in Attic is known. He'll be forced to swing out, and Goons will clean him up. That's round eight for Eclectic. I'm surprised Eclectic won that, actually. Uh, in the three versus three there, positioning was in the favor of West Garfield. But somehow, Barring exposes himself, and MX Reaper is allowed through the trophy door to grab that kill. Rudy playing a little bit more passive than he once was. I mean, we saw him repeatedly pre-fire and peek over towards that direction. I mean, he nearly grabbed the kill on the lion the first go around, but he allows MX Raper through. Sure, he gets the trade, but Semi now is allowed to move through. Bio has since backed off the shield, and that's the opportunity that the Hibana was looking for through the gas. It looked like the smoke just simply didn't see her. So Semi lands the kill onto Rudy all the way in the back of the bunks, and Goons is allowed up the white staircase. Although he wasn't able to help his team with that initial push, he's still there to cover the plant in time, and that's the most important thing. Bio walks out and gets caught. Well played by Eclectic. They hold on to that two-round advantage, and West Garfield will try this site once again. Yeah, they're going to head to dorms and go for the repeat here. Now, the one thing they're probably not going to be able to repeat is the early aggression and maybe the early picks, but they should be able to tidy up the site hold. Like you said, Rudy was unable to provide the coverage. He chose to play a little bit too passively, and maybe that wasn't communicated to the player sitting in games because maybe some issues with the comms there. That player ended up falling, and Rudy was not there to provide the trade. I mean, eventually, that trade was found but that life shouldn't have even been forfeit at, i mean at, at first right i mean just to begin with that player in games should have been fine because rudy should have been holding that cross but maybe rudy got a bit too passive maybe it was just a issue of timing regardless eclectic did a good job of getting around that hold goons i thought he was going to get himself into a bit of trouble by rotating around and taking so much time in doing so but the rest of the team they held their own on the site just fine, even in Goons' absence. So it's five to three. Eclectic continue to hold their two round lead here. Oh. So West Garfield, <laughs> they're gonna have to make somewhat of a change. Goons trying to get this Rotero drone through the window, but it's a little <laughs> too high. And he can't quite drop it down. During that exchange, Z will get felled by Forrest and that's going to be a wasted Rotero drone for Goons. I think he's going to try again from the roof. I was, dude, because I saw earlier, I saw the Rotero drone in the air going through that window. I was like, how the hell did he just throw that? You can't throw Rotero drones. It was from the roof, and then he, he gets it stuck on the window. That was uh, comically unfortunate there for the Flores. They also lose the opening pick on to Z, thanks to Forrest playing under a prepped white window. So, Eclectic lose the opening pick. You've also got Psychosis hitting the flank. And as far as I can see, as of right now, I don't believe there's anything watching it. C4 goes out from Forest, but it's a little bit premature. It does not land on anyone. As Psychosis will begin to make his move. Checking outside, there's no one there covering him. Never mind, Semi just, Semi just freaking what? drops. What? Okay. Semi just drops and catches Psychosis off guard. Duke as well, peeking into the site, will land the headshot on Rudy. So now the man advantage switches. It's now in the favor of Eclectic. The breach is open as well, and Barring's gonna push out, but Semi just pre-fires him into the ground. Apparently this Hibana has all the infel in the world. And now Bio and Forest, the SAS operators, SMG-11s and shotguns in hand, have to clutch a two versus four. Not sure why West Garfield were so insistent on just kinda getting themselves caught out and playing aggressively. Clearly Eclectic have the intel. Stop feeding into it, because now you're in 2v4. Now you've got a lot of work left to do. Forrest, his position is unknown, but he'll lose that okay. fight anyway, and Reaper will get both of them. Eclectic, take round nine in a beautiful fashion. Really good intel game.
destroyed the flanks, destroyed the aggression, and honestly just destroyed every last defender. Four players still alive. A dominant round to say the least. That moves them up to match point. Big ups to Semi for catching two of those. I mean, first of all, diving off the master balcony to kill a dude in lobby. Psychosis looked like he was already watching it. Semi still got that kill. Then you have Rudy, I guess, just overexposing himself, barring what it needing, what really needing to make a play to bring something back. But Semi had the info and just pre-fires that Jaeger down. And from there, well, MX Reaper just sprints into Attic. Forest isn't ready, and he lands both. That was a pretty straightforward round for Eclectic. I think you highlighted perfectly. It was West Garfield getting aggressive and Eclectic just having the info necessary to stop it, with the exception, of course, of that first kill on the Z. But they won the round. That doesn't really matter. Six to three, quite the lead here for Eclectic. Much more one-sided than Cafe. Remember, Cafe was all the way to round 15. That was 8-7 for West Garfield, but Eclectic here have a three-round lead. That is tremendous for them on Oregon. Now, of course, next will be Clubhouse. Another very linear map, but another map that both teams should know how to play adequately enough. Now, West Garfield did win this site the last go-around, thanks to some brilliant anchor play. Forrest is once again on the FO12, and Biologic has these mirror windows at his disposal. Last time, Eclectic were very slow in their clear, in their transition to site, but without really too much West Garfield roam, things should move a little bit quicker. West Garfield, I mean, regardless of this round, I mean, I mean they, they need three in a row. Three flawless rounds. They've got to complete a rotation here. And uh, they've only been able to win basement one time. There's no other site that they've found that uh, really is successful. That's a new bug. <laughs> um, but uh, with that shield destroyed, they'll have an easier time clearing out the rest of Elbow here. There goes the second one. That'll take care of the Banshee. These were Tarot Drones, always proving very effective at clearing out this utility from below. And so West Garfield will already be feeling this pressure. From above now, you've got Z dropping down from towers, so barring on the tower stairs, we'll have to be careful on this position. And Forest down below may not be safe as open as he once was. Eclectic are doing a great job of building up such early pressure. Only 60 seconds have transpired. You've got blue control pretty much in your hands. And now tower control is almost seized. Fortunately for Duke, one of his impacts is going to get caught by a, uh, well, my disc, but the second will not. Barring is looking to get aggressive, but he'll peel off after not finding that initial fight. You got Z on the Iana clone scoping out meeting, waiting for Semi to open up E-Box, which, again, the attackers do maybe later than we would have hoped, but... <laughs> At least this time it's coming within the first half of the round rather than in the last 45 seconds. So Eclectic can get a move on a little bit earlier. Goons, like you said, establishing himself outside of Bunker, looking to move in with those Rotero drones, do away with any utility that the defenders had uh, posted up. Semi will now join him, so they'll be able to duo push down there. MX Reaper looking like he wants to drop will start sending those flashes down. Forrest could very easily catch these players, though, with the FO-12, but there's no movement from the attack just yet. Perhaps a no, they're just waiting out for the Hibana to go and expose barrels a little bit as Barin gets the opening pick onto Duke. Nade gets sent in, but Forrest backs off, now attempting to re-engage with the FO-12. Barin has since pushed all the way up tower stairs, challenging by stage as Psychosis gets a kill on the goons. Now a three versus five. West Garfield looking like they're going to take their second attempt of this site just like they did before. With 40 seconds to go, Eclectic are scrambling now. Semi looking to retake Goons' position. MX Reaper holding in tower, waiting for someone from the attack to call some sort of push. Z will yet again make a mad grab for info, but he's only met with an FO-12, and that's not really going to do him much good when Forrest is eagerly watching that drop down. 20 seconds remaining now. Lion Scan goes out. MX Reaper dies as swiftly as he pushes in. Z will die next, and it's just Semi, and he can't even get one. West Garfield takes the defense flawlessly wow i mean they had to do a flawless rotation but it doesn't have to be flawless rounds when you do it i mean you don't have to win like that but hey they did and i gotta give a shout out there to forrest in particular who even though with the fo12 he didn't actually kill anybody dropping down ebox his presence there really got eclectic into a tizzy 
I mean, we saw it right in the mid round, about that 40 second mark, as you highlighted, Harrison. They were trying to get that E box wall open. They threw a bunch of flashes in. They wanted those ex Kairos pellets to get on that wall to open up the angle onto Harry Potter. They couldn't do that because Forrest was there. They also droned him out with a Yana clone to see, okay, what are we dealing with that's preventing us from dropping E box? Oh my God, wait, there's an FO 12 shotgun waiting for us around the corner. That pretty much told everyone on Eclectic that dropping down E-Box is dead. Because they were so focused on E-Box, Psychosis was able to tear them apart. Barring was able to reposition on the tower stairs, a dangerous position, mind you, basically trapping himself between T2 and the cutoff from Bunker as that push-in comes through, but got himself into a power position and freed up the remainder of that round, allowing themselves to get a lot of kills and Forrest really proving to be the crux of that one. He's got 10 kills so far, putting on a much better performance than we saw from him starting the night, clearly starting to heat up. In fact, the top frag for West Garfield right now. Eclectic, though, still have two rounds, so I'm sure they're not too worried about that. Again, that's the only site that they've lost attacking. Now they're probably very happy to go back up to dorms. Why are West Garfield defending doors for a third time? I couldn't tell you, but I guess they really don't want to go to one of the middle floor sites. Forrest is opening up a hole in Master, for whatever reason. No one's actually playing it. I mean, I guess you get some sort of an angle from below through the hatch, but um, I don't really know. That's a, a bit of a puzzler for me. Barring, though, is downstairs in Z, looking to challenge Classroom. Goons is once again trying to trickshot his drones through the window, and, uh, well, once again, he's unsuccessful. He'll try and send it through Freezer, but they will spot Varn below, so I guess the Terra drone at least does some work. As a Galactic look to continue to clear through, hopefully West Garfield don't get over-aggressive this time. For now, they're going to remain relatively passive despite being in aggressive positions at least rudy is directly below this hatch trying to swing on this psychosis in the meanwhile will pick up another kill just kind of tearing apart this attack from unknown places psychosis the madman and here comes rudy impact to follow it'll land just in time finishing off reaper as duke gets the trade good heads up play from the zofia but she will also take an impact to the face limiting her hp for the remainder of this round. It'll be a 3v4, so Eclectic still with a fighting chance, only one man down. And now the flashes are gonna come in. Forest forced to back away. Semi really wants to get a push going in through games. I mean, they've got ample time remaining. They don't have to get too antsy here. And they do still have six drones in play, only three of which can actively be controlled. So they do have the ability to take their time and figure out what they're dealing with. Duke just spotted out one of those yokai drones, so Bio will now have to see if he has another one to use. Unclear if he's got more intel to work with there, but now that we're under a minute, Eclectic know that they've got to start figuring out a plan of attack. They'll even use X Kairos to get a better angle on that yokai drone, if it's still there. Imagine Semi will probably shoot it in short order, and they'll open a small hole into Attic, cutting Forest off, making sure that at least if he runs to the doorway, Eclectic will know, and it won't be a surprise. They also know Psychosis is all the way in the back by Metal. Semi looking to make his way in. He'll follow Z the Iana. Z taking a little bit of damage, and he'll die to barring. Duke also now very lit up. It's just Semi in a one versus four. West Garfield turning their success on this side around. Semi gets one, but he's being lit up by all sides and Forrest will finally finish him from that hole he made in Attic now working against the attack and we are once again one round away from overtime. Yeah establishing a small hole like that is good but it's not great right it limits Forrest's mobility in Attic when you're trying to go for that push it makes him potentially worry about somebody covering it but if you're in a man disadvantage you don't necessarily have the power to have the manpower to allocate a gun to that angle. There's so many angles when you're going for that game's plant that two people should probably be covering the planter at any given moment, one from the breach and one from the trophy door. Once you establish that small hole, you no longer can stand on the trophy doorway because that hole would shoot that player. It's a good position, generally, and if you had a Thermite charge, maybe an Ace Selma charge, establishing a bigger hole would have forced Forrest to actually move into Kids instead of positioning an Attic, but a hole of that size actually ended up 
getting, uh, kind of throwing it, turning it around, actually, and, uh, punishing them rather than helping them out. Either way, Eclectic still have one more round and one more chance to win this one in regulation. A site that West Garfield have avoided consistently is finally going to come out here. We're going to see how they defend a meeting in Kitchen. Finally! West Garfield on a middle floor site. I, too, am itching to see how they do. Of course, they will have people on the top floor because this is a meeting defense, and you'd be crazy not to play the top floor. You'd be clinically insane. Eclectic are now uh, off the Hibana, curiously enough, and now running both the Maverick and the Thermite. MX Reaper has flexed off Lion now onto Flores. So a little bit of shuffling when it comes to the operator selection. Forrest is looking to get aggressive, and no one is watching this. The window is very clearly open. I, uh, what is with Eclectic and just not checking windows? MX Reaper is now dead. Your Flores dies with all four drones in his pocket. Hmm. F Forest has spawn peaked like almost every single defensive round, and you're still not checking your windows. That's a bummer. Bummer for Reaper. It's not goons this time on the on the Flores though, so you still got goons in play. Also a madman this game. He's on the Maverick instead, working his way over from the tower side of things. Doesn't necessarily have to open it up fully, as it, I do believe he is not going to actually open up the attic breach. Instead, just establish a couple of angles that they need to hold it and prevent somebody from taking that hatch. Actually, that hatch has been reinforced, oddly enough. So West Garfield cannot use it to their advantage. A bit peculiar into the way this site is normally held. So they're going to have to deny the plant from elsewhere. Most likely split or the rotation there from Kitchen. You can see Bio playing on and actually opening up a little bit further. But West Garfield to put themselves in a dangerous spot. I mean, without really Eclectic having to do much about it. Yes, West Garfield have a man advantage. But what can they do to stop this plant from actually going down? Well, it doesn't look like Eclectic are holding Attic at all. Which doesn't make sense, as I believe the hatch is closed. Gas grenade goes out. It won't do any damage to Semi, though. And if Eclectic have enough info, they should know the site. Well, the site was free, but Forrest has since moved up to the doorway. What? The All right. I don't know how that just happened, but it did. Semi lands a nice kill. Duke, very nice headshot across the site. Psychosis gets the refrag, though. And the defense has now established themselves over in the site to stop this breach play. Goons what? just spamming through the smoke at Psychosis, but Barring here, moving in through Attic, he's not held anymore. Bio peeking out, grab Semi, and there's the flank from Barring, bringing us to overtime. What could have easily been an eclectic victory is halted by hesitation. If only they had just pushed the site, they would have probably gotten that plant down. I'd love to chat with someone on West Garfield and them to explain explain the meeting reinforced strat to me again, um, because that one that one is interesting, and it felt like just like you said, Harrison, that had Eclectic gone for an earlier push, they could have gotten the plant down pretty easily. I mean, normally the hardest part about that defense or that attack rather is how do you cover the three angles at once? How do you cover the attic hatch? The split doors, there's two of them, and then the kitchen push. And hell, even a green hall push. All of those things are ways the attackers can use, uh, the, the defenders can use to deny the plant. Even the e-box hatch from basement, you can throw a C4 Defender, up from there. They had the basement covered as an attacking team. They had the attic covered. They didn't really have to worry about it too much, except for the flank, because the hatch was reinforced. All they had to worry about was split, kitchen rotate, and the green hall. And despite having four players up and enough manpower to do that, seemed like they waited a little too long to really make that push. That got them a bit too vulnerable to those smokes from Bio. It got them a bit too vulnerable to just Psychosis and his gun skill and the flank from Barring that eventually won out the round. Just like that, Wes Garfield have just sprinted their way to overtime, overcoming a three-round on match point, by the way. Eclectic were there. Deficit. Impressive stuff from them, and now they're on defense to continue their momentum. Ah, right, Galactic. Map could have been over, but nope. Z's having a really slow game. I wonder if that's hurting them at all. And, uh, oh, my. Oh, my God. I'm going to... 
John, I'm gonna scream. You, you have my permission to scream. <laughs> <laughs> they have done that! Every round! Just, it takes an extra, like, three to five seconds to just check the barricade. Check your windows. Check your doors. I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm about to do the whole, the whole definition of insanity oh, monologue from Far Cry Three. Like, it's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting Stop different results. West Garfield have spawn peaked almost every single defensive round in the series. What? All right, I'm done. That's all right. That's all right. Because Eclectic, I mean, they have, despite the shenanigans, they've been known to bounce back. We've seen them bounce back from this. All they've got to do is find one kill in West Garfield. I mean, they've been willing to swing and get aggressive, maybe over aggressive. And if Eclectic can punish that, this could be evened out very quickly. Like, look at Barring right now. He's like running his way all over towards bunker he wants to challenge somebody out there nobody from eclectic happens to be there right now but he's eager to find those kills right he knows somebody's coming from the tower stairs as well and he's eager to swing on that position all it takes is a couple of eclectic players here to bunch up and try to get that kill together now the nade from z should force forest back but it's not going to force barring anywhere he'll still he'll actually run up the tower stairs to take care of duke Bold move from him, but it'll pay off, and nobody else is there from Eclectic to find the trade. We now have less than a minute remaining, and these E-Box players are still stuck. They cannot drop. Every nade they throw down is getting burned by an Aruni Gate or a Jaeger ADS. And now they are scrambling. It's a 3v5, and Eclectic are running out of options. Reaper now throwing down one of his final Rotero drones. He's only got one more in pocket here. Maybe spotting out Psychosis, he could land a headshot here, but you gotta remember, barring he loves to run up the stairs. He'll get flashed, and he'll be forced to back off, so Reaper will go for the swing, and he'll successfully down the Jaeger. Now Z will join his teammate on this push, but this time from the bunker side, only to get fried by Forrest, who lines up two with the FO-12. Reaper last alive, Psychosis finishes him off, and that is another flawless basement defense for Wes Garfield. I just, I can't believe what I'm watching right now. I mean, Eclectic are just getting run over. First, it was the spawn peak. Then it was the kill, I believe, onto Duke. Then it was getting stuck on E-Box for, you guessed it, the nth time in a row that they've attacked that site. They always get stuck on E-Box and Pillar. Maybe push somewhere else. Maybe take a Ying. Maybe learn how to take pillar there's an idea i am so frustrated with eclectic right now at least they're on their defense they get to go to dorms uh dorms has worked out decently well for them so far this is probably their best chance to go on the seven seven match point i even saw i uh, because uh, i have discord on my second monitor because I'm on Serena's setup. I have two Better monitors now. It's awesome. I saw while I was yelling at uh, at Eclectic Connor, <laughs> Connor's sitting in the call with us. I think he can hear us casting through the through uh, Fermi's like virtual camera, uh -huh. and he t he turned on his webcam and looked at the cam. It was just nodding his head. So <laughs> NAL analyst Connor C. Depp Stapolonio agrees with me. That's how you know I'm right. And uh, well, Eclectic have one chance on their defense to bring us to max OT. Are we going to have two double max OT games in a row? Well, it falls on Eclectic to not troll this. West Garfield, they've been looking pretty good this match so far. They've got the momentum firmly on their side. They've won, what, four rounds in a row at this point, I believe. Yep, you're right. So, uh, hopefully Eclectic's mental ain't chalked. Two of those four rounds have been flawless rounds, by the way. Uh, both of the basement defenses, I believe, were, were crispy clean. Um, so, yeah. Tough one for Eclectic to make happen here. They are going to the defensive side, though. A side that they preferred in terms of overall round wins. They got the four they needed. So maybe this is where maybe this is where they can finally stop the bleeding and get the momentum back on their side. Or at least, or at least remember what it was like to win a round. Because it has, like you said, been some time. So as far as this roam goes, you've got 
Eclectic, once again, just trying to provide as much early contests towards West Garfield as they can, right? You've got Reaper positioned down in meeting, which, as you know, is not the site. We're up here on dorms, so maybe Reaper is hoping to catch somebody off guard and go for a bit of a flank later in the round. Bio will pick up the first kill. This one on to Goons, and that is a blow that Eclectic and Eclectic fans everywhere are going to feel quite deeply. That's Goons, who has been running all over this West Garfield attack, and he will be stopped from making an impact any longer in this round. I'm going to start Joker laughing. <laughs> like, oh, okay, C4 goes up. Rudy's on the bed, so it does not hit him. Eclectic cannot find an answer just yet. Nade goes out. Easy clear of the Goyo shield, so you no longer have coverage outside the kid's doorway. Psychosis looking to nab an early kill. Attic has been opened as well. Semi only has a shield to protect him, but the Hibana charges are going out on the wall behind him to make way for burns so they can destroy the uh, shield with a nade, likely coming from, well, not Psychosis. Actually, no, they don't have any more nades. Okay, so that shield is safe, at least for now. They can't actually get rid of it. Not quite sure why they would open that hole then, but I digress. Z is going to get aggressive. Psychosis will catch him because that's what Psychosis does best. Now it's a five versus three. Duke looking to try and take something back. He is now doubled up on this angle with MX Reaper. They really want to win whatever fight peaks that. We're now sub one minute. West Garfield are in prime position to start constricting this side as the breach gets open. And the only thing they don't have working for them is the frag grenade. They're at a nade, so they can't kill Semi here, but they're aware of his position. They probably know somebody is sitting in the back of dorms. Yes, they do, because Duke will take a bullet or two here. Now, Forrest, he's not really helping his team right now, but he's waiting for the optim opportune moment to strike here from the back. And when he does, you know it's going to be disaster for this player sitting in attic Semi, who does not know what's coming from behind. There goes Forrest. He'll get the kill. It's all up to Duke on 1 HP, trying to keep Eclectic's hopes alive here. But he's been spotted out, and Barring will hold left click, spraying with the LMG. And just like that, West Garfield take five rounds in a row, complete the 6-3 to three comeback defying match point, taking match point for themselves, they will be participating in SCS 6 split two. I believe our first team, possibly our um, second team, to earn that moniker. So congratulations to them. Second. They will be joining some stacked teams, and they are a stacked team of their own. And they proved it. They proved it tonight that they can hang, and they can adapt, and they can play very, very well. Uh, I am so frustrated with Eclectic right now. I mean, they... They deserve to lose that. I just, dude, look at your windows, please. <laughs> Learn how to play aggression, please. Goons like, looked like he spawn peaked on 7-6 match point and died. But either way, like you said, congratulations, West Garfield. They looked like they had a handle on things in their latter half of the attack. I mean, they won, what was it? They were down 6-3 and they won five rounds in a row. That is absolutely stellar from West Garfield. This experience showing that they, you can never count them out. And they will join, actually, the uh, only other qualified team so far is the Aerial Arise Pug Stack. Consisting of Wimpy, Valor, Kento, CZ, and then I believe uh, Aug and Rethinkin, who uh, both played in these quals. So we've got our two teams confirmed so far. Uh, both of them being Pug Stacks, funny enough. But uh, like you said, they join... Quite the talented lineup so far. So we only have room for two more teams. Chess Club versus Shadow Realm is going on right now, as is Achieve Esports versus Gusick. But regarding this game, I know we talked about Wichita Wolves Academy being uh, the hopeful from the group, but they looked pretty terrible. Then we have Eclectic, our stage one qualified team. They made it in through the first qualifier out of nowhere, but fortunately they can't get past West Garfield because they also didn't look great does seem like they are the caliber of team, though, that could make it through our second qualifier, right? There's going to be a lot of people Maybe. in there who really wanted to make it through this first one. But you've weeded out the top four, theoretically, and they came this close two games in overtime to what I thought was going to be one of the strongest opponents out there, West Garfield. They proved it in our standalone tournament. They've got a stacked lineup. It is a pug stack, yes, but it is a pug stack of all incredibly talented players with NAL, with CL experience, all of whom you know, our gunners in their own right. Clearly, they've mm. proved that here tonight. I think Eclectic, they're a name to keep an eye on going forward because they kind of came out of nowhere last split, defied expectations a little bit. And as bad as they closed here tonight, letting them just kind of almost a little bit of a reverse sweep, so to speak, they mm. still looked good for the most part. So 
little bit of a saving grace for them. But again, it is West Garfield. That is the team of the hour. They are the ones moving through. We will hopefully get a clearer picture on who will be joining uh, Air of the Rise plug stack and this West Garfield plug stack uh, when we get some clarity on those final two outcomes. We might be able to catch one of those games. Before we do that, we are going to take a quick break to assess. But before we go to a quick break, just another shout out. And finally, a shout out to our wonderful sponsor, Mike and Ike's. As you know, we've talked about them all night long. Mike and Ike, mega me up. You can get yourself a pack of Mike and Ike Mega Mix, a pack of Mike and Ike Original Fruits, or a pack of Mike and Ike Mega Mix Sour. Those are my favorites, personally. Big fan of the sour candies. You can you can take your candy game to the next level with a pack of either of these. They're delicious, fruity, chewy flavors. They can help fuel your game and keep power you up to keep playing at your best. You can power up. You can Mega Me up with Mike and Ike. So, uh, I mean, I highly recommend. Very delicious candy. And... Um, while you take a look at that, we'll actually pop up the bracket really quick to take a look at this as well. Of course, these are all our finished matches so far. Eclectic moving in towards West Garfield, both Eclectic and West Garfield taking two O's, and then West Garfield taking the two O, both in overtime against Eclectic. So while Eclectic didn't play the best, I think that does though, go to show that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with NAL-level talent, and we'll likely see them again in our playoffs in Stage 2 quals. Our only other qualified team so far is the Aerial Arise Pug Stack. So they took a 2-0 over Gremlins. I actually don't know who's on that squad. Let me check real quick. That is a oh, native Bix tragical area. A couple I've heard of Bix and tragical. Haven't heard of the others. So aerial rise taking the two O noob slayers who consist of people like, uh, I think Dolly stove, the man famous for running recruit in the entirety of CL quals and almost making it into CL teaming with uh, a lesser known player known as Pengu. Don't know if you've ever heard of him. <laughs> they took a 2-0 over, didn't ask. That, of course, is Delta Force, Swoof, Snoop, and company. And Ariel Arise actually taking the 2-0 to qualify. And, of course, that is not the Challenger League Ariel Arise. That is a Pug Stack Ariel Arise. So, actually, that's pretty funny. Ariel Arise, the Pug Stack, is an SCS, along with Ariel Arise Academy, who were also a Pug Stack. Wichita Wolves also have two teams in SCS. So... That's kind of cool. And of course, we are waiting on Chess Club versus Shadow Realm. Chess Club being uh, Gunner and Co. I think they've got, uh, what, Doc, Bills, uh, Mr. B, and Snake. They're playing up against Shadow Realm, who have the famous Shiba. As we saw from our last qualifier, Shiba is incredible. He's joined by Millie's Jolt, Kami, and I think Zoinkers is on that team as well. Uh, so I imagine Chess Club will probably win that, but Shadow Realm are probably close. And of course, Achieve Esports and Gusek Achieve Esports uh, actually qualifying for stage one. They had, you know, people like uh, Twizzler, uh, TPA, them, and Team Gusek, who uh, nearly made it in stage one. Yeah, Team Gusek. Uh... It was one of the teams like right on the edge, I believe, in stage one, but yeah. couldn't quite make it through. That's um, Amp, Teddy, Baxley, um, Unlimited, Needles, Tristan, EJ. Um, so, so, solid team there as well. Um, so we are, again, still waiting on those two outcomes, but when we know that, we will have a clear picture and we'll present that to you on stream who our eight teams are going to be. Um, for, I guess, we won't know every single team, but, and, but before we do that, we're going to do uh, our sweet play of the day here. Presented Ooh. by Mike and Ike, where Thank we you, take a look at our play of the day. I'm trying to think back. Did we have an ace today? We didn't, did we? Um, we had a quad no. kill. We had, we had a couple of yeah, quads. Yeah, we had a couple quads, but I don't think we got an ace at all. I don't know. Who's it going to be? Ah, ah. the goons 4K. <laughs> goons. All right, this was pretty incredible. Okay, I got to see this shot. Wow, he kind of he almost like clipped him through the edge of the wall. Which, fun fact, are wall bangable, so it is entirely possible that he got that kill there. Psychosis just getting dumpstered on bottom white. I don't know if Goons had info. I mean, maybe it was just a sound call. That's possible too. That uh, whoever was playing on white, I think it was Duke, just heard that player and called it out to Goons. I don't know. It's like Psychosis had a ping. I'm pretty sure we saw the ping. 
Uh, but he just didn't quite shoot quick enough. I mean, Goons was just too quick on the trigger. I don't exactly know. So Goons got Goons got a quad in this round. There was a lot of pressure being applied towards White. This is what uh, they Eclectic did just so wonderfully is that despite you know the pressure being applied by West Garfield constantly on this uh, the west side of the map here. I mean, Goons just denied it outright with this shield. He was joined by Reaper. I mean, obviously you lose semi here, but then Goon steps up takes down the player on the window. He knows there's other players coming from below and he just prevents barring, like doesn't even sorta let barring up the stairs. Like three different occasions, I think it was it was like barring Rudy and Bio all tried to pressure the same staircase and Goons was just like, no, you're not having it. Denied Dude, it constantly. The timing here. The timing here is hilarious, but barring also like that stun, I mean, I'm pretty sure that was an impact actually. It hit the wall and didn't catch the shield. And yeah. that's what potentially could have changed this course of the round. Had the shield popped to that impact there, maybe Barring just had it too far left on the wall, it could have been a very different situation for Goons. Yeah, and then Bio here actually gets caught with the flashbang. Despite the pre-fire coming down, both of the attackers looking the complete wrong way, and Goons, oh, he was so close! He was so close to the ace! Literally, like, one more bullet, and we would have had a Goons ace there, but MX Reaper just had like, to go yoink. and steal it. Because of course he did. Of course he did. That's why Eclectic lost because uh, Goons didn't get that ace there. But uh, that was an incredible play. Unfortunately, could not win the map for them though. It ended up going 8-7 in the way of, uh, what do you call it, of West Garfield. Map two went 8-6 and uh, Fermi in our ears actually let us know we might have map three of Achieve versus Gusick coming up. All right, um, that should be an exciting one. Uh, is, is Achieve the identical roster that Oh, it's we Coastline. Yes. No, we I do. don't think they have. Tr uh, let me look on the battle fight. I don't think they have Tracken anymore. Uh, they have. So it's TPA, Twizzler, and Morocco. And instead of Tracken and. I think it was Riot. They have Maxily and Exum. I'm pretty sure. that's That was the last, like, scoreboard screenshot I saw on Twitter. And they're all listed on the active roster for. Um, on battle fight? So. Right. That could be that could be interesting. I think the Gusick roster is also relatively the same, except instead of um Oh, what was his name? Nar. That's who it was. Remember the smoke and nomad who would always drop double digits? They don't have Nar anymore. I think Nar quit. And now they have Oh, who is it? Needles? Yeah, Needles. Yeah, Grave just added me. Yeah, Needles is playing. All right. Well, we are going to take a quick break before we uh, get this game going. We'll just cue this one up. And when we uh, come back, we've got Achieve. We've got Gusick. Final map of the night, hopefully. And uh, we'll see who makes it in the SCS 6. See you in a moment. B3, make that a 1v2. Two seconds left. It's going to come down. Reaver making a third as he looks up. Make it up. He finds the drop three. A stunning here. Welcome to the Nerd Street Winter Championships, featuring SCS6, a yearly open tournament series hosting the best players and teams North America has to offer, culminating in a community favorite, the Pro-Am. So let's discuss format. During the Winter Champ season, SCS6 will consist of two stages, where each stage begins with two open qualifiers. Once Stage 1 is complete, there will be an additional tournament offering one more qualification spot prior to Stage 2. Through participating in SCS 6, players will acquire leaderboard points and cash prizing. The winning teams from Stage 1 and 2, as well as the additional tournament, will qualify for the Pro-Am. The top two teams from the leaderboard will also qualify. As we approach the end of the season, the final qualification spot will be determined through a last chance qualifier. 
The grand finals of the Winter Champs SCS 6 will feature the return of the Pro-Am, where the top amateur teams have an opportunity to define their talent against the North American Pro League. But in the end, only one team will be crowned Winter Champs. Sign up today and make history. There once was a tournament during the season of snow, filled with contenders of might, with names Dees, Ligma, and Joe. The road was a trying one, wrists aching with cramps. In the end, victors rose. We call them Winter Champs. Before they departed, they left us these words. Our journey's just begun, all thanks to the nerds. It's gonna come down. We're making a third as he looks up. Make it up. He finds the draw three. A stunning here from the Welcome back. We were just finishing getting everyone in the lobby, but we can discuss a little bit more about this match. Again, it's gonna be Achieve Esports versus Team Gusick. They've already played two maps. They're tied up at one to one. And Jonah, we'll be moving on to map three, but it's no Oregon, it's no Cafe. We get Coastline. Thank God. Oh, wow, we got to skip Cafe in Oregon. <laughs> I am so happy. That would have been brutal had we had a third Oregon of the night. Uh, but no, we've got Coastline. We've, we're ending with uh, hopefully one of the most exciting uh, matches uh, of the night. I mean, these two teams clearly neck and neck as they traded maps back and forth. So heading here to Coastline, I would expect the same thing. The beauty about this map is that, you know, if you know what or not, it's a frag heavy map, regardless of how you play it. And uh, hopefully these two teams, teams should be just going at it and just seeing you know, which one is going to make SCS. It's map three. The winner is into stage two of SCS. The loser will have to try their hand at our second qualifier. And uh, yeah, they're going to be really bummed out if they don't make it. And it looks like it was 7-4 for Achieve on Cafe, 7-5 on Oregon for Gusick. So it looks like each team took their respective map picks. So Coastline should be interesting as it plays very differently from either of these two previous maps. And looking at the rosters, I got the Achieve roster correct. It is Twizzler, TPA, Morocco, and then Exum and Maxley, whereas Gusick so they have unlimited Baxley and Teddy. We already talked about Needles coming in for Gnar, but it looks like they don't have Amp as well. They have Tristan. So whether or not Tristan is a, I think he's a sub. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe he's a permanent addition to the roster. I'm not quite sure. What I do know is that in the past, in Guzik's past games, Amp has been a player to watch. That guy, most of the time, of course, he's a, he has an off map here and there, but most of the times, that guy is, quite frankly, incredible. So in my opinion, Tristan, actually, Tristan and Needles have some pretty big shoes to fill. Yes, especially if, I mean, if indeed he is stepping in as a sub, I don't know, you know, how much experience he's got with this roster. Mm. That could be a factor. Clearly, it worked well for them in the first map, at least, or the second map, as they were able to take their own map pick, but not their opponents. Um, but we'll see how they shake things up on coastline here. Right off the bat, we've got our first operator banned through and it is going to be the lion. A little bit unusual, but considering it's coastline, it's not totally unheard of. Lion is incredibly powerful on coastline and very commonly picked. Now the Yana is more surprising given how prominent she is on every attacking team. Almost everyone likes to run her. She offers so much in terms of utility and information and just simple burn of those Aruni gates if we see that, but she will not be a factor here. No, and neither will Valkyrie, a much more standard ban on this map, and really, again, every map in the pool. Valkyrie bans at this point are like Thatcher bans. Mira might be banned here, though she's not always the most popular operator on Coastline. We might see something crazy from one of these teams. No, okay, all right, it's just gonna be Mira. So, 
Man, it's pretty standard with the exception of that Iana, but it still does make sense, especially with Achieve we've seen before play very aggressively, and taking that Iana off the board might just kind of hamper that a little bit. Could be a target ban, especially if the Iana player uh, was going crazy on the first two maps. Maybe Gusu just don't want to deal with that again. Zofia, though, is still left up, as is the Ash. We'll likely be seeing one of those two operators every round, and I was just about to mention maybe even the Jackal as an entry operator. In fact, we have Zofia, Jackal, Sledge, Buck, and Finca. Five operators that could all effectively function as an entry. Gusick obviously wanting to play aggressively, though Needles will... No, not swap off the Sledge. It looks Attack like he'll actually stick that. So, quite the aggressive lineup for the attackers. I hope we're in for a fast coastline, as those are always fun. Achieve, though, on the defense. They'll start out on Kitchen, and they, as well, are taking a similarly aggressive defensive lineup. They've got the Mutant and the Mozzie for the Drone Denial, who have very capable kits for aggression. The Thunderbird, who's got that rifle, three-speed C4. We talk about her a lot. And those Kona Stations. If you're a roamer, if you get lit up, you can go back to the site heal yourself that early damage it's pretty much done and dusted the jaeger we know how he is with the 416c and of course the oryx tpa loves this guy he doesn't just play it on aggressive maps like coastline he's looking to maneuver around the map as best he can and hopefully catch team gusick off guard right and the combination of the oryx and the thunderbird is always something really powerful to see right because the oryx i mean tpa is purpose here is to run all over the map, cause chaos, and be extremely mobile. In doing so, you often take a fair few amount of bullets as you're scampering away, as he sprints by a doorway. Maybe he'll catch one bullet to the back, but if you've got a Kona station in the mix, all you gotta do is find the nearest corner with a little bit of a heal box in there and just voila, you're back to full HP. But you never know. I mean, if he puts himself in a position like this behind the lobby desk, he may not survive for long. But as I say that, he will pop right up and take the head of Needles in a clinical opening blow for this Achieve Esports defense. He's actually not going to leave either. He's hungry for another. There is one player outside that main lobby as well to find that trade. And there's somebody in security to provide that cutoff. Either way, TPA is able to escape he will live to fight another day. There's someone upstairs as well, though I don't think the Aqua Hatch is open. Teddy's going to be under fire from the Jaeger of Twizzler, who quickly darts away. But now you have Exum coming into support from Cool Vibes. Maxley as well, holding a 90-degree angle on this rotate as Tristan finds a nade kill on Twizzler to even up the man count. And there's Tristan a second now, coming in from Mudroom. So the clear... Although losing needles early gets two kills back in the attacker's favor. Four versus three, they lead by a man. They could even go upstairs and apply vertical presence with unlimited as he is the buck. They have that redundancy despite needles being taken out early. And Baxley on the jackal looking to scan these footprints. Might come under fire from Exum if he peeks in too close, but it's actually TPA looking to land some shots down. He'll tussle with, or with Baxley, but not land any shots. But finally, he peeks out. Down goes the Jackal. We're back to even. Aggression from TPA. It's working so far. He is two for two on gunfights he's taken. He's won them both. And shut down two very impactful operators so far. But the thing is, Gusick has five operators, all of whom are incredibly potent when in the right hands. And well... Looks like one of them will finally step up and respond. Unlimited will take down TPA. The Oryx finally fell, but Exum is there to find a trade as well. Now, Exum trying to rotate back to the site will get lit up by Tristan, but Morocco provides the support, and then he's there again with the SMG-11. Morocco gets a double kill to close out the round. TPA starts it. Morocco concludes the round, and that is a great way to start for Achieve. Well played to Achieve. Again, just playing super aggressively. I think, you, I think just... Judging by that first round, it looks like we're going to have quite the fast coastline. TPA peeking up from reception right out the front door, then getting another kill by the front door before finally getting traded out. And on the site, Gusick just didn't really do enough in and around the map to take that control and dislodge any anchors. They were just pushing into already held positions. I have to imagine if they decided to go upstairs with Unlimited, they could have perhaps found a kill or two through the floor or at least facilitated that window jump in a little bit better. But they focused solely on the horizontal and it ended up punishing them. Now it's Penthouse Theater for the defense. The offsite 
of this map has started to come back into favor because of that VIP change. You can now anchor in that room, or because it's a reinforced wall, you can even deny the attacker's entrance there, perhaps even restricting them to just VIP. And Achieve will even be bringing out the Echo this time. Team Gusick as well will swap off the Sledge. Needles is now on Nomad to hopefully restrict some of that rotatability we saw last round. All right, VIP really does change up the way this entire map plays, not only this site, but it's going to be so pivotal for the defense to hold this and for the attackers to take that control. If you can't control VIP, you can't get that penthouse wall open, and, well, you can't get that crossfire between the penthouse wall, between that guitar hall of fame hall and that penthouse window. So we'll have to see how Gusick want to approach this one, if they want to maybe enter from below and work their way applying some pressure from beneath in Kitchen, or if they just want to enter through Aqua, through Billiards or Hookah and clear their way across from there. Maxley, though, will be getting aggressive, much like TPA in the previous round. This time it is the Jaeger who gets aggressive, takes an early fight, Tristan on the Finca, just trying to rappel up safely to the Aqua Balk, but that is not going to be allowed to happen. Now Team Gusick are being forced to scramble once again. Now, not only have to get this kill back, but they've got to somehow get a handle on these roamers and these defenders who are going to be running all over this map and without much of a care in the world. Now, well done to, uh, to Max to get that opening pick. And that's on the Finca. Finca got two kills in the previous round. In fact, the opening two kills, that's also a lot of those, you know, those boosts, nades, gone six off the board. And TPA, despite being stunned out by the Zofia, still lands a very nice pre-fire onto the head of Teddy. Bax, as well, is taking a lot of damage and luggage while tussling with Maxley. And he's going to have to walk away and lick his wounds, coming out worse for wear in that engagement. Needles throwing in even more stuns. We'll get caught by TPA. Once again, this will mine, not afraid to take these aggressive fights over the shield, despite the amount of utility coming at him. Now it's just Unlimited and Baxley in a two versus five. They still have not dealt with this shield, and Impact will go out and deal just a sliver of damage to Unlimited. But Baxley's gonna get spotted by that Yokai drone, and now they know he's trying to hit the back over towards Luggage. Unlimited will fell Exum, but is that gonna be enough to turn the round in his team's favor? We've got a minute 20 to play with, but again, TPA sits stalwart behind this shield, and Baxley doesn't have enough presence here to push in and take control of this hallway, especially because someone's sitting in vase. Baxley just waiting to push in, but Maxley knows this position is held. Maxley's got a ping, though. Could work with it. Maybe trying to bait it out with a smoke. Just covering that angle. Sees two down the long haul, but they're going to line him up. Just too many heads popping out of corners, and there was nothing he could do but fall to them one by one. Great round from Achieve, started with aggression, ended with aggression, and that is really what seems to be the benchmark of this defense. It's not easy to defend on coastline, but when defensive teams find success, it is often due to unpredictable roam, unpredictable aggression, and their ability to just outfrag their opponents. So far, two rounds in, Achieve clearly on the top in terms of the frag department. 3k for TPA sitting in pretty much the same spot the whole round two. Gusick did a poor job of trying to clear that shield in 90, which should not have been that hard. And yet they still lost two lives just burning. Didn't even get to the point where they could send explosives down that way. Now she will go on to Hookah. Got <laughs> Very similar lineup, only Max Ali is now on the Malusi. It's Twiz picking up Jaeger. Uh, they'll finally drop the Thunderbird. Guess they just don't need it for this site. Maybe not as much roaming. They're reinforcing all the way over towards VIP. And because Gusick aren't bringing any hard breach, not even a hard breach charge, I think Unlimited is taking uh, stuns, as he has been in the recent rounds. Maybe VIP is a little bit harder to take. At least that crossfire is going to be robbed of Gusick. Again, just because there's no Hibana and no hard breach charges in play. Unless Unlimited spawns and he's got those in his pocket and he just happened to switch from stuns. Or maybe I just didn't catch it, then that's on me. But... I don't believe he does. No, yeah, he is bringing stuns. I'm right. So there is no hard breach at all. And without that VIP crossfire, this might be a little bit harder for Achieve. Or sorry, for Gusick. Other way around. Yeah, I mean, Gusick, clearly they've had a tough time with it so far. Just getting in the building, right, without finding an opening, uh, opening death. So that is something they will have to remedy here. Just approach the building a little bit more methodically. Check your windows, check your corners, make sure you're not going to get spawn peaked. Tristan is doing that here, wary of somebody popping out behind the uh, 
office wall here, but nobody is in office. Nobody's in blue bar. No one's even really in this entire floor. Everyone on the defense is upstairs, whether that is in the site itself, two of them, or extended over towards master, uh, master and VIP. They are still on the top floor looking for frags from above. A frag from Tristan will work its way from below, but TPA will stay alive as he tries to now relocate on the site above because he knows he's been spotted to some degree. There's also a Jackal in play, right? So those pings are constantly identifying the location of, I believe, it was Exum over on the top of those luggage stair, man, the main stairs here. So he'll have to be wary of, again, the pressure from below. Because of that, he'll be supported by Maxily, so they'll make sure that no one can get caught off guard. But TPA will finally get taken down. The combination of the pressure from Tristan and Unlimited, the skeleton key, opening up the floor of that pink bar area and shutting him down. That's a good first frag. Top frag of the lobby, now dead. Wonderful stuff from Unlimited. You take the one eye off the board as well, making those shields a little bit more exposed. But more importantly, Unlimited now has free reign of the downstairs, and he can buck in from below. Make those defenders on site a little bit more uncomfortable as the rest of his team looks to work their way by white stairs. But Bax looks away just at the wrong moment, and Exum takes advantage of it, swings on, and get, finds the late trade and the equalizer now at four apiece but twiz just decides to sprint in the middle of the hallway dies to teddy on the rappel and now we're back to a one-man advantage here for gusick leading into the last 50 seconds maxily is downstairs but he doesn't have a c4 so there's not really much he can do from this position as unlimited finds yet another kill but he will run out and frag teddy on the rappel so big window no longer covered here for the attackers in comes tristan though with the case Curiously enough, looking to get aggressive instead of plant, Needles looks completely the wrong way and dies to the player in Vase. Unlimited is also down downstairs thanks to Maxley, but Tristan puts us in a one versus one. Maxley now, after he finishes off Unlimited, is looking to come up cool vibes. Needles will be healed though thanks to that Finca Blast, and Needles is looking to find the kill. Maxley not looking the wrong, or not looking the right way, and Gusick take round three. The difference there for Achieve is that the aggression we saw from them, it didn't really come out in the early round, like those first two rounds we saw. It came out more towards the end of the round, in the mid-round. And what that did is it just got Team Gusick a little bit more comfortable. It had given them a little bit more map control, and all of them, they were supported by a teammate in some capacity or another. Which meant that even when that mid-round aggression came out, and even if Achieve were able to find a kill, Gusick were there to find the trade. Now compare that to the aggression in the first two rounds, where Achieve just started swinging and shooting the moment the action phase began. Guzik could not trade those back, and they were a lot less prepared for that. I get the adjustment that Achieve were trying to make, right? They assumed, rightly so, that Guzik would be a lot more prepared for that aggression than they had been in the first two rounds. Completely understandable, and that was probably true. Gusick were probably approaching the building a lot more methodically than before and a lot more disciplined. The difference, though, is that in the mid-round, when Achieve eventually decided to step up and get aggressive, I think it was Twizzler who we saw kind of just run past Vase into Billiards and just sprint on around the hallway, right? That mid-round aggression or that kind of poor decision-making, whatever you want to call it, Gusick was ready for that. They had somebody staffing that angle and they were prepared to deal with a move, a maneuver like that. That's the difference. Achieve just waited maybe a little bit too long and the strategy that had worked for their first two rounds, they decided to tone it back. And that's when Gusick stepped up and took the round. And yeah, they were able to control the aggression of Achieve a lot more easily. Someone spawn peeking. Who is that? Is that TPA? No, it's actually Maxley on the lesion. He'll just settle for a drone and skate away. We got Kitchen once again where Gusick had a pretty rough start on this site. It looked like they were starting to bring it back, but that early disadvantage really came back to bite them, and that was at the hands of TPA playing by reception. We just heard Max open up the barricade a little bit. He doesn't see the player by the blue window, though. If that player is still there, it is. He is. Unlimited was just sitting there, and Max, uh, unfortunately, was not able to capitalize, but he'll continue to sit behind the Sunrise Bar, generating those goo mines and such. Unlimited is also worried about that hatch, but he should be more worried about TPA holding this vertical angle on the window, and I don't think Unlimited is aware of that. 
Because right now, I mean, Unlimited is tunnel visioned on Max Lee's position, trying to provide the comms for the entire team to deal with this. And there it is. I believe TPA, yes, from above will take down Teddy. He just was not ready for that. Wow. Now TPA will now step up and get a second. A double kill for him. And there goes Unlimited. Now it's a 3v5 with Gusick on the back foot. This is that early round aggression I was talking about. Putting Maxley and TPA in forward positions, in aggressive positions that force Gusick to do something about it at the onset of the round. They hadn't gotten comfortable yet. They hadn't been able to take map control yet. And as such, they lost two kills just to the same player in an instant. Now they'll get one back. Tristan from this blue bar window will take down Exum, who was caught out in main lobby there. Good long angle as well, as Exum tried to rotate away, but Maxley is still a threat. TPA is still a threat, and all they've got to do is wait for these players to walk in. Needles will do that, but he'll finally get the shoulder of Maxley there and drop him down. They'll swing around and finish him off, and so just like that, we're returned to an even 3v3. And they've got Jackal Pings on the Warwick's upstairs. TPA, it almost looked like those pre-fires were going to land perfectly, but unfortunately it was through yet another wall, so none of them hit. But they do know that TPA is off-site. There is a player on Cool Vibes as well. That's the Jaeger. Tristan takes a lot of damage, but Needles is going to chase down Twizzler. Morocco dead on site as well, thanks to Bax coming in from Lobby. And that leaves TPA, the offsite player, in a one versus three. You've seen him clutch situations like this before, but he won't do it against Needles. Team Gusick take round four, and now we're tied up two to two. Well, Gusick will go straight for the, the uh, all chat after winning two rounds in a row. And now that we're tied up at two to two. Naturally, wouldn't be a T3 team if they didn't. Um, but here we are, all tied up. Gusick, despite, I mean, terrible, terrible start to that round, a 5v3. Um, bounced it back and uh, were able to take it in the end. Achieve, maybe they got too over-eager in the mid-round that time, right? I mean, that, what we talked about in the previous round, when the early aggression like that works so well, you got a couple of options as a, def as a defensive side, right? You can continue it, you can just double up on it and just say, oh, wait a minute, the attacking team has way less manpower than they did a second ago, so our aggression should be even more potent. Or you can back off and play safe. The risk, of course, of the first strategy is if you don't back off, if you keep challenging, if you keep playing aggressive, is that eventually the attacking team is going to catch on. And if you give away your life, like Achieve did, then those first two kills are for nothing. Had Maxley rotated back to the site, which he totally could have, had, I think what the next kill was Exum, had he backed on off and not tried to challenge an office, it would have been a 5v3 for the remainder of the round, rather than a 3v3 that Gusa could win very easily. Well, we're back on Penthouse. Gusick had a lot of trouble dealing with TPA's shield in the hallway. Hopefully, Gusick have gone back to the drawing board and have figured out how to adequately burn utility now. There's only a few Womidas. Actually, only one Womidas, it looked like, placed there and a couple ADSs. I mean, the Buck or the Nomad alone could burn those away and make way for the Finca or the Sledge to do away with that utility. Uh, actually, no, okay, they're going to need both. I just saw more Womidas there. So, I mean... They're going to need a lot of burn, but it's not even close to impossible. But Guzik have swapped up the push. Instead of Hookah over, it looks like they want to go direct through Hall of Fame and such. They still don't have hard reach, so they can't open the VIP wall, which could be troubling. Hopefully, they can compensate for it somewhere else. Bax is going to take some damage from Max Lee, playing aggressively on the luggage window. You have Tristan down below looking to burn or get some kills with these frag grenades. It's going to completely miss on the first. He's got no info on the second, so he'll hold on to it. Exome playing in the middle of Penthouse could potentially be a victim, but he is standing on the bed, so he might be able to narrowly avoid those. Bax no longer looking at luggage. Might go down easy if Max peeks, but there is the down from below. Exome is on the floor, but in the meantime, Twizzler gets the refrag. I'm going to try to finish this kill off, but oh, I don't they can't think grab it's going to happen. Yeah, he's going to get away. He'll be able to be picked back up, so... And they got the Thunderbird. Yeah, they got the Thunderbird. He'll be healed back up very quickly as well. You just run through is. three of them. <laughs> Look at that. It's like it never happened. Really an unfortunate turn of events there for Unlimited, who just, I mean, was inches off the mark with that skeleton key. But now it's a 5v4 and Achieve hold this edge. Now they just have to maintain it. TPA, he'll play aggressive and he'll spot out Needles, but missing a couple of key shots. And then Needles on the fadeaway as he drops down into Courtyard. 
will get the headshot onto the Wamai. Another unfortunate turn of events for Achieve here. Another missed opportunity. But Needles is pretty low. Tristan on the Finca can bring his teammate back to closer to full HP with those stims. As uh, Exum will also be trying to challenge onto the players building their way up in towards this site. I mean, they've got the crossfire they need. They've got someone in VIP. They've got the window pressure. They've got the Hall of Fame pressure. Maxley gets one, but Teddy gets the trade. Now Teddy steps all the way up to try to play, oh. but he falls down the hatch. <laughs> That's a mistake because he can no longer support the plant. That's going down. Morocco, he's he stops the plant with the Yokai drone. And Tristan, he's able to get one, but it is essentially a 2v2 on site until Teddy can get back in the mix. He stepped up only to get fried by Twizzler, who's now been traded out by Twist Tristan on the window. Morocco steps up, takes down one, but cannot quite prevent Tristan from getting the kill from above, and Gusek take another, and that's why they're typing again. <laughs> <laughs> Tristan is the goat of that round, I believe being the one to down Exum from below, if I'm not mistaken, and then transitioning to the Repel and covering the plant perfectly. Sure, Teddy was able to get in under the cover of the Finca, nab a kill and drop the hatch, but what dropping the hatch did do was establish some backside pressure. Achieve could not fully focus their attention over towards that window player because Teddy was coming up white. Now, sure, Teddy died, but that was valuable time wasted, allowed the plant to go down, and I mean, you still had Tristan on that repel who was not to be done for able to get that trade as well and that's three in a row for Gusick as uh Bax is pointing out in chat they're looking for that 4-2 half but they will have to attack onto kitchen defenders protect your bombs from being diffused by right. attackers well achieve they lost that early edge they had haven't been able to take around since the first two but all they need to do is find one more. And then we're even. And then we're at our 3-3 three to three half that we are so accustomed to on Coastline. But if Gusta can go up 4-2, to two, you know, maybe they would start to hold that advantage. It seemed that the Achieve playstyle they were bringing out was going to work so well. But Gusick, I mean, yeah, we could talk about the mistakes that Achieve are making all day long. But Gusick have done a fantastic job of making some adjustments and dealing with that aggression. And that's, that's what I think is most important to highlight about this right now. Because, yeah. Team Gusick, despite have off to a rocky start, they have really bounced back. You said it, three rounds in a row, Harrison. Now they're looking for a fourth. Tristan has stepped up phenomenally so far in this game, who is actually not the sub. It's Needles is subbing in for Amp. Tristan is on the roster, and he's been incredible so far. Have not seen him play before. Surely will not forget the name now. Team Gusick, last time they attacked on the kitchen, they were successful thanks to a bit... Too much off-site play, I would say, from Achieve Esports. Maxley is again going to be holding down Sunrise. Tristan has a very long angle to play with with this LMG. He's got a pixel just over the bar. Maxley will sh shoot the drone. And actually, wow! It gets spammed through the wall! What a brilliant cluster of shots from Tristan. He'll down the lesion. Unfortunately, there's a mozzie pest, so we can't confirm that the player is down. Maxley will get picked back up, but he's not going to stay in Sunrise. I mean, sure, you don't get the kill, but you at least clear the position for free. Yeah, within 60 seconds, that is a marked improvement from any previous attempt of clearing Sunrise that Gusick have had. I mean, just a couple of rounds ago, they lost two bodies during that entire process. But now... They've got it, and they've got all five players up. Now, TPA, he's looking to remedy that. He's taking up a position here in main lobby and looking to challenge onto anyone willing to step their way into the building. Eddie seems to be somewhat aware of that, so he'll also keep his eyes trained towards court courtyard as TPA is finally found and beginning to be flushed out here by Baxley, and there it is confirmed. Fully flushed out, dealt with. Maxley gets a trade, though, on so low HP. Didn't even take a bullet during that one as Tristan is taken care of. And now, Team Gusick will be looking to bounce back from that. It's now an even 4v4. They've given up their edge, and now they've lost it entirely as Exum claims the life of Teddy. Actually can't find the trade either. In fact, Exum is going to deal a lot of damage to this Jackal. You saw Unlimited was attempting to hunt that upstairs player, but he's got very little info to work off. And in fact, he's just going to completely abandon that train of thought. Morocco posted up in bathroom will likely get a kill from this angle as he's just so close to the doorway with that SMG-11. It's actually Maxley who's all the way upstairs, completely unabated. Bax is going to take even more damage, and Morocco will just drop off the sinks, prone on the floor, and finish off the Jackal. Needles coming in will land the trade. 
There's still a two versus three. Max off site. Twizzler tucked in towards the window. Unlimited looking like he wants to push in, but he's got no info to work off of, and he doesn't even have the case. It's currently under Exum's watchful eye in lobby, and Unlimited goes down to Maxley, who has since returned to the first floor. It's now Needles alone, and he can't make anything happen against Twizzler. Achieve, take round six, and it's a 3-3 even half. Yeah, here we are, all tied up. As coastline as it could ever get. Neither half proving... On neither side of, of the map proving to be dominant over the other, neither team emerging as dominant either. Maybe Achieve will be strong on the attack, maybe Guzik will be stronger on defense, but right now we are on pace for what could be an overtime finisher. Now, both teams have had their positives, right? Achieve, they've done a great job, at least initially, starting out playing nice and aggressive. Guzik, they're positive, they've done a great job of countering that very aggression. Now, in those last two rounds, both teams are kind of throwing whatever they can at each other and seeing what sticks. Achieve, they're mixing it up by maybe not playing as aggressively in the mid-round, or once they get challenged, back off and play a bit safer. And Gusick, they're getting a lot more confident with their clears. They are the ones now, or at least were, on the attacking side, moving in a little bit more productively, taking map control a little bit more efficiently, knowing that they've got the gun skill and they've got the ability to shut down these aggressive players and... Well, I think that change, it, it worked once, and it didn't work the second time. So yeah, we're all tied up here at 3-3, three to three, and we head to the second half to see how Achieve now can work their attacks. You can't just run all over the map as an Oryx if you've got to actually work your way in and get a bomb down. But unlike what we saw from the Achieve defense, Gusick's defense, at least their lineup, is geared up a little bit more towards some on-site play. You've got the Vulcan shields from the Goyo. You've got those ADSs from Jaeger, naturally, but you've got Needles running the smoke here, probably to play a little bit more patient. And as you can see on your screen right now, you have the Stage 2 qualifiers, January 14th through 16th. That is next weekend. If you lost out on Qualifier 1, or you simply haven't signed up yet and want to join the ranks of West Garfield Park, Aerial or Rise are invited teams. And oh, Jonah, now Chess Club taking the 2-0 win over Shadow Realm. Sign up for our qualifiers next week. Exclamation point play for more info. And the sign-up link, it's only 50 bucks. That is only $10 per player. And if you make the league, you get that money back. So if you're good enough, it won't cost you a single dime to enter into our league. So wait no longer. Sign up, and you can be featured on stream in our very next weekend. But anyway, like you said, back to the game. Interesting that Gusick are uh, establishing a lot of on-site presence, but of course, they still have their roamers. They still got Teddy on the vigil, looking to wreak some havoc. He'll take a little bit of early damage. Not too much. Probably just going to shrug that off. Tristan is searching for this C4 kill as he can hear the people above, but alas, it's a little bit too early. And all that's done is giving the attackers a hole right onto that rotate. Jackal spotting out a couple of these defenders, but they will sneak away. Nobody getting, uh, other than the one bullet that Teddy has received, nobody getting damaged whatsoever. Now, this pressure from above, pretty, pretty productive so far from Achieve, right? I mean, 90 seconds in, pretty good progress. The only question remains, can they spot out anyone below? Gusick right now are doing a good job of being mobile on the site. They're not exposing themselves to any of these angles, nor are they exposing themselves to any of those jackal scans for too long. Tristan, though, right above them. Wow. Oh my goodness, he'll get a great shot onto Exum. Maxley, though, will get a trade as he takes down Tristan and TPA on the follow-up on the Ash will get another. Baxley lit up as he sneaks past the Ash's crosshair and tries to get back towards the site, but TPA will not miss a second time. That bullet will find the head of Unlimited, leaving Baxley and Teddy in a 2v2v4 2v4 situation. Morocco shuts down one and is all up to Teddy. He'll walk straight into a crossfire. Is it going to be Morocco? Is it going to be TPA? It's in fact Morocco who gets the final blow and a fantastic start to the attack for this achieved side. Wonderful stuff from Achieve, not only using the vertical play very well, if not getting a lot of kills, at least flushing out those anchor positions. They went one for one with that Mozzie, but it was really that position from TPA and Morocco. It seemed like Gusick had no idea that there was presence in lobby. It really caught them off guard, and TPA simply kept the ball rolling, got two kills for himself, and Morocco found the last two as those defenders struggled to try and gain some advantage and any ground they could back in their favor. Now... It's going to be a hookah defense for Gusick once again bringing an aggressive lineup. But it's Baxley off the vigil and on to 
nothing. He's just the fading vigil. the sixth. So he'll stick on the vigil. Attack Likely have vigil. him roaming around. Probably Tristan downstairs playing for that C4 as well. Achieve, they've had a knack so far of catching the defense off guard. I wonder if they're gonna if that's gonna be a trend. Usyk, I mean, they are changing things up a little bit, right? I mean, I highlighted the more site-focused lineup of the previous round. It is anything but this time. I mean, we've got nobody designed for plant denial, right? Nobody designed for simple utility or time waste. I mean, you could kind of consider those Banshees from Teddy as a utility burn and as a time waste. But for the most part, you've got five capable fragging ops in this game, all with weapons designed for fragging. And Tristan wants to get started with a good ol' run out. Nobody's gonna be spawning over there by pool though. Everyone else from Achieve, they've actually all spawned uh, over towards the southeast. Uh, they're not gonna deal with any of those peaks. The one from Baxley will uh, not be productive from the vigil, but he'll reveal his position and uh, Achieve should know that they've got several defenders roaming up above trying to wreak havoc or roaming even down below. I mean, Tristan has worked his way into kitchen and is hungry for a couple of kills, but Achieve, they're not going to fall into that trap just yet. They're not entering from below or through kitchen. Instead, their entry point is focused on upstairs, likely on master. That is usually where we'll see them make their entry before they clear their way through the top floor. Drones coming in will confirm that there really is no top floor contention on that side of the map. TPA is free to walk in through Hall of Fame. A lot of this defense on the east side is downstairs. You got Bassley lurking on white. Tristan, like I said, on the first floor playing for that C4. They'll spot out the vigil, and it looks like Twizzler wants to go on the hunt. He'll pop open the barricade, but now there's a uh, crossfire being held between this vigil and the Mozzie. Bassley will get the first frag. TPA goes down. That's your entry on the floor. Mozzie shooting away. A drone will also land damage on Exum, but there's a nade with his name on it coming his way. He pushes out just in the nick of time, but Twizzler holding the cross from Maine has that kill, and Baxley is now coming under pressure. The sledge popping open the wall. The vigil backs off in the courtyard, and Exum says, you know what? I've done my job. I'm not going to tussle with these downstairs roamers anymore because that's the C4 dead. Right, you've taken off the real threat from below. Theoretically, you could push the site now and leave Baxley down below. As long as you've got ample flank watch, you should be fine. There is no Nomad in play, though, so someone is always going to have to be you know, looking at a drone. At least TPA is dead, so he can be doing that for the remainder of the round, but you've got to be wary about somebody coming up from behind. If you're gonna leave those roamers alone downstairs, expect the flank at some point later in the round. I mean, already the Vigil Baxley is working his way up the main stairs and somebody has gotta be in position to stop it. Other than that, they're gonna be in a bit of trouble if they can't deal with it. It, it does look like Exum uh, have the coverage or somebody else have the coverage. Who is that? Cover red stairs, Twizzler? Maxley. Maxley on the flank watch right now, keeping an eye on that while Twizzler works his way across the rest of the map, trying to scan any further defender he can. But now Maxley should get this free kill onto Baxley. Yes, he will. Twizzler on a double kill as well. Achieve looking good. Needles and Teddy left to pick up the pieces. There's going to be one from the defense, but it is instantly answered back. It's just this alibi in a 1v3. Now, Twizzler and Morocco are very lit up, but what HEV Esports don't have an HP, they have in pure body count. Plant is going down from Twizzler under the cover of smoke, and Needles, he's not going to be able to do anything about it. He'll try and push out under the cover, but he's not going to be able to Stewie 2K his way out of this one. Maxley shuts him down, and Achieve will continue to keep the ball rolling on their attack. Yeah, the attack in half looking good for Achieve here. Not going to count Gusick out, though, just yet, as uh, the first two rounds of the initial half also went to Achieve, and then Gusick quickly made the comeback. But the flurry of engagements in those closing moments, I mean, even if Gusick could get a couple, Needles got one, just could not continue to further that aggression. Good patience there from Achieve. That's what I really liked in that last round, which is surprising to say, considering how aggressive and how that's really been our talking point of this map. Aggression, right? But Achieve? did a really good job of slowing it down when they knew they were biting off maybe a little bit more than they could chew on, right? Exum, as you highlighted, Harrison, I mean, he was downstairs taking fights with a couple of those roamers, but then there came a moment where he's like, okay, we got one of them dealt with. We killed the Mozzie. We know there's a vigil still in play. Let's just back off. Let's just play passive. We've dealt with the C4. All we've got to do is hold the flanks. They did that. They got to safety and they started challenging the site knowing that eventually the Vigil would have to step up, otherwise risk 
leaving all of his teammates out to dry and nobody wants to do that so instead they just place the thatcher you've got him on support for a reason max lee is just going to stare at the white stairs for the remainder of the round and that's his role he did his role to perfection he knew when Baxley was coming, he heard him creeping up the stairs, and he shut him down. As textbook as that. If we see that patience and that discipline from Achieve in all these rounds going forward, I think they could definitely take it. Because the aggression from Gusick, there's no perfect counter to that aggression than with some patience and with some discipline. We'll see if Gusick can clean up their act. Achieve looking good so far. Two rounds separate them from their opponents. Baxley is, uh... Speaking of drone hole in bathroom, this is typically a death sentence for the defense, but he's looking to catch an attacker off guard. Unfortunately, no one will expose themselves to the vigil. So as they will once again post up on that repel where he was last time, again, able to drone out some of those roamers, then fall downstairs to main and establish a much needed crossfire. VIP is not reinforced, so Exum is able to breach that right on open and establish that horizontal coverage for the for the attack you'll likely call morocco over as well to open up the vip wall in order to establish the crossfire into uh in through cocktail but that'll probably come later in the round once achieve have established a little bit more map control Whistler is, as usual, wary of a possible run out from the main lobby. Baxley does remain in that position, but maybe earlier than last time, he'll sneak his way up the white stairs. But now he's got to be wary of the window too, right? He doesn't have an easy, safe rotation because now the attackers have pretty much secured control of the east side of this top floor. And they'll be looking to use that control to cut off any roamers that they can. They haven't dealt with any of the players down below, but for now it doesn't matter because Tristan can't do much. He doesn't have a C4, he's just an alibi after all. And Teddy doesn't have an, a C4 either. That's a Malusi. You've got impacts with the BP and well, he's brought the BP. So on the site itself, it's going to fall onto the shoulders of Needles here and Unlimited, who I also believe is on the site because everyone else is downstairs or at the very, at least now downstairs, eventually likely to rotate themselves back to the site. Teddy though, first to strike. Headshot onto Maxley, one of those flank watch players who will no longer be able to keep things tidy and keep things tight. He'll have to fall into that good shot there from Unlimited as well as two kills are found for the defense. That'll put Goosing in a pretty good advantage here, but Achieve still have enough going for them where they might be able to start an initial execute. But just as I say that, their smokes go down and now the round is going to be tough to win. TPA will step up and grab the first for his team, but doesn't see the melee hold that Unlimited is holding and it now falls on the shoulders of Morocco. Four kills for him to find, and only 30 seconds to do with. Teddy will deny him any sort of clutch attempt. Gusick take round nine. Well, we've got an aggressive coastline, and that is what we asked for, but we haven't really seen, I mean, we haven't seen a lot of close rounds. I feel like each round is just coming down to who is winning these couple opening duels, and then that team is just winning it out every time. Now, we're close overall to on our scoreline. It's five to four, and with... An SCS spot on the line. I know these teams are trying to just, they're trying to outsmart their opponents if they can. They're trying to see, okay, here's an adjustment that our opponents are going to make. How do we counter that? How do we counter an adjustment before the adjustment is even made, right? On coastline, that train of thought, while it's beneficial, it can get you killed sometimes too, right? This is an aggressive map and there's a lot of fragging and... It may just come down to which team is feeling more frag comfortable tonight. Achieve, clearly they were comfortable for those first two rounds, but they're starting to let that slip away a little bit. Gusick in that last round, they did a good job of maybe backing off of that aggression a little bit and surprising Achieve in that, but then just bolstering their on-site pressure, something that Achieve just were not prepared for. When Achieve is unable to get those picks off-site, seems that they struggle getting some sort of cohesive attack going. Uh, yeah, Achieve last round were, uh, didn't look great. Team Gusick decided to get aggressive and it really worked out for them. Every time Achieve kind of like just tried to step on the site, someone was there peeking them. But now we're on double bar uh, and Achieve Esports have swapped onto the Dokabi. Interestingly enough, someone spawn peeking. Is that Bax? Yep, that's Bax. I want to see if this works out. Nope. TPA is going to simply avoid it. That's unfortunate. We haven't seen... It's surprising. I was expecting, like, tons of spawn peeking and stuff this map, but we've only seen it, like, once, twice. 
I think we saw most of the first tap, but it was only from Achieve. It wasn't from Gusick, like, much at all. Interesting, though. That is Good true. point. Are we all going to see, spawn peak or not, we've got an early fight. Quite an early skirmish here. We are on the double bar, and that means Sunrise is going to have a lot of pressure from the beginning of the round. And as far as defensive success goes, it really comes down to how long you can hold off the attackers who are just going to pour in from that mudroom door. Obviously, from, as a defensive team, you can support from above, as Baxley is attempting to do. Tristan as well is attempting to do. But both of whom are, you know, getting spotted out and are likely to be forced out soon. They don't have utility really to support them. They're just going to rely on their impacts or their ability to charge through walls and their gun skill to get them out of this top floor alive. Achieve, though, they aren't putting too much pressure into clearing them out right now. It was just one player on the hookah, ba hookah balcony a second ago. Now it's somebody else assisting on that hookah rappel, Maxley, droning that one out and waiting for his moment to strike. But Achieve got to get something done. Right now, they're just trying to open up angles, but Maxley, he is not feeling enough pressure that he feels needed like to rotate away. The site isn't being pressured enough that he feels needed down below either. And even though Achieve have an opening on the site, they can't push in safely knowing there are people up above. Yeah, there's more than enough coverage right now for Gusick. In comes Teddy, though, on a security flank, trying to catch TPA off guard. The drone is in sight, and the Ash Nose Blue is clear. He's going to try and move through the rotate. The Jaeger's watching it, though, but Unlimited still loses the fight. Backs as well. It gets extremely lit up, and TPA with that kill, that might be the opening the defense needs. Teddy gets one, but he's crossfire. TPA gets a third in the sight on the needles, and it's all falling apart. Now it's just Backs in a one versus four. Plant is going down, and he's so low on HP. Teddy completely irrecoverable behind the bar, finished off by Max. And now it's a post plant. It looked like a decent defense for Gusick, but it is completely fallen apart. TPA looking for his 14th kill, but it'll be Maxley now dropping the hatch and coming in the blue to finally finish it. It's 6 4 map and match point for Achieve. Yeah, series point and SCS qualifier point for Achieve. One more round is all they need, and they've got two chances to make it happen before overtime rears its ugly head. They win this one or they win the next one. They can make it nonetheless. And that's why we're going to see a timeout here come out from Team Gusick. They're going to want to take the time to think it over, to talk it over, to figure out exactly what they have to do over the course of the next two rounds to remedy the defensive issues they've been having and send this one to OT. If not, if they can't take two defenses back to back, they will find themselves out of their opportunity to make SCS in this first qualifier. They'll have to turn their eyes towards qualifier two, which is coming up in just a couple of days. Next weekend, it's qualifier two. Yes. Again, keep in mind, if you want to sign up for that, you still can. Signups will be open until the day before those quals. So make sure to get into that. It's 50 bucks, 10 bucks a person. Just choose to eat leftovers instead of ordering DoorDash one night and bam, you've got the money to make the quals. And hey, if you qualify, you get that 50 bucks back as well so do. not a lot on the line if you think you are good enough to make it into ses we'd love to have you like you said if you're good enough it's actually free that's how it works out in the end but uh again we're still waiting for this last player from gusick to rejoin hopefully backs uh figures out whatever's going wrong pretty soon it's gonna be a kitchen defense it looks like for gusick of course it's not locked in for sure quite yet but i doubt they'll be changing it between uh between now and then you got the echo aruni the thunderbird and the jaeger so it looks like again it's going to be quite the site heavy focus but we said that about gusik once before and they ended up extending all the way over towards sunrise and such the thunderbird will make it so that if there are any roamers and they get lit up they can fall back to site safely simply heal themselves back up to full almost like that initial damage never happened the echo as well from teddy really relying on the fact that whatever uh, either site presence they have or whatever roam presence they have is enough to delay achieve so that those yokais can come into effect. Achieve, on the other hand, are running the exact same lineup they had in the previous round, though. I don't know how I feel about the Dokubi. I feel like, do you feel like the Dokubi really did anything in the previous round? I know he died kind of early. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't think I even heard a, I don't know if I heard a phone call. Maybe I'm just crazy, but, um, I don't know why he'd swap on the Dokumi instead of Jackal, because Jackal also brings smokes, and he's got, well, it's not universal, he does bring more, you know, quote-unquote, scans, and he's been doing pretty decent with the Jackal. The round he brought the Jackal, he found a couple excellent cutoffs. Um, 
I don't know. The Dogby, I think the Dogby is definitely an interesting pick. Yeah, no question about that. Um, we'll have to see. Hopefully, we'll get to see soon as we're just waiting on this last Gusick player to return to the lobby. Hopefully, we'll take a few more moments, but Gusick, tech timeout or tech timeout, regardless, this is important time for them, mm -hmm. right? It's still, they've still got time to talk this over. And at Chief Esports, I mean, they've got time too. They just got to make sure that they hold on to whatever momentum they currently have. I mean, they've had a much stronger attacking half than Gusick did at least right off the bat, ending up three to three with a good second half performance. That's just what Gusick need to do again. They did it last half. I'm not going to count them out of this one. Um, but just in the last couple of rounds, it has seemed that Achieve really do hold the edge. TPA especially, that was what, he was able to just kind of sneak in through blue and get three kills. That kind of play really hurts as a defensive team you're like how did we let this happen how did we let him slip through a gap where were the communications where was the intel all of that um it's something that they're gonna have to address in the several minutes they've had now something they had to address something they hopefully addressed uh because when tpa is fragging out uh it seems like gusick don't stand a chance yeah tpa as well during the normal season i remember of scs during stage one if tpa wasn't fragging out Chief struggled. Mm -hmm. Which is, I mean, one, and attest to TPA being a really good player, and two, uh, achieve maybe a little bit shallow. Hopefully, they've increased their depth during the off season, and we don't have a chance to see that right now because TPA is uh, is popping off currently thirteen and seven. But hey, maybe if they qualify, we'll be able to judge them harder in the regular season. Now that Gusick have had time to cool down, Vax certainly. Uh, Took his sweet time getting back in the lobby. I was actually getting really worried we were going to have to rehost for a second, but luckily we do not. It's going to be a kitchen defense for Gusick, one that they uh, had previously lost thanks to a surprise play from TPA and Morocco yeah, through lobby. Whether or not Gusick adjusts and maybe sit a body in there is a different story, but it looks like they are going to be establishing some theater presence. And uh, Achieve are going to have to deal with that if they want to move in through the same avenues they did before. Five seconds left. Right, if we see an approach from the sunrise bar side of things, that blue bar side, and you take from, you know, that kitchen window and maybe get some vertical pressure in VIP, you won't have to clear all the way towards theater. But like you said, if they want to pressure into main lobby and go more direct through bathroom, the top floor is going to be a problem. A lot of potential for soft destruction. That hatch is open and will be an ever-present threat. It's interesting, though, to see that only one player right now from Gusick is actually on the top floor at all. There's a lot of utility up there, but there's only one player, and that shouldn't be too challenging for Achieve to deal with, especially if they're committing, you know, two to three bodies to that. They should be able to do this relatively easily. The one hindrance they might experience is the fact that Gusick does have an Echo in play, right? He's got the ability to have one of those Yokai drones wow. upstairs, and you've always got to worry about those C4s from below. Tristan. Over in Aqua, I believe it was, sending that one up and sending the Dokubi, the operator we talked so much about already, sending Twizzler sky high. So Dokubi will once again not be a factor. And unfortunately, we haven't really been able to see what exactly the Achieve Esports plan is with those phone calls. Unlimited holding on to these long angles all the way through Penthouse is going to get caught by TPA as he rotates. And that's the trade. So you've lost the Dokubi for a Jaeger. Trade's still in favor of the defense. Here's Tristan now coming in to support backs from below with a c4 will frag tpa and the theater control is not there for the attack just yet needles and exum right now holding a staring contest in comes the aruni but he's got no idea the sledge is already holding his doorway but you can tell the attackers they are completely ignorant to this position but before tristan lands the kill on the ace morocco got a kill from below so a two versus two now as Achieve and Gusick keep finding trades amongst trades. Up comes Teddy, though. The roaming Echo! Able to down the sledge. Beautiful stuff from him. There's no Finca, so there's no heals. And Max is not going to go for the pickup. He's just going to drop right on site, knowing that, hey, both of these players are not here. He's going to get overhealed by the Thunderbird, start getting this plant down. Teddy's since come back to the site, but it's going to be too late. It's now a post plant. Max just has to sit in this corner and hold on. He'll land one on a Tristan and a second oh. on to Teddy. What a clutch from Maxily, and that sends a Chibi Sports into stage two. Down go Gusick. Good luck next call. Wow, what a way to win. Brutal for Gusick, who 
They got on the they got on the all chat early and they got punished for it in a big way. Achieve stepped it up. They come out of that first half and they bring it onto the attacking side in a big way. TPA lights up the scoreboard. Maxley putting up numbers as well. 12 kills for him, 14 for TPA. And Gusek just didn't have that kind of cragging capability on their side of things. 10 kills was the most their top fragger had. Everyone else not quite hitting double digits. And on a map like Coastline, as much as we talk strategy and how that enables you to get frags, the kind of Coastline we saw tonight, it was frag or be frag. It was who is going to shoot first, who is going to shoot back or not. And it seemed that Achieve will once again be calling for SCS. It's going to be a pleasure to have them back. They went a long way in stage one. I cannot wait to see what kind of adjustments they're going to make in stage two and how far they can go again. Yeah, it seems like the uh, change from Traken and... Who was it? Who was it again? Oh, Traken and Riot to Maxley and Exum, at least for Qual 1, will work out in their favor. Like you said, though, we'll have to wait till the regular season to see if it truly does them better. They did make it to playoffs, so that was, again, kind of on uh, not only their own play, but also Aerial Rise forfeiting, so not completely off their shoulders. Maybe they can change that in... Uh, in this stage but congratulations achieve they are actually the final team to make it through qualifier one first it was west garfield park followed up by the arrow arise pug stack then chess club taking shadow realm down 2-0 and now achieve winning 2-1 in fact the only uh qualifier game or the only final round to actually go to three maps yeah it was close and Go gusek clearly put up a fight sending it to all three maps may have taken uh, achieve a map to uh, get in the mix, but you know, they made it happen, and I think we'll see Guzik back in Qual 2 in a big, big way. But Probably. for now, this is your bracket. This is the result of our close qualifier for our first qual uh, for Split 2. And we've got Wes Garfield at the top, as we talked about. We saw that one as our first game of the night. Chess Club, they beat Shadow Realm. We didn't see any of these games tonight, but uh, we know they were close. I mean, two of those games going all three maps in that first round. Aerial Arise, the Pug Stack going through Pangu's stack of noob slayers, 2-0, moving on, joining us in SCS and Achieve Esports, as we just saw, taking map three against Team Gusick after taking down the formerly known as Okami, now Whittle Kitties in the previous <laughs> round before that. That's a fun name to say, but we won't be able to say them anymore uh, here tonight because it is Achieve who end up winning their section of the bracket. So these are your four teams joining us here in SCS. We've still got four more to add, and those will be added at the end of next week. Yeah, of course, if you have not signed up for Qual number two, do so now. I mean, you got time to establish a roster if you don't have one already. Signups are open all the way till the day of. So all the way to, uh, I believe, Thursday, right? It should be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so probably Friday. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, it's same day, not day of. Same day, earlier same day. So yeah, they'll be open all the way to the 14th. Got yourself signed up. It is only 50 bucks, only 10 bucks a player. And if you are good enough, it's free because you get your money back if you qualify. So all these teams, these four qualified for free. And now you can see how the groups end up. So if you're unaware of how we seed the groups, basically what we do is we take the top team, right? The top four teams and do them in order, A, B, C, D. Then. What we typically do is we, uh, the for the second team, we do kind of reverse, like we do the top one in D, but I think we actually reversed it for these groups because IF placed higher than Karn and Co. and Mystic. So I don't know how the seeding is working. I mean, the seeding is subject to change, but for now, we're going to have the number one qualifier team in the number one group. West Garfield, actually, West Garfield against Wichita Wolves Academy could actually be... Whew, could actually be really cool. Chess Club as well in the same group as One Shot and Wichita Wolves. The Aerial Arise Pug Stack joining Gashers, Goons, and Mystic, who of course Mystic were previously known as Two Faced. Of course, Wichita Wolves Academy also previously being known as Surf, if you are unaware. And Achieve joining Aerial Academy and Karn and Co. So these are the groups right now, and of course the last four teams will Harrison, be right, that, next. I, I'm being told now that uh, it's currently wrong. Kermit just chirped in my ear. Um, ah. Basically. Basically, what were the, these qual teams right now? We're shuffling them around, still confirming their exact positions. Nice. Also, to add, um, the Wichita what, what says Wichita Wolves Academy on your screen? I believe that is Wichita Wolves Red. I believe that is what Surf, formerly Surf, oh, now so Wichita, are known it, as. Or is it Wichita Wolves Academy Red? 
That's a great question, because we just saw Wichita Wills Academy <laughs> here in this qual, so we can't have two of the Academy. Who knows? Who really knows? The point is, true. we've got two Wichita Wolves teams, and here it has been fixed. We've got it shuffled around. So if this may be confirmed, we've got Achieve joining Group A with Wichita Wolves, Red, Acad, whatever you want to call them. Uh, you got an investigation file on that group. Group B, that's the Aerial Arise, Pug Stack joining One Shot and Wichita Wolves. That is a stacked group, if I've ever seen one. A lot of CL talent there. Over in Group C, you've got Gashers, Goons, you've got Mystic and Chess Club. And Group D, West Garfield will be joining Aerial Academy and Karn and Co. So already Group B is looking scary, but as we've seen, you know, CL teams are not all that... Uh, they're not just, they're not invincible, as we've seen in these qualifiers, and as we saw in the last split of SCS, these T3 teams, mm. these hug stacks are running rampant. As we saw in the standalone tournament as well, that was actually two pug stacks in the finals. So we have yet to see a T2 team win an SCS NSG event. And of course, again, if you want to be one of those teams that keeps T2 from winning in any capacity, sign up next week for our qualifier for January 14th through 16th. Only 50 bucks. You get your money back if you make it in exclamation point play for more info for the sign up link and for everything. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, sticking with us through the qualifier. It was a little bit a uh, little bit hectic towards the middle and we got the raid. We were scrambling to get another game. Unfortunately, we had to do West Garfield Park twice in a row. But thank God, the uh, the second game was a little bit better than the first. Absolutely. It was mm. a great game to close it out. And we got to take a look at a third map of On another coastline. series. So hopping it around. And we saw, right, coastline. Yeah. We got to end <laughs> with a, it felt like a real map, right? No more Oregon <laughs> for the rest of the night. But thank you all for tuned in, especially joining us for Valorant or Apex. If you tuned in in the middle and you stayed and watched, we appreciate you staying in and watching some Siege. We love it here. We love our game. And we hope you found some entertainment with us too. But that's going to do it for this first qualifier. The open qualifier is done. The closed qualifier is done. Our sights are set onto next weekend, and that is when we will be back. So until then, keep an eye on our Twitters, our socials. Keep an eye on all that information. Look for some VODs. Watch some VODs. Study up on some of your opponents. We'll see you next week. So long, everybody. Yeah. <laughs>